Block 3. Neo. Well the first time I used her, I destroyed a fairly large mountain with a dragon inside. Still a fraction of her current power, though at my full power I could probably destroy a continent. We'll have to tone it down. Neo casually explained a bit of archery as potential as she was playfully dodging the automatic weapon's fire at an impressive speed. Swinging wrong a miniad in an arc as she arrived at the gate, she tore open the heavily reinforced gate along with the twelve armored guards that were foolishly standing in front of it expecting to slow her down somehow. As she entered the ruined gate there were at least a thousand mortals all pointing some form of firearm at her. In front of the tiny group, stood the light scout, who was flanked by two women. I think Neo had said their names were Veronica and Cass. They were heavily corrupted by the light though, as they practically ignored the situation and were staring at the scout with lust-glazed eyes. After Neo had taken in their useless numbers she started to flex on them. Practically literally too. She took up a pose she called the Randy Orton taunt all tied up nicely with a mocking glare. She looked totally silly, but still very badass as everyone around her just stilled in confusion and a small amount of annoyance mixed with anger. The light scout honestly looked delightfully intimidated from Neo's lance and pose as he shouted at her. Damien, enough of this. You don't have that dark influence so why? Why do such evil? I started laughing uncontrollably and nearly fell off of Neo's shoulder as I said, such evil, classic. Neo chuckled at my amusement and open arm shrugged at his question. Neo, evil? Nah, you know what's really evil? The NCR. They commit the worst evils of all. Neo shuddered as Damien's brow furrowed. Damien, Gino, Neo, taxes. Neo had interrupted Damien while she shook her head in faux lament. Confused Damien asked, taxes, what? Everyone pays taxes, tax evasion is illegal. As he was struggling to comprehend what he heard Neo shouted, no, it's an obligation. He just stared blanking at Neo, who was now laughing at him. I was also laughing as his soul actually did take some damage from that. How interesting, tears appeared in the corner of my eyes as I was laughing even harder while I was floating casually around Neo while upside down. Tear win, taxes cause paperwork, and paperwork is the bane of all that is and will ever be. Neo simply gave me a proud smile and nod. Damien, take this seriously. He then charged forward at a pathetically slow pace, while the rest of the mortals opened fire upon her. Neo, ha. Huh. Okay, serious is what you want? Neo's body was shrouded in lightning as she jumped up 30 feet in the air and brandished wrong a miniad, her hair going white as her soul pressure mixed with a tiny amount of divinity, of all things, pressed down on all the mortals present. Rule of God is incoming. Just don't say you didn't ask for this. Neo cackled as an overbearing or I was released from the lance. With a soft pop I reappeared on Neo's shoulders while I had literal stars in my eyes at what I was seeing. While the divinity she was giving off was minuscule at best, it was there, deciding to ignore that for now. I looked at the amount of mana that was being charged into her lance. Tear win, whoa. What's the blast radius of this attack? Neo hummed in thought for a couple of seconds before launching her attack and simply saying, yes. The ground suddenly lit up in a brilliant light show as the attack obliterated everything and everyone behind the scout. The only thing left of the airport was now a smoking crater and the gate near the scout. As he turned round to look at the devastation wrought, he fell to his knees as he realized the futility of his actions. His resignation was so complete that his system actually stopped shielding his thoughts from me. Tilda it's. There was never a chance for victory here. Tilda Damien thought as he came to the conclusion, while hearing a sigh from his system. Alice, I'm sorry Damien. I truly am. Neo landed beside him and rested her hand on his shoulder. Looking up at her, he could see her hair returning to normal and he shook his head in despair. Neo, ah. About that evil crap. You know you've been rewriting people with your corruption, right? Everything about the people you corrupt? They change to benefit your god. Your light does that. It essentially enslaves you and takes away your very identity. Me? I mercy killed them. 
You ignorant idiot. Did you even realize that? Or did your system forget to mention it? I could see the confusion and dread build up in his soul the longer Neo was talking to him, and I smiled in delightful cruelty. But my mind was also still stuck on Neo's last attack, truth be told. His system then desperately denied the accusation. No, she's lying, Damien. We saved them, Damien. But, why? She could just... Neo seemed to have gotten fed up with the back and forth, and suddenly got an alert from her system. She focused on her right hand, and moments later it was covered with the same digital-like mana that the systems run off of. My eyes lit up as I mumbled to myself. Now I get what you mean by the blast radius is yes. Ooh, I know where this is going. Neo heard me and gave me a nod and then said, Rule number two, plush win. Neo then plunged her hand into the light scout and we all heard two screams ring out. She then pulled out a ghostly female digital human-like soul. The fate of a lot of entities who succumb to the corruption of either side fully. The light scout shivered horribly when his system was removed. Neo, look, a ghost. Before I send you to the afterlife, mind telling him the truth? The scout seemed to pull on the last dredges of his confidence as his love was threatened with deletion. He pulled out several guns and started to empty them into Neo's aura. While it lit up with every bullet, it was practically doing no damage as she was regenerating faster than he could hope to damage with such mundane weapons. Weapons that were no longer enhanced by his system no less. Seeing that his bullets were doing nothing. He screamed and ran up to her and smashed her in the chest with a rebar club. Honestly, that did even less than the bullets, but he kept lashing out and screaming in desperation. Damien, why? Won't. You don't die? Neo scoffed and punched him in the stomach and a deliciously audible crack was heard from the impact. He doubled over. The air violently ejected from his lungs as he stared up at Neo. With a malicious grin she spread her arms wide with the system still held by the neck trying to get free. Neo, Aura, Sun. I floated down to the horrified light scout and laughed in dark glee along Neo. Tearwin, yes, how does it feel, to be so helpless? I am so tempted to show myself to them, just so they can actually see me mock them. I looked up at Neo, hoping for her input. Neo, go for it. They're both secured here anyway. Now, light system. Are you gonna tell him? As she strengthened her grip on the pathetic light construct's neck, I floated back up to Neo's shoulder and revealed myself to them. Tearwin, yes. Tell him exactly what your filthy light corruption does to my people. Tell him the real reason why your masters are in my universe. The light system, Alice, glared at me as I revealed myself. Her look didn't last long however as she was immediately and harshly thrown to the ground and stomped on by Neo. Alice, ah, yes, it's true, they, do get changed by the light, they're, repurposed, but it's only to serve a greater purpose, they should rejoice, how dare you act like I'm the bad one, I freed them from a pointless exist. Neo didn't need to hear any more of the dribble coming out of the light garbage. And so she lined up its jaw to the curb nearby and stomped on her head viciously. The thing's body turned into a mass of light particles as her very being was destroyed before everyone's eyes thanks to the passive I had secretly given her. I had heard a crack, and as I looked over to the source I saw the light scout lose all sense of hope as his soul fractured a tiny bit. He blankly stared at the spot where the person he loved had died while admitting they did horrible things to people. He shook and shivered as he began to spiral into doubt and despair as more cracks on his soul started to appear. I heard a whistle from Neo as she turned to look at me. Neo, see? Killed his spirit. She then shook her boot as if to try and get rid of any residue left by the lights system she had eradicated. Tearwin. It's what he deserved. Suddenly. An inky black portal opened several meters from us. It felt immensely familiar to me, and only took me a few seconds to realize who was likely to step out of it. Not wanting to get caught, I quickly dashed behind Neo to hide. I suddenly felt two very familiar servants of Artoria step out of the portal, and I was immensely glad I had hid. Neo, is that Raven? And Pyre. I then saw her checking her system and chatting quickly with a few of her friend's lovers. Greater than Neo squared. 
Ray, Pi, greater than Yang Sumi Mummy. What's up now? Need help greater than Spartan Waifu. What's going on? Partner greater than Neo Squared. Never mind, I'll get back to you. I then heard Pia question Neo. Neapolitan, why are you hiding her blessing? Neo tilted her head in confusion before Raven also tossed her a question. Raven, or, how did you even get here? Neo shrugged and said, magic, divine power, probably one of those two things. Yeah, Raven, divine power. I then heard a gasp, and Raven called out in my mind to me, knowing I was totally busted. I floated out from behind Neo and sat on her shoulder again while giving them a tiny wave and a smile. Tear win. Hello, Raven then looked around at the little battlefield and took note of everything, including the broken light scout. Both Raven and Pyre then kneeled, bowed and lowered their heads while greeting me. Raven and Pyre, our goddess Tierwin. Much to my horror though, Raven had contacted Artoria, but she stumbled on her words badly, and I knew she had just caused a massive misunderstanding. Tierwin. Why? You could have worded that so much better. Neo was slightly surprised by my distressed outcry, but must have thought it was about them calling me out. Neo, oh you know them then? I like the grim look on Raven, not going to lie. She then bound strong a miniad on her other shoulder casually before Minnie panicking and saying, not that Pia isn't good looking, she looks oddly, cuddly in that form. I was into much of a panic though to notice her amused grin as she talked. Noticing my state and tilting her head, I could only give her an apologetic look as I felt Artoria coming here. I couldn't contact her. She was completely in rage mode. I started to talk in a panicked tone before I finished off shouting, Well, you wanted to meet my sister, Neo's system. I know you can hear me. I am going to do as much as I can to protect Neo and Archeria but I will need your help. Use everything you can to shield their souls. I'll also try and shield the light scout. He shouldn't get off easy for daring to attack my bestie. As useless as it was. Tear win, and their minds. And I mean everything. She's coming. Neo blinked a few times at me before I saw a barrier gently flow over her and Archeria. It was strong, but I am glad I am here to help augment it. Otherwise Neo would be in for a lot rougher of a time. Her system actually spoke out which seemed to surprise Neo. Very well. This cannot be avoided. Neo, ah. It's serious then. She frowned as she realized the severity of the situation from my warning and how her system actually took action. Raven yelled out with a guilt-ridden voice. I am so sorry, Goddess Tierwin. I was just taken aback to see you outside your forest. It was a slip of the tongue. Pia winced as she felt my sister enter this universe. Pia, oh, you messed up. She's so pissed. Can you feel it? Raven grimly nodded her head while Neo tilted hers and looked at me. Before I could say anything more though, Raven's shadow exploded out around us and covered a large area. Oh no, she is so beyond pissed. I am so sorry Neo. First there was an eerily silent silence around us, and then we all felt it unimaginable fury, hatred, and bloodlust, the air itself started to gain a red hue, and the very space around us started to cry out and creak, my sister's black water started to bubble up from under Raven, and slowly moved away from her, beautiful ribbons started to flow out of the puddle and form a large cocoon of sorts, the presence of hatred and bloodlust spiked, the magic in the air seemed to explode in intensity that made anything that Neo could produce with her lance pale in comparison. I then felt an unimaginable pressure fall onto Neo's and Archeria's souls. Thankfully I was augmenting her system's barrier, as if I wasn't she might have turned out like the light scout, the gate that was left standing, and all other objects near us started to whine from the pressure that was building up. And then the cocoon exploded outwards revealing my sister in all her glory. She was in her form that looked like Archeria, but several years younger, with black armor instead of her normal white. She and her sword she held were engulfed in red-black flames, and I could feel the evils she had been absorbing rolling off her in waves. At this rate, she'll develop a fourth authority before she ascends. With that idle thought, Artoria started to look around with interesting solid glowing red eyes. That's new. 
but it doesn't seem to be normal. An illusion, maybe? Neo let out an impressed twistle as she looked around as the very world was reacting to the mere presence of my sister. I felt pride build up in my breast that she was so impressed that she'd risk drawing my sister's attention, which she did. As Artoria looked at Neo, I felt another massive crash against our barriers as the passive evil and bloodlust she was giving off tried to assault her mind. Once again, I was thankful for the strength of the system Neo had, if it was any less. She really could have gone insane from my sisters or alone. She then looked at me on Neo's shoulder, and gave me a soft smile. Looking down at the light scout who was honestly barely holding on because of my protection, she started to make her way over to him. Every step she took, the ground shuddered and cracked from the sheer amount of power she was expelling. I felt Neo shudder as she recovered from being assaulted by such, frankly speaking, crazy amounts of bloodlust and evil. I could see her eyes shine in interest at what my sister was going to do. Turning my attention back to the now very much broken man, who was almost ready to break and go mad from the fear alone, started to float before Artoria. Artoria then spoke several spells, her voice laced with such an overwhelming amount of unadulterated hatred. Artoria, perception of infinity, soul brand, soul burn, blood boil, curse of corruption, yea. She is super duper uber pissed to soul brand all those curses. What happened next, was a visual representation of the malice she felt for the man. Soon, his skin started to boil as if it was on fire. He also started to rapidly age, and looked as if he was sick with several diseases as his body warped. His screams were cut short, as he eventually melted to nothing but a floating burnt skeleton, but that too soon crumbled to dust to reveal a spectral version of himself, and it seemed to happen all over again, but never stopping as his spectral self seemed to fix itself just as it was about to break down, only for it to start all over again. This went on for a minute as ethereal screams were heard across the entire planet, until finally his soul couldn't handle it anymore and simply flaked away into nothing. My sister simply stood there for several seconds, before everything simply Return to normal. All the pressure on our barriers vanished and the aura she was giving off also disappeared. I could hear Neo release a small breath of relief as this terrible nightmare was over. Artoria's armor changed back to her usual white color and set, and she also shrunk down a bit. She turned around and looked at me with a soft smile while she opened her arms wide. Her voice was filled with affection as she cooed at me, Tierwin Tilda. Tierwin, sister. I floated over to her, but just before we hugged I gave her a good solid bonk on the head. Tearwin, that was super extreme. You almost hurt my new friend. I then heard Neo burst into laughter. Turning to look at her, she was hunched over as she wiped tears from her eyes. She took a deep breath and after laughing for a solid ten seconds, she walked over to us. Looking up to my sister with interest in her eyes. She said, well I figured you'd be overprotective but that was crazy. Artoria had the decency to blush a tiny amount and looked away from Neo's eyes. Artoria, I am not sorry for that. My dear Win is the single most important thing to me. Hearing she was out of her dimension near a person of light. And that she was tiny. Made my imagination run wild. Neo nodded her head along with the explanation my sister gave. Artoria, but... This is just an illusionary avatar. She is still perfectly safe now that I have a clear head. She looked up at me and smiled. Tearwin, HMPH, as if I would worry you, Artoria. I put my hand on my hips and turned away from her. Artoria, yeah. I saw her lower her head out of the corner of my eye. Neo, she came along to travel with me. It was a great time too. <laughs> Turning to look back at Neo. She was slowly nodding her head as she looked over my sister closely. Neo, evil. But hot, evil. But yep, damn. She seemed to be having some kind of internal war over something, before she just shrugged and dismissed it. She tapped wrong a miniad on her shoulder as she asked Artoria a question. Neo, anyway, you're probably familiar with who I am, I'm guessing. As Artoria was looking over Neo, I couldn't contain my curiosity anymore and had to ask. Tearwin, why are your eyes red like that? Blinking a few times Artoria chuckled and said, Ah, 
I was just about to fuck with the people of the world you sent me to before I got the rather unhelpful description of what she saw from Raven. As her eyes returned to her beautiful black and glowing gold, I noticed Raven blushed a bit before she tried to speak up. With a rather weak and meek voice Raven said, I'm sorry. Artoria waved her off before looking back to Neo and saying, Yes, I know who you are Neo. I also take it you're not from the world I took, considering your neutral feeling soul and all. Neo smiled at me and said, I do consider myself chaotic neutral. Well I'm impressed, plush win. You do have a pretty good sister. Nodding my head repeatedly and beaming a smile at Neo I said, she's the best. Artoria then turned to her two grim servants and with a stern voice said, for your punishment for making me worry about Tierwin. I want you two to hunt down every light stained on this world, and cleanse them. After that, no world traveling for a month Raven. I could only smile slyly at her little punishment. Her aura had obliterated every soul in several thousand kilometers. So the two would have to do a bit of running, and it might not even turn up anything. They both kneeled and yelled, as you will, Lady Artoria. They then shot off in different directions while cracking the ground from the force they used. Artoria then plucked me out of the air, and started to snuggle our faces together. As she signed in content, she asked Neo what was next. Neo, well, someone else wants to talk here. I then saw her lance, wrong a miniard, slip from her grip and return to her human form. She really does look like an older Artoria. Still think the lack of corruption lines is weird. After the two looked at each other for a few seconds, Neo's Archeria gave a slow nod in acceptance. Archeria, I see. So this is the path you could have chosen. It is. Different. But above all, I wished for your happiness. It seems, through one way or another. You have it now. Archeria seemed happy about my sister's current fate, and had a thankful expression. While my Artoria slowed nodded and had a raised eyebrow at the sudden transformation. Artoria, I am surprised you don't find me lacking or disgusting like another version of myself did. Before I erased her and her summoner from existence itself that is. Shaking her head at the memory she then said with absolute finality. But, yes. Tierwin is my everything. I heard an order below from Neo, and smiled at her. Artoria then started to cuddle with me more causing me to giggle. I tried to valiantly, not, struggle out of her grip, but my sister was too great. So I accepted my fate. With a sigh and shaking her head Artoria said, I am not a past you. And now I say that I, can perhaps understand that sentiment. About someone being your everything. She took a quick peek at Neo, who was clutching her chest, before she quickly looked away with a blush. Neo, MMFH. Too cute. I heard Artoria whisper to Neo while throwing her a quick wink and a sly smile. Great catch. I should know. A matching smirk grew on Neo's face as she gave Artoria's shoulder a pat. Neo, well, this was a blast. Feel free to call me up for more stuff. Maybe when I get a bit stronger? Both of you feel free to call me. I'm only a universe away. See you next time Tilda. With a shrug and a funny salute to me, they both vanished. I shouted out, bye. With a bit of sorrow in my voice hoping they heard me. Hearing a sigh, I turned to my sister and gave a wry smile. Artoria. I was really worried. Tierwin. Plushwin. Hee <laughs> hee. Giggling. I softly hugged my sister's head. Tierwin. I am sorry. Artoria, I didn't mean to worry you. Artoria, all good, my precious little sister. Now, if you don't mind sending me back, I still have a light scout fucker to hunt down. Giggling and snapping my fingers, a portal opened for my sister and she stepped through. Artoria, I'll see you soon. Tierwin, with a sigh at the craziness that happened, I dismissed the avatar I was using and returned my full focus to my main body. Sitting back in my forest, I couldn't help but tear up a little. Tierwin, I want to spend more time with my new friend. I also want to spend time with Artoria. I will bring up the avatar when she gets back. I then heard a wonderful voice go off in my head. Lily, I can help with that, my cute little dear Wintilda. I shot to my feet as I happily jumped around. Tierwin, big sister Lily, really? Lily, really Tilda? It'll be up to Neo, 
but I don't think she'll disagree Tilda. Tierwin, yes. Thank you big sister Lily. I heard her softly giggle and her voice speak out one final time while it started to fade. Lily, you need only ask, my adorable little kit Tilda. 132, Chapter 48, Back to Danmucky Tilda. Stepping out of Tierwin's portal and back to the Danmucky world again, I let out a sigh. If I had taken even a second, I would have noticed that Deerwin was still in fact safe in our dimension. But, I am glad she made a new friend. That Neo seemed rather chill considering what I had done to that light scout. Shaking my head, I reapplied the illusion to my eyes and prepared to jump through the rest of the floors I had left. But I paused before I did and resisted the urge to facepalm myself. The only ones who most likely would be able to see me are the gods and the light scout. I very much doubt anyone else can. Would the gods even fall for what is basically just a prank? Crossing my arms in thought for a few moments I simply shrug my shoulders. If they don't fall for it I'll just remove the illusion but if they do fall for it I'll get a few laughs out of it. With that settled and me choosing the fuck it. Let's see what happens approach I start to spread out my sense to see exactly where I am in the dungeon, the floors I have broken through are already healing at an impressive rate, and thus I have no idea how many I have broken though, didn't take me long to frown in frustration though, the whole entirety of the dungeon felt alive and thus was blocking my senses beyond its walls on the current floor, actually taking a second to look around. The floor seemed to be a giant labyrinth made of tree bark, if I recall. This should be the low twenties for the dungeon. Artoria, fuck it, not wanting to bother with it. I just lowered myself and prepared to jump again. Without wasting any more time, I jumped and cracked the ground heavily and crashed through the roof once again. My trip was very short however, as I had blown up from the ground and was now in a massively open area high in the sky. Looking down, I could only smirk, as it seems I had also crashed through a few human buildings that were built in a settlement. Panicked screams were heard all over as the humans who looked like nothing but ants were running around in damage control mode. That's the city of Rivia or whatever. Hey, impressive that I managed to jump through a cliff like that. Then again, the dungeon floor is probably more impressive than some measly cliff. Quickly scanning all of the humans running about for any light corruption. I moved on once I didn't find any. I was a little disappointed about that though, as that likely meant that the light scout didn't make it this far yet, since they would have definitely spread the corruption to secure a welcoming base in the dungeon. With some lingering disappointment I shot off with the crack as I broke the sound barrier and crashed through the roof once again. I kept up my momentum till I started to see ants and shadowy human-like monsters. I quickly stopped my forceful ascent and touched down. R. Killer ants and war shadows if I remember right. I think I'll take a shadow for myself actually. As I started to make my way to the creatures, they turned round and actually rushed me. I stopped mid-step in confusion and didn't even bother to stop their pathetic attacks. Is it because they are dungeon monsters? Their souls are not strong enough to sense me. A. With a wave of my hand, the top half of the ant exploded into fine mist while the rest of its body slumped down and started to twitch as its everything started to spill out. The war shadow ignored the death of its comrade, and kept up its flurry of attacks. I simply grabbed one of its wrists and started to cover the thing with my black water with the intention of having it as a servant. It struggled in a pitiable attempt to break my whole door to stop the black water from climbing up its body. In only a matter of seconds, it was fully covered and my hold on it broke as the water bubble around it collapsed into a small puddle on the ground. Moments later, the puddle rippled and the creature broke the surface to claw its way out. The creature looked practically the same as it did before, but now it had a few grim plaits on its arms and legs, along with a half grim mask covering the top of its head. Artoria, good enough, you'll be Blake's new subordinate, go and report to her. The creature bowed before sinking back into the puddle and disappearing from this universe. Looking at the puddle, an idea started to form while a sinister chuckle escaped my lips. Maybe I'll corrupt the whole tower. Then it can go from trying to destroy this word, to converting it. I know it's already part of Deerwin's influence, 
but I have no idea what the final fate of it is. Another world full of servants for Dearwin and I is better than literally any other fate after all, and I don't think Lady Lilith would mind if I took that direction, as the people of this wood could fight back. Hey, well, they could try anyway, deciding to shelve that idea for now. I started to dash through the floor at speeds that were not attainable by anything on this planet sans the gods themselves. I was close enough to the surface now, that I didn't want to ruin my entrance. Cracking the ground every now and then when I had to adjust my direction, I was quickly making my way through the floors in minutes. Sadly, I have yet to see any humans other than the ones at that dungeon checkpoint. Damn. I should have left some black water there as well. Oh well. It didn't take long at all for me to notice the change in the dungeon layout as the walls took on a blue hue and the lighting of the walls made them look like pathways a miner would have created, and that's when I felt my first presence of humans since the 18th floor. A smirk appeared on my face before I quickly dismissed my visor as I approached the humans. Seems to be three? R, just around this corner. I can hear them now. Question mark colon bell cun. I think we should have listened to the decree and left the dungeon. Oh? The world's hero is here? Bell? It's fine. It's fine, Steph. We'll just stick to the top floors. I am sure whatever that disturbing feeling was, came from much lower in the dungeon. Look, even Lily is all for this. Lily? Yeah, more monsters for us. Think of the payout, Steph. But the gods don't shut down the tower for just anything. Besides, you felt that bloodlust, Bell. Okay, fine. We'll just get a few more. <laughs> I had turned around the corner, and was now looking at the trio. And indeed, that was clearly Bell and Lily from the story. Looking at the third person with them, it was clear this was the reincarnator. She had the light's corruption in her. But it was not nearly as progressed as it would have assumed it'd be. Another thing of note was that Belle and Lily had no corruption whatsoever. Source, https colon slash slash danmarkey.fandom.com slash wiki slash bell underscore crinal. Source, https colon slash slash danmarkey.fandom.com slash wiki slash lilaruka underscore rad. Interesting. Can she not infect other people? And if it wasn't for the system I can feel she has, I bet I could purge her of the light. A shame the system is more ingrained than the grown systems. Maybe this is a real system, and not a light construct that attaches to the soul. <laughs> Thoughts for later. But what really caught my attention however, was that all three of them seemed to be able to see me. Belle, another adventure? Lily, but... Her eyes. Steph, is... That sap not giving her a chance to finish. I appeared in front of her and grabbed her by the neck. All three gasped at my seemingly teleportation, and to their credit collected themselves quite quickly. Bell, release her, monster. He drew that fancy little dagger of his, and started to hit me in several areas on my arm to try and get his friend free. I just ignored the little mortal. As I kept my gaze on Light Scout and tightened my grip slowly. Let's up here little Tilda. Artoria, you do not belong here. Light spawn. The fact that a monster of the tower had spoken startled the three of them, but the scout's cry of pain from my grip quickly broke that little daze. She was desperately clawing at my armored wrist and fingers, trying to find any kind of leverage to pull in pry away my grip. Artoria, feeble. While massively holding back my strength I threw her against the dungeon's wall causing her to bounce wonderfully off of it while letting out some blood as she toppled to the ground. Classic. Bell. Steph. Bell quickly rushed past me, completely ignoring the fact I could have easily nabbed him if I had desired, but instead, I turned to the other human in the hallway. A smirk appeared on my face while horror was on Lily's. Lily, s stay away. She only managed to take a single step back before I was gripping her by the neck. Bell, Lily, before we could have a repeat of the last song and dance, I summoned a large pool of black water under Lily, and simply dropped her into it. Lily, Bell, oh, Bell, no. Bell didn't even think twice before he jumped into the puddle of black water, and disappeared into its depths. With an amused smile on my face I released a dark chuckle. After hearing some groans and coughing I turned my attention back to the scout. Steph, 
wh. What did Artoria? You'll see. You should have declined whichever god sent you on this mission, mongrel. Oh, I am starting to sound like Gilgamesh. Shaking my head slightly, I smiled wide as the two former humans broke the surface of the water and helped each other out of it. Their grim affection was rather tame however. Both had a few armor plates here and there on their arms and legs, while sporting grim masks on their lower faces. They also had the other classic showings of the black water changes such as corruption lines, lighter hair, pale skin, and dull yellow eyes. HMM. I wonder why the Remnant people had such drastic changes compared to these two? Maybe because they are not from Remnant? As I was pondering, my new servants were coughing out black water from their lungs and shaking off the dizziness from the transformation. Steph, wh... At? No. No. Guys, however, much to her horror and my delight they completely ignored her and instead bowed down on a single knee to me. Bell slash Lily, my goddess. Steph, no. No no no. No 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 no. Guys, guys. Lily? Bell, please, no no. With an amused grin I said, by all means you two, answer the human. Bell slash Lily. We have nothing to say to such a disgusting, and less a creature of the light. My smile threatened to split my face as the pained and tear-stained look on the scouts. Artoria. Then, why don't you throw her into the black water? Let's see if she is worthy of your attention then. Bowing even further at my command. They quickly stood up and started to make their way over to the scout. She tried to get up and back away but the dungeon wall put a quick stop to that feeble attempt. Steph. No, please. Stop. You two. We're friends. I. I don't want to. It gives off a horrible feeling. No. 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 Without even gracing her with some chatter, they unceremoniously picked her up by the arms and quickly deposited her into the waters as if they were dealing with everyday trash. And much to my expectation, she didn't survive the conversion. I could feel her screams of pain as she and her soul dissolved into nothing. With a cruel smirk on my face I said, Well, I guess she wasn't worthy. Lily scoffed and nodded while saying, no surprise there my goddess. Disgusting light spawn. Raising an eyebrow I ask, was she not your friend? This time it was Bell who scoffed as he answered, friend? She hid the fact she was a light reincarnator from us. I bet she would have corrupted us as well, if she was able. No, a real friend wouldn't rewrite their friends so they were a dog to the light like themselves. Artoria, fair. I have a job for you, Bell. I want you to corrupt this dungeon. I think I'll take it after all. So, start making some black water as you make your way down. If you start to have trouble soloing, just summon some help. Bell bowed deep and said, As you command my goddess, I will ask for Oracle Salem's help should I need it. And he quickly dashed off the way I had come while starting to create a steady flow of black water. Oracle Salem, was it? Also a small note to self, I am no longer adverse to them calling me a goddess. Tiling my head in thought I wondered, am I being narcissistic or is it some other reason? I was broken out of my pondering when Lily asked for a task as well. Artoria, right, before that, do you still have your falna or whatever it's called? Lily shook her head and said, I do not, my goddess. Your blessing destroyed the weak connection I had to the other goddess. Nodding my head, I started to move the way the trio had been coming from. Artoria. Then it is likely that Hestia is either having a total breakdown from losing all three of you, or is on her way here to try and do something about it. Lily, that does sound like something she would do. May I ask a question of you, my goddess? Waving her off and giving her permission she asked. Is it possible for you to bless her like you did to us? She is a good goddess. I shrug my shoulders but give a nod as I say, I don't see why not. Come, I've wasted enough time in the dungeon. I then pulled both of us into the shadows and sped through the dungeon instantly. We appeared near the mouth of the dungeon entrance, but I kept us in the shadows as I sped us through to the outside. Ha, huh, that's a lot of adventures guarding the door to the dungeon. Turning to Lily, who was looking around in awe at the shadow world we were in I asked. Can you tell where Hestia is? Or last was? 
Her attention instantly snapped to me, and she gave me a nod. I motioned for her to lead the way, and off we went. Seconds later, we appeared in the shadows of what looked like a weapon enthusiast's lounge. There were weapons all over the place on display, along with armor suits and such. Sitting on a couch were two women, well, gods I should say. Hestia was billing her eyes out with one of the targets I really wanted as a servant. Heifer Estes. Right, they are gods, so I don't think a normal dip will do. Better go all out I guess. So without wasting any time, I unleashed pandemonium, while I stepped out of the shadows with Lily. The two gods instantly snapped their heads to us and got up for a fight. Hestia, L. Lily? That was all they managed to get out before pandemonium's darkness covered the entire room and sucked them into it. Lily was looking around in awe once again before she spoke up. Lily, this is a far stronger blessing you gave Bell and I. Artoria, naturally, those two were gods, after all, their souls are very powerful, which brings me to yours and Bell's, they are very strong as well. I also noticed this was not a unique thing as we passed all those other adventures. I wonder if it's because you all are living with and blessed by your world's gods? She shook her head and said, I am sorry my goddess, I do not have any idea what you're talking about. I barked a laugh and waved her off. Don't worry about it Lily. Ah, it looks like they are done. As I said that, two sets of arms broke through the blackness of the floor and started pulling themselves up. The change to the two gods was a lot more pronounced than with Belle and Lily. Hestia now had little horns, along with several grim plates all around her body. Her eyes were a glowing gold, much like mine, while her skin was covered in black corruption lines, instead of red, and was snow white. She had a grim half-mask like bias that covered her right side of the face. It honestly looked more like a hollow mask than a grim mask. Her dress was now black instead of white, and the legendary boob ribbon was now red instead of blue. Her hair was an ashen gray, black source. https colon slash slash danmarkey.fandom.com slash wiki slash hestia a n. This is her normal look. As a reference, the changes to Heifer Estus were just as drastic. She no longer had an eye patch, as my corruption had eaten that divine curse like it was nothing. Instead, she had a half mask on her lower face like that of a ninja's of all things. Her eyes were again like mine and Hestia's and glowed gold. Her horns were much longer than Hestia's though, and curled behind her head like a dragonoid's would. Her clothes also changed to be a dull grey while her hair lightened in color significantly as well. Her corruption lines were also black like Hestia. Source, https colon slash slash danmarkey.fandom.com slash wiki slash heifer esters, a n. This is her normal look, as a reference. They groaned for a few seconds while they collected themselves, upon noticing me watching over them though. They got up on one knee and bowed deeply. I could feel the connection I had with them and it was stronger than any other servant I had created to date. H.H. Our goddess, Artoria, smiling. I reverted back to my normal pace as I resealed pandemonium and its corruption receded. As I was about to speak however, a black portal opened up near us. The two goddess got up, and stood slightly behind me as I had stopped them from trying to get in front of me. Lily had also joined behind us as we all looked on at the portal in interest. This reminds me of, my thoughts screeched to a halt when Crow and Raven crashed hard out of the portal and onto the floor. Crow groaned in pain, while Raven smashed her fist into the floor, cracking it in rage. She was currently engulfed in such a beautiful crimson-colored fire. I could feel the hate rolling off her and the flames as she stood up and looked at me with determination. Pain and a spark of hope in her eyes. She took all of a second to look at the girls behind me before returning her gaze to me. Raven, I need your help. 151. Chapter 49. One step closer. I watched in amusement as Raven looked over me, while Crow was groaning on the floor. Her feeling has changed a bit since the last time she popped up. She's stronger now and has something else to her besides her semblance. Crow finally managed to pull himself up from the ground while holding his side in pain, which was likely a bruised rib if I had to guess. 
I could only bark a laugh in my mind as after he took one look at me, he immediately went for his flask, taking a rather large chug from it. He then was looking at Raven expecting her to explain what was going on. Turning my attention back to Raven with a shrug I asked, All right, let's hear it. She's rather strong, so whatever she needs help with will most likely give a good fight. Raven took a glance behind me at my converts before asking, Light God and Dark God of Remnant, are you familiar with them? I chuckled darkly as I said, Yes, I am aware of them. She clenched her hands in anger as she said, they sent their lackeys to ambush me. When that wasn't working, they decided to try and kill me themselves. Salem had to hold them back so we, the beautiful crimson flames flared around her as she talked about Salem, causing her brother to step back before she focused and regained control over them. With a sigh and her voice ringing of hope near the end she said, We had to escape here, I think the only one who could help me kill them is you. I'm out of options and Kim Blee hasn't contacted me in years. So I ask you, will you help me? A vicious and downright evil smile found its way onto my face, and I licked my lips in anticipation when I said, killing more champions of gods. That sounds like it'd be great fun. Not to mention, if those two dumbass gods actually descended to attack Raven themselves they'll be weaker because of divine law. And more importantly, stuck on the mortal plane for a long while, nodding my head, I turn to my followers and say, all right, change to plans, I'll be gone for a bit, so bunker down, Lily, I want you to join Belle in taking over the dungeon while the two goddesses can go with you, I can tell I have some more corrupting to do with you too, the three of them bow deeply and said, yes, our goddess, nodding my head, I turned back to the siblings and said, all right, I want some more information about what's what, but not here. Closing my eyes I reach out to Tierwin through our connection. Tierwin, can you open a portal back to the dimension? I have some guests, and I'd rather have the talk with them behind my barrier. Tierwin's excited voice rang out with glee as she said, will do. I can't wait to meet them. Moments later one of Tierwin's portals opened up near the three of us as my converts had already left via the shadows to do their task. Looking at Crow and Raven I give them a wave as I walked into the portal while saying, Come, I heard Crow swear and say something as I stepped through the portal and instantly appeared in Tearwind's forest, not long after Raven and Crow joined me, but I chuckled silently as it seemed Raven was scolding Crow with a huff and sounding slightly annoyed at her brother she said, Try not to be your obnoxious self while we're talking to new people, will you? As I was looking around for Tierwin, I caught the looks of surprise and wonder on their faces while they looked around. It didn't take them long to notice the black water patches around some of the trees though. Crow looked rather nervous at a puddle that was near the tree we were standing near. While I was still looking for Tierwin, I caught Raven looking at the tattoo above her breasts out of the corner of my eye. Raven, I see. This is why you feel the way you do. Following her gaze and seeing that she was looking at my black water I gave her a smile and a nod, among other things. Now, where is? Suddenly, I heard Tierwin's lovable voice call out to me from behind the twins. Turning around and dismissing my armor, I was just in time to catch the pink comet that rocked past Raven and Crow. As I caught Tierwin in a hug she said excitedly, Artoria Tilda, smiling down at her I give her a squeeze as I say, Tierwin Tilda, thank you for opening the portal so quickly, you know the remnant siblings, Raven and Crow, even though she was glued to my chest and giving me snuggles she still managed to wave at them while saying a quick, hello, Tierwin and I then snapped our fingers at the same time and conjured a few things. Behind me rose a small throne that was created out of some basic black water, while I also formed half a table. Tierwin had formed the other half of the table that the twins would use out of a thin, fluffy and pink cloud. She also created two small pink clouds for them to sit on. Crow had a tiny smile of excitement on his face when he said, I get to sit on a cloud? Nice. 
Hello back to you, little lady. Both Deerwin and I glanced at Raven, and we both could tell it was taking everything she had to not come over to Deerwin and snuggle into her. Clearing her throat, she collected herself with practiced ease and as she sat down she gave a bow. Raven was locked onto Deerwin after she bowed and asked, Hello to you too, Deerwin. You're a goddess, right? Tierwin beamed with pride while sticking out her chest and saying excitedly, Yes, my name is Tierwin Alter, and I am a dark goddess. You're currently in my and my sister's, Artoria here, dimension. Tilting my head forward slightly and giving Tierwin some head pats I say, and my name is Artoria Alter, an upcoming dark goddess, and Tierwin's sister. Crow was about to say something when Raven gasped at us and I could have sworn I heard Haku a little bit. Chuckling and shaking his head he said, and ah, uh, I know you know us but I'm Crow and this is my sister, Raven, I'm a human and she's, he thought for a few moments before shrugging and giving up which caused Raven to say, I'm not sure I have a particular race anymore. Tierwin looked Raven over for a few moments before summoning her classic cotton candy stick. Between nibbles she said, you're a human grim hybrid. But you're on your way to ascension like my sister here. You have a very impressive authority in you. A few in fact. I know I said it was rare, but that's three mortals who have claimed authorities before they have ascended. Raven furrowed her brows and leaned over a bit while saying, Authorities. Ascension? She glanced at me for a moment before nodding to herself and saying, I can only assume it has something to do with being an upcoming goddess. Humming to herself for a few more seconds she said, Yeah, I can feel it on you. You're going to reach something soon. She turned her attention back to Deerwin before continuing. As I asked before, I need help with killing those two gods. They're there with Salem and I can't go back as it is or they'll easily kill us both. While the anger around her flared. She had a much better control over it now that she had some time to calm down, while she clenched her fists. It's the classic anime frustrated fist clench. Tierwin's eyes glowed a bright pink for a few seconds as she hummed in thought while she watched Raven before saying, Well, I have a suggestion. But, how far are you willing to go for your goal? What are you willing to give up? Raven gave a resolute nod before saying, Anything but my loved ones. I can't and won't sacrifice them. While Crow nodded at his sister's declaration Deerwin smiled and said, Good answer, but I will warn you nonetheless. The air around Deerwin changed with her demeanor, and as she looked Raven dead in the eyes she said, What I am going to suggest, will change you forever. Down to your very soul. A super serious Deerwin is also very cute. J. It's taking everything I have to not ruin this moment by poking her cheeks. While Crow sent a worried look to his sister, she simply said, If it can save them, I can accept such a thing. Nodding her head Deerwin said, Then you have two options, and since you're going against both factions, I suggest you do both. I frown at that, causing me to speak up. Wait, the brother gods are in their respective factions then? Well now. I have even more of a reason to help you slaughter them and their champions. Tierwin turned to look at me with a face that just screamed. You think? I couldn't help but blush a tiny bit as I rubbed the back of my head. Well, I thought they were neutral to be honest. Since they worked together to make their own multiverse. Raven leaned further upon the fluffy table and asked Tierwin. And those are? Tierwin tried to cheer me up with a few head pats and giggles before she turned her attention back to Raven. Tierwin's voice held a very serious and authoritative tone as she said, The first one, is to absorb one of the seals from Artoria. Now, let me be very clear. Only attempt to absorb one and only one seal. You will feel a massive rush of power from absorbing the seal, and might think you could take the others, while absorbing the other seals is within your power. It's not within your right, attempt to do so, and big sister Lilith will wipe you, and everything else connected to you from existence itself. Clear? I saw Crow visibly shiver from the warning, but it seemed to have no effect on Raven as she said, very well. Raven gave a nod and then looked between myself and my waters causing Deerwind to giggle lightly and say, you're correct about that guess. Oh, one second. Tierwin then snapped her fingers causing a light pink glow to emit from Crow. Nodding her head Tierwin said, There, 
Now he's protected from what is about to happen. While Raven gave Tierwin an appreciative nod, Tierwin chuckled lightly and said, though, his soul is very impressive for someone who has nothing special going for him. Famous twin link for you, I guess. Ah, I was kind of wondering how he was able to see me. Didn't think his soul was strong enough to see me, but I guess he had a bit of help from his sister Tilda. Much to everyone's amusement Crow pouted a bit while complaining. Hey, as Raven stood up and walked a bit away from the table she looked at us and said, You have my gratitude, I'm ready whenever you are. She came to a stop a meter or two away from the table before muttering, Gluttony? A rather interesting red aura rampaged around Raven as if it was seeking something, anything, to consume if the ravenous feeling it gave off was any indication. It took her only a few moments before she got it under control though. I nuzzled Deerwin's ears playfully causing her to giggle a bit before I set her down on the table. As I stood up and made my way over to Raven I warned her one last time. Remember Tierwin's warning. Lady Lilith really will erase everyone and everything related to you if you attempt to ruin her fun. When I got over to her she placed one of her gauntleted hands on my collar and then said, I'm not interested in earning her or can bleed ire. Though I'm sure I'm doing exactly what he intended right now. The next second, the both of us felt a strange presence the moment her gluttony power reached inside me. Through our sudden connection from her power I could tell Raven felt a particularly cold and empty void presence that watched her every move as she reached for the seal, while I, on the other hand, felt her gluttony power and something else. While what she was feeling I recognized as Lady Lily, I had no idea about what I was feeling. It felt utterly unpredictable everywhere and affecting everyone, though I could still feel another god's presence, besides Lady Lilith, watching us in a vested interest. I assume this to be Kimberly Raven had just mentioned, what an interesting feeling he gives off. Humming with my eyes closed for a few moments I then say, I can feel aspects of your benefactor. I am happy they don't have the stain of either the light or dark. A neutral, albeit chaotic presence. Opening my eyes I see Raven nod her head while she said, Yes, I can feel yours as well. It's like, death? No. Something more final. Seconds later, I felt one of my seals be removed and devoured by her starving aura. It was interesting to see her aura pull out a pitch black, almost void, blob of pure magic from myself and absorb it. We all watched in interest as Raven's aura shot up drastically and the presence of her soul radiated with an intense crimson, black energy, much like a star reaching the end of its life. While she was inspecting her new power increase, I too was inspecting mine. I couldn't help the wide smile on my face as I basked in the feeling of having another seal removed, unable to resist any more. I let my power flow freely and used mana burst, feeling the raw power I was emitting. I couldn't help but notice the concerned glance that Raven had towards her brother. Tierwin was right, he would have most assuredly died just now if he was unprotected. Putting that thought to rest though, I released a pleasant sigh before saying, Ah, feels good having another seal released. Seven more to go. As I was looking at the red-black flames roll off me, I heard Tierwin giggle and say something to Crow. See why I shielded you? While your soul is impressive. It'd still be squashed under my sister's power tilde. When Tierwin skipped over and gave the trembling crow a few head pats to cheer him up, I couldn't help but smile. That's adorable. Tierwin to the rescue it seems, ha ha. With a wry smile crow said, ha, yeah. I'm sure I'll be getting used to that kind of thing now. I turned my attention back to Raven and saw her looking at my black water solemnly. My eyebrow raised in interest though when I saw corruption lines crawl up her skin and add themselves to her marking on her chest. I also noticed there were now five snakes around her irises, when there were only three before. Ha! Huh. She has some interesting powers. She's kind of like a certain blue slime with her ability to eat things for power. Makes me want to unlock my seals even faster so we can one day have a grand duel. With a raised brow Raven asked, so I don't need to strip again. Yes, I was about to say yes, but sadly Tierwin spoke up before me. Nope. But, those are not the waters you need to take a dip in. I'll ask you again. Are you sure? This will change you. 
you'll still be you, but, well, a much, much darker you. Damn it, I missed the chance to burn that sexy body into my mind forever, completely, and thankfully, unaware of my less than pure thoughts Raven said with no hesitation, if it saves her and I can kill those brothers, I'll do it. Tierwin looked at me and said, Artoria, if you would, let her look at what she'll be taking a dip in. Giving a nod, and totally noticing Tierwin knew what was on my mind, I quickly moved away from Raven a good bit and then started the chant to release my scabbard. Artoria, from the foolish dreams of a damned king, realize that Avalon is a lie, for no man is without sin, and thus none shall ever pass, so instead embrace madness corruption and the power of sin. Relish in decadence and corrupt all who believe in the foolish dreams of the damned king. Light has no place in the realm of the corrupted. Pandemonium's grace. As I was saying my release, I felt pandemonium resonate a few times with Raven's power. Even curiouser, as my chant ended darkness exploded out of me, and surrounded me in a wild frenzy. I could feel its. No. My desire to corrupt the only two things it could in this dimension, the twins, however, I was sure that Crow would be destroyed by it, so I quickly squashed that feeling, and calmed down, as my power was settling down I heard Raven mutter, I see, with a mental head shake to clear it, I raised my right hand and it seemed like the abyss itself started to drip off it and form a steadily growing puddle in front of me, with a smirk I say, this, is what you'll be taking a dip in. With a very audible gulp from Kraut Irwin said, Artoria's black water can change even gods, Raven. This will rebuild you, body and soul. With a nod I say, it will be up to you, and your will, to not be consumed entirely. As Irwin sat down on the side of the fluffy table she said, one last thing. When you go in, you and my sister will form a soul connection. Normally, it will make you view my sister like a goddess and you would go out of your way to please her, like with all soul connections to gods and goddesses, but, something tells me, you'll be fine, with a smirk towards Tierwin, Raven wasted no more time as she stepped into my, newly named, abyss water, almost immediately I felt the changes she was starting to undergo, I watched in interest as the surface of my abyss water started to change, while I felt the link between Raven and I form, however, I soon felt one of her powers press against the link, it felt odd, and strangely tired, but I was impressed as her power had changed an aspect of reality, the bond between us that should have been worshipper and goddess was changed into kinship instead. With its job done, I felt the strange aura withdraw back into Raven, I then felt an extreme power surge come from Raven and her soul, and a symbol of a snake devouring a fruit oddly hovered above the water's surface. Hearing Tierwing clap her hands, I looked at her when she said, I knew her authority was powerful. Original sin, huh, very strong. Tierwing then gasped and covered her mouth before looking between Crow and I. She blushed and said, sorry. Spoilers, don't ask more. I wasn't even supposed to say that. Chuckling, I turned my attention back to the water's surface. I could feel the raw aura and power of sin coming from the symbol as it spread out and washed over us. HMM. Not as comfortable as being around my black water, but it still feels nice. With a nod of approval, I watched as the power grew some more and the symbol of sin became more active. The flames of wrath billowed and burned along the surface of the water while the feeling of gluttony's ravenous energy swirled in the waters. A pressure that felt like envy rose above the forming whirlpool and condensed, while a slothful aura lazily flowed around it all. Then a very greedy feeling of energy lit up the area in a wonderful crimson. Lust, that sexy feeling, made itself known and covered the top of the little maelstrom in a passionate crimson haze. And then finally, pride, the last one emerged. Tierwin was clapping her hands and cheering wildly at the display. This is so cool, don't you think so, Crow? Isn't your sister interesting? I could only smile wryly as Crow gave an awkward nod before looking back at the powerful display before us, before everything suddenly stilled, and Raven started to make her way out of the water. However, she was not alone. Is that another Raven? Oh hell yes. 
The Omniverse can always use more ravens. While I could hear Deerwin giggling a bit at my thoughts, I knew I was busted. Thankfully the raven was still pulling most, if not all, of everyone's attention to herself. As the last of my abyss waters dropped off her I heard her mumble pride. I then felt her power warp in on itself and start to change her appearance yet again. Her hair reached her calves now, though it was less unruly. The marking on her chest matches the image seen above the waters. Her iris is now decorated with small rings with a serpent pattern. Aside from this, her soul, which had been like a large star before, was now resembling a black hole, with a crimson corona of light around it. Her immense magic and what I assumed to be a divine aura receded back into her body with a calm ease. Her double, much to my hidden disappointment, sank into her weapon which had also changed under the abyss water's influence. Nodding my head at her new look, I let out a whistle as I said, Well, would you look at that? I could hear Deerwin giggling and clapping her hands at Raven. Raven then looked over at me while she rolled her shoulders and exhaled before smiling. Raven, want to go kill some gods now? With a dark smile and a nod at my head I said, sure, what about your brother by the way? He won't survive in the full power of my black water, abyss water, but he could in the basic or grimry model levels. We looked at Deerwin when she nodded her head and said, I would suggest it, at least to dip in the basic type, it'll make him immune to the light, dark corruption. With serious concern in his voice Crow asked, whoa whoa, how will I get laid ever again looking all grim like? Raven just looked at him with a deadpan stare, before grabbing his arm. With panic in his voice, he clutched onto Raven's arm like a scared cat and asked, Ray, Ray? With a calm voice Raven tried to ease his fears by saying, relax, I'll make sure you're mostly the same annoying idiot as before, but that didn't last long before she shook her head in what I assumed was exasperation while saying, give him the basic type, he's going to cry to me if he can't score at a bar. While both Deerwin and I giggled, Tierwin pointed at my little throne and said, that is some basic black water, you'll have a few changes still but they won't make you look like a grim tilde. As I watched Raven carry Crow effortlessly I said in a teasing tone, Yes, Crow, why not enjoy the seat of a king for a bit tilde? Crow was looking at the black throne with apprehension when he asked, Is this for spreading your chuny phase pictures on the internet? She sat him down forcefully while an evil glare burrowed into his very soul. As she said, I'll beat your ass later, just shut up and take your anti-corruption vaccine. Crow only managed to mutter out an R. She before he sank inside the throne and started to change. 135, Chapter 50, A Plan Hatched, Announcement. So, my bad. I forgot to mention it last chapter so I'll do it here. This is a collab with Seko underscore Kavaragi and the book Bramwin. Again, my bad for that tilde. As I was watching Crow sink into the throne, I heard Raven give out a pleased hum. As a favor to her, I lessened the change as much as I could to Crow while still having it strong enough to prevent any corruption. As I was checking on his transformation. Movement from Raven and another hum caught my attention. As I turned to look I noticed that a large amount of shadows with eyes in them began to seep out of Raven's weapon. Ha, huh, that reminds me of a Lucard's stuff. The shadow with eyes started to take a form and with a grunt that sounded exactly like Raven it solidified. Much to my surprise and glee it was another Raven, but she was butt naked. Oh hot damn. Look at those curves. And those breasts. A shame she already has a lover in her life, and to add icing to the cake I was feasting on, she stretched for a few seconds while releasing a satisfying moan. With a small smile the new raven said, ah, better, I was confined for a little while so it's good to stretch. Hello there, Artoria, Raven, and Tierwin. I, am pride. Raven was blushing up a storm as she asked. Why are you naked? With a mischievous glint in her eye she said, because you and I have an amazing figure. Anyhow, nice to finally talk to someone. I released a sharp whistle and with great effort I tried to lower the amount of lust in my voice when I said, you're not doing yourselves justice. Pride, amazing is to tame a word for you, 
Tierwin nodded her head and said, Yes, you are very pretty. Looking down at myself I internally sighed with a thought. I shimmered a bit as I dismissed my armor and donned my beautiful blue dress. With a sigh I said, Ah, I can hardly wait until I naturally look this old. Wait, did I age up again, even in this form? Tierwin looked at me for a few seconds while humming before nodding her head and saying, I think so. You look more mature, a bit thicker, as Nia would say, as well as your bust. It's much larger now. I smiled and gave Tierwin a head pat, causing her to giggle joyfully. I am happy then. Honestly, I much prefer to look mature and thick as Neo says than as a teen. I was broken out of my thoughts when Pride said, I do enjoy the compliments, thank you. You should take pride in yours too. Raven certainly noticed. Ah, right, before we go charging in though, I do need to let you know a few things of importance. She then released a mass of darkness that quickly solidified into a throne of sorts, which she promptly sat down while slowly crossing her legs. As I was burning the wonders in front of me into my mind forever. I saw her give me a wink while Raven just ran her hand down her face in what I assumed was a mix of embarrassment and exasperation. As a sly smile made its way across my lips, I subtly gave pride a nod to show I very much enjoyed the show. A soft pop drew my attention to above Raven's head as I saw Deerwin start to give her head pats with her tails while she giggled, naturally. This calmed Raven down a bit as she just smiled dryly and waited for Pride to speak up. With a soft hum first, Pride then said, First off, though we have a far better chance against the gods, now that you have all but one sin, it will be a rather damaging fight. Though the thing you plundered is being processed by envy and greed, that is, the gate of Babylon you devoured from Gilgamesh. The chains of Inkadu can hold off the light one while you kill the dark one. Get them away from the castle before you use that, though. It'll likely obliterate Salem if she's nearby. Apart from that, bathe in their blood. We're a step away from ascension and only need the blood of a dark and light god to make that step. Any particular questions? A grunt from Crow caught my attention as Raven said. I guess Kimberly knew that was necessary to ascend her. Crow started to complain to Raven before he caught sight of pride, or, oh, Ray come on, I my eyes, a shame they are siblings, he can't appreciate how fucking sexy his sister is. With an air of dismissal and taking a look over her brother Raven said, don't be a wuss, we're twins, who cares, noticing her curious gaze. He stood up and we all took in his new appearance. His skin was paler and smoother, hair a darker color while his eyes were a brighter shade of ruby. He nodded with a grateful sigh, glancing away from pride for a moment. I snickered lightly as Tierwin patted him on his back. With a sigh and boldly sitting back down on the throne of black water, he said, Well, I am a little confused here but that can be explained after you do what you got to do. Nodding, I thought back to what Pride had said which caused me to sigh and speak with a not so subtle hint of envy in my voice. You are that close to ascension, huh? How enviable. Sighing in slight disappointment I continued. Then you don't want me to fight the gods. I tend to erase what I fight. Pride then said, no, but those two slaves of theirs are all yours. For your help, we can offer you one of the fruits that will come about thanks to the ascension. Those slaves will most likely be stupid weak. So, I can't expect a good fight. This fruit on the other hand. Artoria, color me interested. Ever heard of the biblical story of the forbidden fruit? That is the original sin. The mortal discovery of the gods malice. In those fruits is the concentrated power of evil. You could say, further on, in your very own path to ascension. Once you're close to it, the fruit can help you push past that final hurdle, or, you can give it to a dark aligned god or mortal and they'll grow in power pride explained, watching myself and Tierwin closely. I was about to say something when Tierwin interrupted me. No, you will not be giving me that fruit, sister. You need it. And remember, when you ascend our powers will be linked. I do not need any power-ups. Caught red-handed it seems. But, she's right. She is safe from nearly anything while in our dimension. 
so I just have to make an effort to ascend fast to release her from this gilded cage. Nodding my head to Deowin I then turned to Pride and asked, I assume you don't have this fabled fruit on you, need to grow it? Pride hummed while looking around at Deowin's forest with a smile while she said, yes, it'll use the blood of the gods to grow a fruit which can be planted here, with your permission. I suspect with the influences here, it'll grow into quite a large and unique tree. With a smile and creating some abyss water to flow around my hand I said, yes, I would think someone of your standing would appreciate my abyss water and everyone loves Deowin's forest. As I dismiss my waters Raven said, hm, others come here, I suppose I'll meet them after, I'm ready. Both pride and I sported a smile filled with bloodlust, though, soon mine faded slightly when I remembered I only had weak prey. Turning to Deowin I asked, yes, it's time we go and take care of your little god infestation. Deowin, any pointers? Deowin nodded before looking at Raven and asking, yes, just one. I assume they are both in mortal shells, since you said they attacked you personally. As Crow and the Ravens nodded their heads Deowin said, then before you fight the two raven, you have to say I challenge you to in divine combat. Upheld by the rules of divine law. This will lock them in the mortal shells, soul and all. And when you kill them, they will suffer true death. She then smiled dryly and said seriously, but make sure you also do not lose. Because true death would also be your reward. Much to my disappointment pride soon melted back into shadows and eyes and quickly entered Raven's weapon. Raven then said, understood. We'll be back. Giving a smile to dear when I could, see you soon. Tia Wintilda. Raven held her weapon, Omen, to the side and cut open a rift back to her world, as she peered into the rift. Her chest marking glowed. She exhaled sharply before going through quickly. Before I stepped through I said, oh, right. Tia Win, why don't you let Crow watch the fights? You should be able to with the link we have right? Tia Win nodded her head and said, yup, I was going to do that anyway. I want to see the two brother gods die. As I was stepping through the rift I said, I am sure she'll make it hurt Tilda. A second later, I stepped out of Raven's rift, and caught the last part of her declaration. As I looked around, in curiosity I noticed we were in Salem's castle. Taking a second to look at the gods I could only scoff. They are not that powerful at all. I guess this is what happens when you are arrogant though. Taking up those mortal shells will cost them dearly. I then looked down at Salem and I could only pity her slightly. The light was purging her grim parts, which at this point, was a great deal of her body. Interestingly enough, his soul was still completely unfazed. Must be because of all the extra souls that are basically crushing her soul. Interesting turn of events that, being protected by something that must have been causing her no end of trouble, though her body won't last long at this rate. Turning my attention back to Raven I said, Raven, your lover is being rewritten by the light. May I? Raven's eyes turned soft and filled with pain when she looked at Salem and said, Yes, please. In a grand show of willpower and a want to hide her immense suffering from her love Salem said, A.R. Another woman? You're popular? Raven. Raven responded with a wry smile and nodded to me as the gods came closer only to have their faces grabbed by a still furious raven. She then jumped into the sky, still holding onto their faces. Seeing Raven quickly moving away while shaking the entirety of the castle with her jump, Salem looked at me with a grateful smile. With a sigh I said, she's going to have all the fun. These two are so weak. Oh well. First things first. Now, Salem. This is going to hurt a lot more than what you are dealing with. Remember Raven, and you'll survive, maybe. I really do hope she survives this. All those souls crushing hers need to go, and she can still see me, even though I have three seals released now, showing the powerful soul she has. Before anyone that was left could react, I summoned my abyss water and sent it to embrace Salem with its black depths. The water moved the fastest I have ever made it as it engulfed Salem in less time than it takes for an excited heart to beat once. I felt the immense pain Salem was soon overcome within the depths. The waters were working on destroying the light's corruption, as well as reforming her soul and body. 
Unfortunately the light's corruption was trying to put up a futile fight, which only slowed down the progress and extended Salem's torment. If she can survive this though, she'll be a lot stronger, and free of both the light and the millions of souls. Soon, the two little shits I was going to play with turned away from their patron's fight and looked at me. As I looked at them with boredom and contempt in my eyes the one that looked like Vali from DXT shouted angrily at me, You! You killed Gil! The woman next to him had a scowl on her face as she said, TCH! Shut the fuck up and think for a second! Did you see that fucking water she casually summoned? She gripped her spear tightly as I struggled to think of who this valley was saying I murdered, with an apathetic shrug and boredom on my face as I said, Gil, 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 Gil. Oh. You mean that fake Gilgamesh? No no. My foolish usurper. I didn't kill that fake Gilgamesh. Vali paused in his motions of getting ready for combat when I had said that. But my next words threw him into a wonderful rage. With a cruel smile I said, I ripped out her system, and then tortured them for a few trillion years. Then, I erased them. Much to my slight amusement, Vali was completely enraged. His fist became covered with draconic might while his body erupted into flames of a similar feel. As he rushed me, I noticed the panicked movements of the system stuck on him. He leapt up at me and punched my face with all his might. Flames exploded around me while the ground lightly cracked from the pressure of the attack. However, I didn't move a centimeter. He even failed to displace any of my skin, let alone my body. As he noticed this, his face started to pale, but before he could do anything else I spoke up. Artoria, how horribly weak, and boring. With a light flick of my finger I sent the boy rocketing away from me and embedding into a castle wall. Boredom and disdain laced my voice as I looked at the woman and said, Another fake. <laughs> Jeanne Dark Alter this time. Tell me, do you like dragons? Jeanne had a cocky smile on her face when she replied, Considering who I currently am? Yes. But for you, I'll make an exception. Planting her spear into the ground, she activated her noble phantasm. Waves of flame converged on me and several pikes attempted to pierce me from underneath. With a sigh I said, how boring. The weak flames simply washed over me doing no damage, failing to even warm me up slightly. While her spikes simply shattered on contact with my dress and skin, I knew they would be weak. But come on, I don't even have my armor on. Vali soon pried himself out of the wall and quickly rejoined his ally. But I could only sigh in absolute boredom. Even if they both came at me, I could kill them with my aura alone most likely. Well, if they didn't have systems to shield them anyway. With what felt like the millionth sigh since coming here I said, you both are not worth the effort. But... I have other ways to play with you. With a snap of my fingers my shadow exploded out in all directions. Several seconds later, a massive grim dragon rose out and released a mighty roar that blew off the rest of the castle's roof. I lightly smiled to myself as I noticed the worrying look on the fake Jan's face. Moments after the dragon was fully summoned another person rose out of the black depths, as she fully materialized she looked around for a few moments before she quickly bowed to me, I had summoned my Salem to get some fun in, with a tone eager to please me Salem said, my, how nostalgic, my old castle, my goddess, you have called, I created a throne out of my abyss waters and sat down while I rested my chin on my right hand in boredom. Nodding to Salem I said, Hello, Salem. I have a few surprises for you, but first, please play with that little ant over there that fancies himself a dragon, and for you my cute pet. Kill her, and make it painful. I commanded the dragon while pointing at Jeanne Darkwalter. Jeanne paled and cursed. Fuck. 121. Chapter 51. Is that all the fury you can muster, mortals tilde? My dragon released a powerful roar before it flapped its wings once to lift off towards Jean. Out of all the attacks it could do, I was honestly not expecting it to throw a very normal, yet powerful, punch. And by the confused outcry, nor was Jean. Jeanne, wh. She barely managed to block the titanic-sized clawed fist, but the power behind it still sent her off like a rocket out of the castle via several walls. With another roar, 
the dragon took after her as it ignored the castle walls entirely for its toy, I mean prey, turning my attention back to my Salem as she sauntered her way over to Varley. I smiled at his dumbfounded face. With a gulp and a slightly nervous chuckle he said, I am glad I am not fighting that thing. But then he frowned and turned his attention to Salem, and then looked at me raising his hand pointing at me. With a rather heated voice he said, fight me yourself coward. You killed the love of my life. I will have my righteous vengeance. Salem softly chuckled at his outburst and said, you? Fight goddess Arturia, please. I have Grim stronger than you as non-combat maids. I could hear the grind of his teeth in anger from my position, and could only release a soft chuckle of my own. With boredom clearly evident in my voice I said, I laugh at your love, I mock her useless death, and I deny you even the chance to avenge her. The draconic flames around him roared with his anger as he shouted, You! He charged at me in a blind rage only for Salem to backhand him down several floors and saying, Oh, I am going to have fun with you. Salem gave me a small bow before she jumped down the hall to follow the foolish boy. I closed my eyes and started to watch both fights, but for now I focused on Salem's. As she softly touched down, I could hear Vali groaning as he pried himself free from the floor. I was also able to hear his system talking to him warning him question mark colon Vali, that was foolish you need to focus that attack she did not only ignored all of your natural defenses but i felt it too his eyes widened in concern when he said what no you're right blaze shit are you okay salem hummed in a carefree manner and said my aren't the two of you a little too relaxed Vali gasped as he failed to notice salem even get near him it seems and he quickly dashed back to create some distance. With some trepidation in his voice he said, Blaze, how can she hear you? Salem smirked and said, Oh, I can do more than hear your little parasite. I can see her as well. And true to her words, the both of us can easily see growth systems, like this Blaze, as a digital ghostly human hanging around the neck of people. HMM. I can't be bothered to remember the system's name. So, be it is, with eyes wide, Vali looked incredibly uncomfortable and worried at Salem while his system said, You. Can see me? That is not possible. Salem just let out another soft chuckle while she started to inspect her nails. See you. Hear you. As she finished looking at her nails she looked at Vali with a ruthless smile that promised only pain and torment when she said, and harm you. Were neither of you listening to my goddess when she said she ripped out your foolish lover's system and tortured both for a long while? As the two were talking, I felt a pulse of power from the small pool of abyss water that Raven's Salem was in. Turning my attention into it, I looked over her form and smiled. Her muffled yells of agony were turning into fierce grunts. The grim parts emerged once again. Three sets of wings jutted from her back, three feathery black looking like an Evermore's wings and three wings with a dragon-like appearance, scaly and leathery. Her white hair cascaded down her back and reached her legs, turning black at the tips, while her irises changed from red to a pale gold. The light corruption was fading faster and faster. Interesting. She's taking on an appearance like my own Salem's but with a few key differences. Wonder why? With a mental shrug, I turned my attention back to the massacre taking place between my Salem and Vali. But before I could focus on it, I felt like someone somewhere had almost uttered something very foolish towards my Tiawin. This caused a very brief but noticeable release of my killing intent. Narrowing my eyes I thought, whoever that was, just avoided a fate worse than death. Cooling off. I turned my attention back to my Salem once again and much to be expected she had Vali on the ropes. I turned my attention away for only a minute or two at most, and he's already this battered. Useless. An amused thought passed my mind though, causing me to change my orders to Salem. Salem, be a dear and bring him alive after all. Alive, but he doesn't need to be in one piece. Salem replied with the joy I have started to expect from my followers. Yes my goddess. With a cruel smile on her face, Salem held out her hand that had the sacred gear I created for her as she said, Moramaza. Come, we've got a new toy to play with. 
The ring then released a large puff of purple fire before taking the shape of a red katana with a sharpened part of pitch black. Along the blade also had cracks of black that pulsed with an ominous black purple light while releasing traces of black smoke. Salem ran her fingers lovingly over the blade before she vanished from her spot and appeared in front of Vali swinging towards his left arm. Vali and B. What? A shield of light appeared in front of Vale while white dragon scales appeared along his arms. Sadly for them, Moramazas didn't even register any of it, and cut through it all like it was the air. With a scream of pain, and missing his left arm up to his elbow he jumped back. He watched in horror as the limb that was cut off with it and then quickly flaked away into nothingness. Vali, shit, light's healing embrace. The lower part of his arm rapidly regenerated and he sighed in relief, only to soon gasp in horror as the regenerated part quickly withered and flaked away, much like the original limb. When it started to flake away, he and his system started to scream in pain, while falling to his knees. Salem covered her mouth with her free hand while she laughed before saying, Foolish child, surely you noticed exactly what type of damage this did? I didn't simply cut off your limb. His system, while clearly in as much pain as him, said, Vali. Her sword cut a part of your soul away, and it was erased, along with a piece of me. Looking up at Salem with shock and slight fear he said, that's not pause. However, Salem seemed to be tired with his prattling, as she once again appeared in front of him and cut off his other arm. Another wonderful blood-curdling scream from the duo as the entire arm withered and flaked away before it seemed Vali passed out. Salem released her sword which caused it to burst into flames and return as a ring on her hand. Looking down on the fallen boy she released a scoff before saying, And you wanted the honor of fighting my goddess, foolish. There is a bare minimum you need to even think about challenging her and you are nothing but an insect. With a snap of her fingers, Vali started to float alongside her as she started to make her way back up to me. Smiling at the outcome, I turned my attention to Jean, and to say she was not having a good time, would be an understatement. Her armor was grumbling in several spots, and her spear was also badly damaged. The flag was also burned to a crisp, and only a small portion of it was intact. She also had several horrible looking burns all over her body. My smile only grew when I noticed the state her system was in as well. It was flickering and somehow was missing an entire leg while a large chunk of its stomach was shattered and missing. Jeanne, what the fuck is up with this dragon? Nothing I do is working damn it. Anything that looks like it does damage, only causes it to reform not even a second later. What the hell? TSK. How are you doing, Anna? Anna? Is her system's name, huh? All right, A it is then. A, A and B. When her system responded it sounded very glitchy and in a whole lot of pain. N and not G G G good. I I I, I don't un D D understand how it it, it is hurting me 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 me. The look of rage on Jeanne's face was great as she raised her broken spear at the dragon. Damn lizard. Hang on, Anna. We need to get out of here. This is a losing battle. No, this isn't even a battle, damn it. With a pained sigh it said, Where www would we go gg go? RPP Patro NN is still lllll fight ing ing ing. With an annoyed sigh Jean said, Fuck, fine, to the death it is then. Die you damn lizard. While semi-interesting, I don't much care to torment her like I want to with this volley. Oh. I know. With interest shining in my eyes I say to my dragon, eat her, and submerge her in the black water. I want to see what happens when dark corruption meets mine. My pet roared loudly in glee, and with a mighty flap of its massive wings it blitzed Jan with an open maw. I could see her smile foolishly as she yelled, perfect, I'll destroy you from the inside then you fucking asshole. I could only snicker at her outburst as she clearly forgot this wasn't a normal dragon in the slightest. After all, both Salem and my dragon are merely constructs of my abyss water, avatars mostly. As the dragon chomped down on the screaming fake Jeanne Dark, I converted the water she was going to be submerged into into my normal black water. Abyss water would simply erase her after all. 
I watched in some vested interest as she had a startled look on her face for a few seconds before both her and her system started to scream in pain. And much to my expectations, she reacted to my waters like someone heavily corrupted by the light does. That is to say, both of them are starting to dissolve and be erased, absorbed by my black water. It took less than a minute for the whole process to finish. In fact, she was dead and gone by the time Salem had landed in front of me with a passed out and whimpering volley. Looking up at my dragon, it released one final roar in victory before it slowly drifted down and rested on the side of Salem's broken castle. With a smile I said, good job you two, I am most pleased. Did you want to stick around and watch what I do with this one? Or do you wish to return? Salem bowed and said, I wish to stay for a while longer, my goddess. With a nod of my head, I turned to look at the dragon who shook hers. It then melted into a massive pool of abyss water that simply rushed to my feet before joining my throne. I then felt another pulse of power from the abyss waters ravens Salem was in. Turning my attention to her I peered into its dark depths. Salem finally grasped the remaining light within and crushed it to pieces. It was then overwhelmed by my abyss waters and she stood up out of the water with a calm disposition. The excess souls were gone and she felt drastically different now. I felt a connection to her that also seemed to branch off to Raven. She began to move, only to stop as we felt a form of assurance from the connection she had Raven directed to her. Taking a look up at me she bowed her head in thanks. With a serious tone she said, Thank you for helping me, I'd hate to think what would become of her again if I were to have died again. As I stood up, I snapped my fingers to dismiss my throne and said, No worries. She might not realize it yet, but we're family now. I then looked down at Vali and with a sadistic smile on my face I said, Well, let's get started. An inky black covered my hand as I reached down to Vali's system, and pulled. This quickly woke both of them up with screams. I only smiled more as I started to pull harder causing his system to loosen its hold on Vali. With a final pull, and a blood chilling scream from both they were separated. Vali fell down in a slump, only to try and weakly look up at me. N. No, give her back. With a toothy smile and my voice dripping in sadistic glee, I said, Oh, no, 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 Vali, I am doing you a favor here. You get to experience the same thing your lover did. I'm being very magnanimous here. Isn't that right, Salem? With a light giggle and covering her mouth with her hands, she said, Indeed, my goddess. Turning my attention to the light system in my grip, I say, Perception of infinity. Soul rot. And like the system of Gilgamesh, this one started to howl in pain, though. It was clearly weaker than Gilgamesh's though as it faded away into nothingness much faster. As the last bits of the system vanished from reality, and looked down at the broken boy, he was crying and repeating the name of the system over and over, asking for forgiveness and blaming himself for being so weak, reveling in his pain. I snap my fingers and cause him to float up to my face. I stare into his eyes and say, your turn, boy. As it clicked in his mind what I was about to do, he tried to call out to his god, my god, pee pee please help me, I need your salvation. With a cruel grin I gently caress his cheek and say, your god is no power here. Now, perception of infinity. As the spell took hold, I reached forward and crushed his jaw and pulled down causing it to hang there loosely. I then pulled my right hand back and plunged it into his chest and ripped out his heart, with his still warm and beating heart in my hand. I push it into his mouth and down his throat slightly causing his screams of pain and pleas of mercy to become muffled. My eyes burning in sadistic glee, I clenched both sides of his broken jaw and pushed them lightly together against his head. Artoria, now remember, your gums are bleeding because you don't floss your teeth. And with a gentle push, I crush his head inwards causing it to explode like a gory pinata. I then let his body crumble down and crash against the floor with a splash. Raven's Salem looked at the spectacle happening before her with interest and said, Well, that was quite creative. She then glanced at my Salem and said, mm, Me but different. Yes. You don't have any past lives on earth, right? My Salem tilted her head a little and asked, Past life on earth? No, can't say I do, 
You mean to say you do? Salem, Ravens, cheekily replied, I do indeed. I see that's where we differ. I mean, aside from being bedded by a ten. I don't mean Ozpin by the way. Salem, mine, just smiled and nodded her head and said, Yes, I got a general outline of the situation when my goddess summoned me. Even I have to admit your raven is quite beautiful and a good catch. I might try to find love again one day, but for now I am content with torturing Ozpin. With a nod of her head Salem, Ravens, said, Then I wish you good luck. I barely cared about Ozpin before I took the plunge. Now, HMHM, but let's go see Raven. Yes, I can tell she's finishing up. She then looked at me, as if asking for permission. I just shrugged my shoulders and nodded my head before asking my Salem if she still wanted to come with us, indicating she did. I snapped my fingers and the three of us were consumed by shadows and moments later we appeared near Raven. Just in time to hear Raven say, I'd rather not touch myself right after a slaughter. I just blink a few times, and then cough into my right hand to get her attention. Giving her a cheeky smile I say, no no, by all means Raven. Touch away, show us a grand play. Looking around, I can see a wonderful crimson fog that has appeared and it's filled with her divinity. I sigh and say, I am honestly jealous. I want to ascend and help my dear win as soon as possible. With a sigh Raven said, I swear, I swear it's pride's doing. Glancing over at Salem, Ravens, though, she had a rather intense look of appreciation on her face. Raven then said, well we can still help you on your way. I do have this now. The god blood that was covering Raven's body then coalesced to her outstretched hand and condensed into a fruit that also mixed with some of her divinity. She started to recap about the fruit before she interrupted herself. We can return to plant this. Why? Are there two Salems? Though, it was rather easy to tell which one was hers by the looks they were giving her. What with one being passive and the other being all hot and bothered. My Salem then did a tiny bow and said, Greetings Goddess Raven. I am a servant and follower of Goddess Artoria. She liberated my world from the light's clutches, and blessed it and its people. Nodding her head Raven said, I see. Better than the alternative, though, she clearly wasn't used to seeing two Salems at the same time. With a smile she said, Good to meet you. Should we go back, plant the tree and pick up my idiot brother? Salem, Ravens, chuckled and playfully chastised. You're pretty mean to him, dear. Shaking her head wryly Raven said, You'll understand when you meet him. Before I could even ask dear Wynn to open up a portal for us, it appeared. Giving a nod to everyone and gesturing to the portal I then turned to my Salem. Smiling at her I say, Thanks for the entertainment Salem. Come by sometime to play with dear Wynn whenever you or the girls want. Smiling back, Salem gave me a deep bow and said, it was my pleasure to be of use to you, my goddess, and I will gladly come by and play with goddess Deerwin when I have a chance. Good day, everyone. She then splashed down as she disconnected from her abyss water avatar. I reabsorbed the waters before I stepped through the portal. When we all exited the portal moments later we were met with an unexpected scene. A nine-tailed fox girl was sitting with Deerwin moving her multicolored tails dexterously under Deerwin's guidance, said Fox Girl looked over with a raised brow and smirked. In an incredibly seductive voice she said, Ara Ara dot dot tilde 119, chapter 52, Pantheon, announcement. Special thanks to Seko underscore Kabaragi for working with me on this chapter tilde. I just looked on in slight confusion at the Kitsune woman before me before it clicked. Neoha. Well, she sure ascended fast. Source, see themselves via a commission. She just smirked at our silence while using all nine of her tails to play with Tierwin. But she couldn't blame us, she's rather breathtaking now. That and Tierwin looks absolutely adorable playing and having fun in her tails. Neo's gaze then passed over Salem, and she frowned ever so slightly and and then hummed in interest. A few moments later she simply shook her head and gave us a small wave. Well, not surprised. She most likely has had to kill all of the Salems she's encountered thus far. She then looked at a little pond of my black water as she said, Nice crib. It needs a nonsense though. And not the black, 
spooky kind out of the corner of my eye. I could see Raven appraising Neo, and I really couldn't blame her. Neo was now a goddess, with several interesting authorities as well. Balance, magic, freedom, and eurism, I think. Hey, nice. She also has another, but it's undeveloped and I am too lazy to look into it. Truth be told, realizing I had been staring at her a little too long, I quickly blinked and turned my attention to Tiawin. She was having a blast playing in Neo's tales, but I was feeling a little jealous. With an amused huff to hide my jealousy I said, well well, didn't take you long to ascend it seems. What, is it by one get one free day? And, if you want an onsen, just ask Tiawin. Being unable to take it any longer I look at Tiawin and spread my arms wide. Tiawin smiled widely and soon became a pink bullet as she dashed into my embrace. Ha! Huh. I just realized I didn't drop my release of pandemonium. A. Eh? I can hold it indefinitely in our dimension so whatever. As I snuggled Tiawin I asked her. Hello, Tiawin Tilda. I trust you've been enjoying your time with Neo. Tiawin giggled a little before simply saying, Hey Chen. Neo tapped her chin in thought before she finished her explanation with a thumbs up. It was a good time. Kill the god and cut the moon in half before I destroyed a planet. Blake's here with Archeria too. She's into the whole cigarette look. Another raven too, I see. Gives me a Luke card vibes. Mn. I approve. She then shot Tiawin and Toothy grin before asking, Ooh. So am I adopted now? Cousin? Sister? Hitsune Club? This question had also gotten the attention of the others, but Raven looked a bit distracted in her own thoughts as she cupped her chin in her hand. She then stilled before giving Neo an odd look while asking, destroyed a planet? I could only let out a laugh when I said, planetary destruction huh? Damn. Even I have only devastated one causing a total extinction event, but not outright destroyed one. I then looked at Neo and Raven with a bit of curiosity as I asked, speaking of family, surely you two can already feel the connection you have to myself, Tiawin, and our dimension? Neo then nodded her head and with amusement clear in her voice she said, I sure can. Oh, and you're not far from destroying a planet, and you're not even ascended yet. As Neo lifted herself up on two of her tails, Raven also gave a nod and said, I can. Is your patron fine with that? Suddenly, a feeling washed over all of us. It felt heavy, yet not oppressive. Tierwin's ears perked up and she looked around excitedly. Then, a few steps away from us, a large crack formed in reality. Seconds later it imploded inwards and revealed. Nothing. There was nothing beyond the hole in reality. Just the feeling of the absolute end. We didn't need to wait long before soft steps could be heard echoing out from the hole, and soon enough, a tall kit soon stepped out, and the feeling that was blanketing us intensified exponentially, yet, it was still not oppressive. Dear Lily, she is gorgeous. Source, me via a commission tilde. I then heard a very familiar voice ring out in my head, thank you, little Artoria. You're looking quite nice as well tilde. My mind came to a screeching halt when I registered what was happening in front of me. As the goddess spoke, as Lady Lilith spoke I internally swooned. I am more than fine with gaining a few more adopted daughters. Her voice sounds even better in person. Just like the stars. Wait, daughters? I could see Neo was struggling with something, but knowing her she was trying very hard not to hit on Lady Lily while Raven was just looking on in interest and awe, with excitement in her voice Tiawin yelled, Big Sister Lily, it's been so long since you've come personally, Tiawin then let go of me, and ran up to Lady Lily who pulled her into a hug with her tails, Salem covered her mouth while her eyebrows raised before looking at Raven, with amusement she said, I see a theme, dear, I then caught the two of them glance at what I assumed to be null beyond the crack in reality and shiver slightly. I couldn't blame them, even I who could use null as an attack felt wary around such a large opening to it. I then heard the mutterings of Neo, and it almost caused me to do a spit take. Don't call her mommy, don't call her mommy. Lady Lilith then had a sly and mischievous grin when she said, But I am your mommy, Neo. I can be more than one type at a time as well, Tilda. 
I nearly fainted at the thought that flashed before my eyes, and it was only through the millions of years of muscle memory that I didn't blush or get a nosebleed. Sadly for me, Lady Lily ended up giving both myself and Raven a knowing look. Raven coughed to herself while she turned away and scratched her cheek. I on the other hand didn't bother to hold back my imagination since I was already caught. I again heard Nia mutter something as her eyebrows shot up. Oh, oh. Opening up new preferences for me here. With a smile Lady Lilith then said, I could show you heights of pleasure that would break your soul little Neo Tilda. I felt my brain short circuit before it rebooted moments later when I saw Neo give her a suggestive smirk. I am glad this isn't a real body, or I would have bled out. Clearing my throat I gently asked Lady Lilith a question to distract myself from the fantasies I was having. Lady Lilith, what did you mean by daughters. She then sat down on thin air as she moved Tierwin so she was on her lap and started to give her head pats. Tierwin soon melted into the feeling and was purring ever so softly. I made a mental note to improve my head pats, because Tierwin had never purred for me. Lady Lilith's voice echoed in my mind for a moment. Don't worry, little Artoria. You'll get better as time goes on Tilda. And, you can drop the lady part. We're family now. So it is fine if you call me Mother Tilda. She then smiled at Deerwin for a few seconds before looking up at us and saying, I mean just what I said, little Artoria. Deerwin here is my daughter. You, and everyone else here minus Crow, have formed a soul bound through this dimension. You are all family, my family, and a new pantheon, a new pantheon, and a family. This, this feels great, while I only care for Deerwin so far. She deserves as big of a family as she wants, and the others here are good, interesting people. I am sure I can see them as family in time. Salem ended up tilting her head in confusion as she asked, Wait, you included me in that soul link thing, lad? Er, uh, mother smiled at Salem and said, Naturally, you and Raven are true soul mates, so naturally, you share an extensive soul bound. Did you really think it was just Kimberly's machinations sending Raven to the same world as you Tilda? While Raven and my eyes widened at the implications of that, I noticed Neo had twitched at Kimberly's name, most likely thinking that the god I saw with Raven is the villain from Full Metal Alchemist. Mother rested her head on Deerwind's as she started to explain, You two are destined and protected by divine law to always end up with each other. Even if both of you suffered total soul destruction and ended up back at the seat of creation, you would meet again Tilda. That is an impressive connection. Even being wiped down to the most basic a soul can be before being erased and they'll still find their way to each other, that's actually really romantic and cute. Salem gave her a grateful nod and bowed her head. Her voice quivered with raw emotion as she said, Thank you for arranging our reunion. As rocky as it was. That last part is a little shocking too but I wouldn't have it any other way. Raven also bowed her head as she said, You forever have my thanks. I wouldn't even be who I am now without your help there. With a subtle nod of her head no chimed in, damn. That's romantic, it really is. I wonder if I have that with Tierwin. If not, I wonder if I could form it. Well, we already have a deep connection. And I refuse to let anyone hurt her in any capacity so I don't need to worry about always finding her if we die. And, I love her as a little sister, not romantically. Would that matter? Mother gave the duo a wink before she continued. Now, as I was saying Tilda, you are all family, in ways that are so much deeper than mere blood. But, I will not simply hand all of creation to you Tilda. I firmly believe in letting my children do as they please, and work for it. Plus, I expect you all would find it boring if I just snapped my fingers and made your lives perfect Tilda. Neo hummed in approval as Raven nodded. She leaned back and tickled Deerwin gently before saying, But, I am not above granting boons to my daughters should they ask. Just know they will have to be balanced out. Free power leads to nothing after all Tilda. With a shrug Neo stood up and said, I like at least a bit of challenge anyway. Nothing worth doing is ever easy. Raven added, I can agree with that sentiment. I nodded my head and with conviction I said, Yes that would be boring. And while I am the only non-goddess here and I am a bit envious, 
It honestly just makes me want to work harder, with a smile mother said, and that's why I chose you little Artoria Tilda. Is there anything any of you want to ask me? Tilda Raven shook her head and held up the dark fruit as she said, I believe I'm fine for now. I have to plant this fruit in a suitable place. While rubbing her chin Neo asked, I got an idea. Though it's more for Tierwin. Can I get something to tether souls here? Make a little Valkyrie squad of Kitsune to protect Tierwin and do stuff for her? Ooh, that's a great idea, Neo. Nice. Before mother answered Neo she motioned for Raven to go do her thing while saying, I am surprised your other half is being so shy, Raven Tilda. Other half? Oh. The sexy naked raven maybe? Pride I think it was. Then much to my expectation the second raven known as Pride emerged. Though much to my mild disappointment she was not naked, and was instead draped in tight-fitting living darkness. Honestly, I would be lying if I said I didn't also like this. Damn, I have been really thirsty today. Mother then nodded towards Neo, snapped her fingers and said, Naturally, anything for my little kit dear Wintilda. I then felt our dimension expand some, and Neo got a few more permissions that were not originally in the apocalypse system we were all now connected to. Neo looked over Pride with a smirk before she turned her attention to her new permissions. Pride looked up at Mother with a calm smile and said, How nice to meet you, patron goddess. Mother smiled back and said, Nice to see you again, Pride Tilda. I was wondering where you ended up after that last fiasco. Pride gave her a knowing smile and chuckled. Pride then started to explain with a little amusement in her voice. Well it was a long time. They saw fit to seal me when they failed to kill me. Ah but we can talk more in person and more. Intimately later if you want. Raven has no idea yet. Not much use telling her at this stage. Still a lot of growing to do before it's relevant. Raven frowned slightly and shot a look at Pride, nodding her head. Mother said, Of course Tilda. Sorry Raven, but it seems you're not quite ready for these spoilers Tilda. Raven then asked, That's fine. I trust I'll be informed later on. Seeing Pride nod her head with a small smirk, Raven was content for now and left to look for a spot to plant the fruit. Mother looked back at Pride with a sly grin as she said, You're in for a lovely ride, my dear Pride. Who could have seen you becoming my daughter Tilda? Truly, what a surprise Tilda. Pride simply chuckled and shrugged to herself before Neo asked another question. You know I have another girl in mind who could join us. Muscular sexy owl say I in girl. Guess you know her, Molily. Even though she made a small stutter at the end. It was clear that the mistake was wholly intentional. Neo simply blinked her eyes before she found herself sitting on one of mother's tails while another gently patted her head. With a smile that somehow was both motherly and enticing she said, Mother or mommy is fine with me. Neo and yes, I know of the little chaos sprout ma an apostrophe tilde. It was clear to me that Neo was both comfortable and getting slightly into it in other ways. Pride added her thoughts which caused Salem to nod in agreement. Huh? Kimberly might be interested in her then. Guys chaos itself. Literally. Oh? An incarnation of chaos huh? No wonder I couldn't comprehend what he looked like. He must be pretty powerful and most likely one of the older gods as well. As Neo relaxed in mother's tales while they swaddled her she said. Pretty sure she'd be interested in joining our Pythion then. She's not the kind of girl to settle. Especially if she has a higher scope of power to reach. That looks so comfortable. I want to try that as well. But I don't want to overstep my bounds. Mother hummed softly in thought as she nodded her head before she said, Sure. I can see her getting along with little Artoria. They could drive each other forward Tilda. R. That's true. If she is anything like me and enjoy. My thoughts were interrupted however when I suddenly found myself across from Neo in Mother's Tales. I was soon treated to the same sensations as Neo was much to my embarrassment, yet utter delight. Mother looked down at me with a purely wholesome and motherly smile when she said, You need only ask, little Artoria. We are family, no need to hold back. I heard Neo sigh in contentment before she teased me. He he he. Were you jealous? It does feel nice. 
Doesn't it? I could only weakly nod my head as I blushed and tried to hide under one of her tails. Much to my further delight however, I heard Deerwin giggle before she made her way to my lap and snuggled. I then heard Neo snap her fingers as she said, I'll have to make a list for stuff I need to do later. I'd hate for Mumai to arrive and I'd still be at this level. I'll have to kill off the guys in Solita and pick up my raven, Pyre and Neapolitan along with Shizuka. Then I'll go somewhere to learn something. Here related. HMM, sounds like she'll be busy. I need to hurry up as well, yet I still want to enjoy my time all the same. All the while. A giant black tree sprouted farther away from us, its leaves copying the cigar petals from Deerwind's influence. The bark was black and radiated the same energy as the black water from my influence. Finally, it was heavily saturated with magic, from Neo's influence. It stood majestically above the trees around it, like a landmark. Neo looked at it and muttered, impressive. We then all felt the tree pulse and then emanated the essence of sin. Courtesy of one raven Bramwin, I let out a whistle and said, now that is a tree, it feels awesome. Mother nodded her head and said to Tierwin, indeed, make sure to take good care of it. My little kit it'll not only greatly help your sister ascend when the time is right, but all of you in some way. Tierwin was still enjoying the light snuggles I was giving her as she said, You can count on me big sister Lily. Pride looked at the tree, which was slowly sprouting fruits and let a small smile reach her face. Mother lightly snapped her fingers and suddenly Raven was standing near all of us again. Blinking and seeing she was near us once again, Raven looked at Mother and listened. Much to my hidden disappointment she put both Neo and I down as she said, Now. A final word before I leave, I will not interfere with any of your lives, or fights for the most part Tilda. I may stop by from time to time, or if you call out to me, as I said, we are family. I take that very seriously, making sure everyone was paying attention to her she then continued, that being said, I will not step in and save your life, you are your own entities, and cannot be coddled by me. However, I will prevent anyone from unfairly killing you instantly with no chance to at least attempt a struggle. Stopping to let her words sink in for a few moments she continued once again. Two gods had already tried to do just that. One from each side Tilda. Raven already killed one of them. Well, he was foolish and trusted the dark brother god Tilda. Finally she smiled and said, if I believe you have a chance at survival. I will not step in. You have to live with the consequences of your actions, both good and bad Tilda. Any questions? My daughter's Tilda. Raven took a quick glance at all of us before she said, Do you care if I kill a good few of these gods? I've come to realize they won't simply leave me be after killing those two. I have to improve, if nothing else than to protect my family. I want them to become stronger too, so any suggestions on how to make that happen is appreciated. A warm smile with a hint of sadistic glee in it appeared on mother's face as she said, No, not at all. You could wipe out all life in the true omniverse if you really wanted to and I would be fine with it. My daughter Tilda, as for a tip for strength, leaning forward and resting her chin on her right fist she said, Trust in pride, and the power she and the others have. You're stronger than you think, and the avenues you have opened to you are many. That's true. I can feel immense power from her authorities, and the fact she can absorb power from other people is a huge win for her. Leaning back she added, and if you ever feel like you need a power up, simply ask me. I will give you a trial of sorts. They won't be easy, but if you truly need power and have no other way, Look to me Tilda. Pride then said, I do have a method, let's talk about it after you get your family back to Remnant. She then sank back into Raven's body. I couldn't help but have a few slightly naughty thoughts about the two of them, more so when I remembered that she also has the sin of lust. Mother then clapped her hands and smiled at all of us before she asked, Now, any more questions before I leave? With a small grin and wink Neo said, Not from me. I'll try to be fun to watch though. Later, Mama Lily, Mother winked back at Neo and added some extra sultriness in her voice when she said, Be careful my little Neo, this mommy knows how to play, and push all the right buttons on naughty little kids Tilda. Hot damn. 
We all heard an audible nasal inhale from Neo as she smiled in response. It kind of seemed like she was into it. Shit, I am into it. Mother then gave a knowing smile to both Raven and myself before she said, Okay, now I really must be going. My BFF is waiting for me. We have some people to terrorize in a Harry Potter universe after all. Goodbye, my daughters. With that, she shattered into hundreds of purple butterflies while the hole in reality finally closed. With amusement Neo said, Eh? She's having fun in Harry Potter? Sounds fun. Well I'm going down a layer in this dimension. I brought Blake and Archeria with me. Blake wanted to make a library and Archeria wanted to make a teleportation device to beat Excalibur's ass. Excal. Oh right. She did mention Solita. I better stay away. Otherwise I'll kill it. I just know it, Neo was smirking in thought as Raven added, I'm not sure I get the last part but feel free to call if you need something. I'll be moving my family back to Remnant. I then started to tickle Deerwin for a few moments before I said, well, that was not something I was expecting. Told you we were family Deerwin, and now, we even have sisters. With a smile Neo patted Deerwin's head with one of her white tails as she said, I got an upgrade from friend. Ha! Huh. Her tail smells slightly of vanilla. Raven then joined in on the head patting as she said, Mn. I've never had siblings so this should be interesting. I could see Crow almost visibly deflate when he heard Raven. Poor guy. Deerwin giggled with excitement and glee at the head pats before she said, I'll still hang out with you Neo. But Raven and Artoria, if you want to hang out you'll need to ask big sister Lilith to help me bend divine law again to send an avatar to your side. I nodded my head and said, I'll ask her, uh, mother about that, but I don't know if I could focus on anything but you if you came with me Tierwin. I could hear Neo suppress a giggle at my confession, but it was true. How could I focus on anything but trying to have fun with Deerwin if she came with me? Deerwin giggled and gave me a head pat as she said, That's fine, we can always just talk then Tilda. Closing my eyes as I enjoyed the head pats I gave her a nod. Neo then said, You're always welcome with me, Deerwin. Now, to join Archeria in beating Excalibur with a bat. She chuckled darkly as she vanished and started to make her way down to the new layer in our dimension. We really need to name this place. Hmm. Maybe Corrupted Eden of Sin? I then smiled as I thought of Neo and said, She makes a great Kitsune Tilda, and an even better sister. You know how to pick him, Tierwin. Raven gave Tierwin one last head pat as she said, Pride and I agree. I'll be back soon. I have to take everyone home and make sure Yang didn't teach Shiro anything bad. With a smile Deerwin said, Okay, goodbye sisters Raven and Pride. Sister Salem. Uncle Crow. See you later. Deerwin Salem waved as Raven pulled along Crow, who was waving over to Deerwin with a wry smile. As soon as they disappeared, I snuggled Deerwin while I dropped the release of Pandemonium finally. As I returned to a slightly younger rage I said, Okay Tierwin. I got a few things I want to do in that world I was in before all of this started. Then I should go take care of the last scout reincarnator. Tierwin nodded her head as she said, Okay, I am going to go see what Neo is up to then. I sat Tierwin down as I stood up while saying, Sounds like a plan. You really did find a good sister in her. I am happy for you, Tierwin. Enjoy your time. She gave me a thumbs up and then opened a portal for me as she disappeared. 115. Chapter 53, Second Authority, War. As I stepped out of Deerwin's portal I suddenly felt a massive influx of power and energy. Blinking in surprise for a few seconds I looked down at my hands and flexed them a bit in confusion. Much to my glee, Deerwin's voice suddenly appeared in my head with an explanation. Oh, it finally has fully awoken, sis. Congratulations, you've fully awoken your second authority, war. Humming in interest I say, so that's why I feel so. Energetic and giddy? Tierwin giggled a bit before she said, correct. There is a major war in that world now, whereas before it wasn't enough to help unlock your authority, but because of your takeover of the tower dungeon, you've turned it into a war for survival. And thus, the stakes for the war have increased exponentially as they fight for their very right to exist. 
I suddenly got worried about having this world ending because of my actions, as it was one of Tierwin's, so I quickly voiced my concern to her. Tierwin merely giggled and said, it's fine, I don't mind sacrificing a world to help you unlock one of your authorities, and a major one too. Besides, our family has recently grown a lot, remember? Raven herself won a large swath of the remnant multiverse by killing both of the brother gods in divine combat. Alongside a multitude of other universes they had taken over, I let out a breath I didn't even know I was holding in relief as I nodded. That's good then. Well, guess I'll enjoy this world to its fullest. Though with my third seal being removed, and I am so much stronger than before. Tierwin hummed in my mind for a few seconds before she said, Yay, if you want a real fight, you'll need to fight in that universe's heaven so the deities can have free access to their arcanum. But I should warn you, sis, don't take them lightly while on their home turf. You'll get the fight you want, and then some. A cruel grin made its way onto my lips as I said, Excellent. I'll just follow the connection the two goddesses I corrupted have with their main bodies to find the plane. Thanks dear Wintilda. With a soft giggle she said, no problem, Sister Artoria. Now, I'm going to get comfy and watch you have fun. Nodding my head, I then focus on my connection to the two goddesses I corrupted. I soon found them on the first floor of the dungeon, while a large contingent of mortals and god, Tissus alike were fighting at the entrance. My smile widened as I sunk into the shadows while thinking. Let's kick this war into overdrive then. There should be hundreds or even thousands of god, this is for me to fight against. This is gonna be good. As I stepped out of the shadow on the wall Hestia and the others were already kneeling and greeting me. Welcome back, goddess Artoria. Motioning for them to stand, I said, thank you. I see everyone has been having some fun. <laughs> well, we're going to kick this off into high gear, Hestia. Heifer Estes, we're going to where your real bodies are to merge the sliver of your soul that I have corrupted with the rest of you. Can you tell anything about the state your real bodies are in, and their surroundings? As everyone stood back up, the two nodded and closed their eyes for several minutes. While they were checking on the state of their true selves, I asked Lily to give me an update on everything. She bowed to me and said, my goddess, Bell is currently at the lowest section of the dungeon still as he had only just taken over the dungeon fully a few hours ago. She smirked as she continued, you should have heard the swearing he started when the dungeon started to fight back in earnest. Lady Hestia was so shocked. Chuckling lightly I asked, and why is he still down there? Lily gave me a wry smile and said, well, after he got to the dungeon core and corrupted it. Thus bringing it into the fold, they started talking. It seems the core and bell get along swimmingly and thus, he stayed behind to talk with it and to come up with plans for taking over the surface. I was about to comment when I noticed that Hestia and Heather Estes were done and waiting, so I turned my attention to them. Seeing as I was paying attention to them Hestia said, I can confirm that my connection to my true body is still strong. It's been resisting the corruption, but this has caused it to enter a sort of sleep from what I can tell. Same for you, Hefer Estes. With a nod Hefer Estes said, I am much the same, though my true body is showing signs of corruption because of the kid in my eye. My divinity is fighting back but it's naturally a losing battle. I am also able to sense around me because of this, as it seems your corruption has taken the place of the other curse. My body at least is alone in my home from what I can tell. Bringing my hand up to my chin I hum in thought, best bet to start my incursion of this universe's heaven would be with Hephaestus. That will give me a good foothold. With the formation of a plan, but mostly just wanting to go and fight already. I nod and say, all right, we'll start the invasion of heaven with Hephaestus. Lily, you tell Bell to ramp up things down here a lot. I want this dungeon pumping out monsters as fast as it can. Lily bowed while saying, by your will, my goddess. She then sank into the shadows and left to go give my orders. Motioning for the two goddesses to come near me, I start using my spell to dimension hop. I noticed that it took less than a second to fully charge now that I have three seals gone, which caused me to smile. Closing my eyes. 
I followed the connection between Hephaestus and her real body in an attempt to find heaven. Much to my glee, it was rather easy because of the state her real body was in. With a thought and no fanfare, reality melted around the three of us and then reformed seconds later. Looking around, I could only nod my head in appreciation of Hephaestus's home, or at least her bedroom. It was massive, as I am sure all God's rooms are. But what caught my eye was the fancy bed, and the veritable array of weapons all mounted on the walls and sides of the bed. With an impressed whistle I say, damn, heifer Estes, you like showing off your work, I take it. Not that I blame you though. Those are some nice looking weapons. Heifer Estes smiled at me and said, thank you, my goddess. I take pride in the work here. Did you want any of them? I shake my head and say, nah. No offense to you, Hefa Estes, but you'll never be able to craft a weapon like my Excalibur Morgan. She raised her eyebrow and asked, may I see it? I nod my head while motioning to her true body with my hand. Yes, but after you combine with your real body. Unlike me, my sword cannot lower its presence on the world around it. So if we're not detected yet, we will be the second I summon it. With stars in her eyes Hefa Estes said, at once, my goddess, I can't wait to see the weapon that you call yours. She quickly moved over to her real body, and placed her hand over her heart. I would be lying to myself if I said I didn't hope she'd give it a good squeeze. Shaking my head I scold myself, not the time, Artoria. I am feeling slightly pent up after seeing all of the sexy women that became my sisters it seems, quickly shaking away, and mostly failing. My impure thoughts, the heifer estuses were soon covered in some of my abyss water in a cocoon-like construct. It didn't take long for black-red lightning to start covering the surface of the egg and for it to start to crack. A wonderful royal purple light was seeping from the cracks before the whole thing shattered with a splash. Where there were two, now there was one. I watched in interest as the entire room, or the whole building I assumed quickly followed suit and changed to a darker color. Where before the walls of her room were a white marble, now they are nice polished black. As I was looking around at my work, I heard Heather Estes moaning which drew my attention. Looking at her I internally frowned as I thought, she has to be doing that on purpose. There is no way you moan like you're having the best sex in your life as you wake up. As her eyes fluttered open and she sat up, her look was back to how her mortal shell looked. All nice and grim, water corrupted. She looked around for a few seconds in confusion before she turned to us and smiled. As she got out of her bed, she kneeled down and said, My goddess, it's like I have woken up from a nightmare, only to see your brilliance. Thank you for your gift. I couldn't help but smile as I looked down at her. After asking her to stand I said, You're welcome. Hefa Estes. Now. We've got a water wage against the rest of the god. This is here. Do you know how many I'll have to deal with? She frowned in thought before saying, I am sorry, I do not know. It's been so long since I've paid any attention to our numbers. I hummed in thought while nodding my head for a few seconds. But her fidgeting quickly pulled my attention away from any plans I was going to make. With an eyebrow raised I asked, What is it, Hephaestus? She blushed lightly while poking her index fingers together as she asked, May. May I see your sword, my goddess? Lightly chuckling at her antics I summon my Excalibur Morgan while holding it outward so she can inspect it. It was currently also in its sheath, but we could all still feel it thrumming with power. Her eyes lit up like a child on Christmas Day as she inspected it. She reached out to draw it and before I could tell her to stop she received a small zap of black-red lightning. Letting out a surprised yelp Heifer Estes said, Ah, well, that was my mistake. I should have known a weapon such as this would not want anyone but you to wield it. I am sorry. Waving her apology off I said, It's fine. Now you know. Here, I'll draw it so you can see the blade. It's quite beautiful. She was nodding her head so fast. I could have sworn I heard a few sonic cracks. Feeling a bit playful, I slowly unsheathed my blade. While she marveled at the blade and its patterns, I actually took note of a change. There was now an inscription on my blade, whereas before it was just patterns. Looking at it, I couldn't make out what language it actually was, 
but I could somehow still understand what it said. Three simple words, all to null. I raised an eyebrow as I mused to myself, makes sense, being that my release is an attack of null. But, how come I never noticed it before? The world around me lost its color, and I was unable to move. I was about to try and get out of the situation when I heard mother's voice in my head. With a soft chuckle she said, congratulations, little Artoria Tilda. You're finally strong enough to start seeing some of the changes you've gone through in your long life. That inscription is part of a blessing your past self had earned from me. And you're finally strong enough, mentally and by strength of soul, to start working towards fully unlocking it Tilda. I couldn't help myself as my excitement started to rise, as I had a pretty good idea what that blessing was. With another giggle that caused me to swoon after my own mother she said, You are correct, little Artoria Tilda. The blessing your past self had earned from me is a minor authority in Null. You're the first entity in trillions of trillions of cycles of the true Omniverse that has earned that from me, and not be immediately erased from it Tilda. If I could move right now. I would have the biggest madding grin on my face right now. My thoughts raced at the implications of being able to wield Null, even at a minor authority level. As I was lost in fantasies about what I could do, I suddenly felt my face being cupped by a pair of hands. My spine shivered as I felt Mother whisper into my ear, Work hard, my beautiful daughter Tilda. You have the potential to even unlock a major authority in Null. 109. Chapter 54. A new challenger appears. Mother's voice and presence faded and soon the world gained color again. I must have really had a big stupid grin on my face because I noticed that both Hestia and Hefa Estus were looking at me with raised eyebrows. Refusing to blush I instead coughed into my hand and explained what happened. Mother just visited me and had some wonderful news. I am more than a little excited about it. As I sheathed my blade and set it back onto my waist Hefa Estus asked, Oh, may I be so bold as to ask who your mother is, my goddess, nodding my head as I walked past her towards the large double doors in her room I said, You may, my mother's name is Lily, though, her title and species will give you a better idea of who she truly is. With a smirk I looked back to the two followers and as I opened the doors I said, Lily, the null soon." I let out a soft chuckle as I watched their faces pale while we continued into the hallway, ignoring the two stunned statues for now. I looked down both ends of the large hallway and noticed that it too had several weapons and a few suits of armor on display. Walking forward a bit, I looked out of the large oval window that was in front of me, and smiled. It seems we were on the second floor, and below us was a vast garden. What caused me to smile however, was that the garden was steadily being corrupted and the flowers changing. As I watched the red roses turn to black I thought, I wonder just how strong their connection to this dimension really is. I can only assume it's as strong as what I have with mine. I wonder if that means if I wanted to, for some stupid reason, to avoid fighting I could corrupt everyone by just corrupting the dimension itself. I wasted no more energy on this trail of thought though, the very idea of not fighting for something like this was heresy to me. My very core, or maybe just my war authority, agreed with this thought. Mentally shaking my head, I turned round and snapped my fingers to get the attention of the still stunned goddesses. With an amused smile I asked, is it truly that surprising? Hestia was the first one to shake off her surprise and then she slightly frowned and said, you're kidding right? Learning that your mother is the Lilith is very surprising. With a small flinch at Hestia's volume Hefa Estus said, and the fact that we are all still existing, means you are not lying. Truly, you are well beyond us lowly deities in potential. With a smirk I said, yeah, well, you all are too busy playing your little games with the mortals instead of actually trying to grow in power. I mean, I don't really blame you though. You have no idea that you are all just tiny blips in the true omniverse. Shit, do you even know about other multiverses? Both of the goddesses shook their heads as Hestia answered. No, we had no idea until you blessed us and we got some general knowledge about you. Nodding my head in understanding I said, thought as much. Anyway, 
Hefa Estes, which way is out? I want to get to the fighting already. Hefa Estes smiled as she pointed to the right and said, That way, my goddess, just down this hallway, and take a right down the stairs and then straight until we're outside without wasting any more time. I followed her directions while getting lost in my thoughts again. Should I release Pandemonium right away and play it safe? Or should I treat this little adventure as a DBZ episode? As I was tossing the idea around on whether or not I wanted to take this seriously from the start we quickly came to the door leading outside. With a shrug I said, May, I'll play it by ear like I always do. Now, which way to your true bod? However before I could finish asking Hestu about her true body's location, my instincts flared warning me of something. My hand moved faster than light as I caught a golden arrow that was aimed for my heart. With a small frown I looked down on the arrow and said, Well now, that is just like her isn't it you too? Artemis is trying to end the fight before it can even begin. The arrow started to tug against my grip trying to return to its mistress, but I was having none of it. Focusing on the arrow it started to quickly turn black and take on a sinister feeling. With a cruel smile I lifted the arrow up in a throwing position and said, There, now you can have your little toy back, Artemis. With an annoyed grunt, I augmented myself with reinforcement and threw the arrow as hard as I could. The black pavement below me caved in from the pressure and there were several loud cracks as the arrow broke through the sound barrier several times. With a bit of hesitation in her voice Hefa Estes asked, You don't really expect that to hit her, do you? With a chuckle I shook my head and said, No, no I do not. I expect her to dodge it thinking it's a normal arrow. With confusion Hestio asked, It's not a normal arrow. Uh but she was interrupted by a massive explosion off in the distance. While it's true that what Artemis had shot was a normal arrow filled with her divinity, what I sent back however was something far worse. Not only did I corrupt the divinity in it so she could no longer control it, but I also used my authority of war to alter said arrow. I had turned her normal hunting arrow to a weapon of war that was basically a nuke filled with corruption mana. With a hum I thought, well, it's really just my mana, but since my authority over corruption is the strongest by far, that's what my mana has aspected as. Oh, there is a thought, if Null becomes my strongest authority, I'll have to play carefully as my mana will be that aspect. Hmm. Thoughts for later. As the black mushroom cloud was starting to settle down I said, okay, I'll play with. However, I was once again interrupted by my instincts flaring and the world seemed to slow down as I looked at what was heading my way. Arrows. Trillions and trillions of arrows. I smirked as I reached for my sword and quickly drew it. With time seemingly still slowed down I thought, well, now we're talking. This is more like an attack from a god. There is enough divine mana in each of those arrows to crack a world, and not a single one is aimed for Hestia of Hefa Estes, which is perfect. Phil must think they can be saved. As time started to return to its normal speed, my form started to blur and leave trillions of after images from how fast I was moving to counter this divine volley from the Huntress Goddess. My voice echoed out and sounded distorted as I gave my two followers their orders. It seems they want to save you too. Use that to your advantage. Go and get Hestia's true body. Summon help if you need it. I trust you know how and who. I was able to hear some more in their voices as they answered, by your will. Our goddess. As I sensed them leaving via my shadow, I also took notice of what exactly was happening. With every arrow I struck, with a cruel smirk I thought. So it would seem my sword has properties of null now. Every arrow that I strike isn't just breaking. They are also vanishing completely. Hey, you have truly become a fine weapon now. Haven't you my eternal partner? I couldn't help but bark a laugh as I said to no one. Too bad there is no real sun. With all these arrows in the sky, I could be fighting in the shade. As fun as this initially was. It was starting to get boring as it seemed Artemis was hell-bent on trying to overwhelm me with numbers alone. I had noticed that the quantity of arrows had started to increase exponentially over time, but it was all the same to me. If I was being honest with myself, I would be disappointed. Sure, 
This is impressive but at the same time it isn't. She is a goddess for fuck's sakes. Yet all she is doing is just shooting a lot of arrows in the end. Sure, a single arrow can crack a planet, but that's not really impressive in the grand scheme of things. With a mental sigh, I started to push against the endless tide of disappointment and headed towards their source. I even had enough time between each arrow to even start sending my own attacks underneath the volley. Some good Olay burst tears. It must have made for an interesting sight to anyone watching. Above me. The air was so full of arrows it might as well look like a giant golden tree trunk, and below it, there were large beams of red-black light being shot off in the other direction. I didn't even make it twenty steps before the volley stopped, causing me to rocket off to where Artemis was waiting. I knew it was a trap, but I didn't care. Seconds later I arrived with a loud crack and looked around. I took a quick look behind where I came from and I was unable to see Heifer Estes's home anymore. With a small smile I thought, well, at least she has some range to her. My thoughts were interrupted when I felt a power wash over me, and trees started to rapidly grow all around. In less time it took me to get here. I was now in a thick and vibrant forest. I then heard a voice echo out all around me. Vile, that is the only word I have for a creature such as you. You reek of a source not seen before, and it corrupts and twists all that is good in our heaven. I couldn't help myself as I let out a dark laugh while a cruel grin crept up on my face. Though my stance looked relaxed, I was primed to cut down anything that would show up. With my voice filled to the brim with mockery I asked, And? Are you so weak you need your domain to even have a hope? Once again her voice echoed all around me. It is not a weakness for the hunter to accept that the prey is stronger than them. I cannot defeat you alone, but I can stall you until help arrives. Feeling my instincts flare up, I turn around and catch an arrow that was aimed for my neck. With a chuckle, I simply snap the arrow and toss it aside. Looking all around me I asked, can you now? Well, let's make a little bet then. What will arrive first? Your fellow deities, or my? As her voice echoed out. I could hear the small amount of interest in it as she asked, you. I raised my free hand to the sky and said one word, meteors. I heard her gasp and release a panicked scream as she yelled, are you mad? Looking up, I saw the beauty of my spell falling towards us high, high in the sky. A meteor triple the size of my old earth's sun was making its way towards us. Keeping a neutral face I thought, I may have put too much mana into that. May, not like it will hurt me, but if I can't stop it it will most likely destroy this dimension in its entirety from how much mana it's giving off. Looking back down towards the forest I smirk and say, Tick tock, are you going to come out and play? Are you going to run? But if you do, where to? I am sure you can feel the amount of mana that thing is giving off. Her voice echoed out, but this time it was filled with both fear and rage. Monster, you have no confidence in your power to take on more than one of us, so you'll take everyone down with you? I frowned in annoyance before I disappeared from where I was standing, leaving a completely solid after image. Moments later the ground around the image shatters and caves in as a large area around it explodes from the kinetic force of my movement finally catching up. However a scream of pain had long since rang out as I had binned Artemis to a tree with my sword going through the exact middle of her chest. I made sure to suppress the null effect of my sword for now, as I wasn't done with her quite yet. Grabbing her by the chin harshly as I pushed my blade further into her body I said with annoyance, Oh, I have nothing but confidence in my power. Don't ruin my fun by saying something careless now, as both my gaze and sword pierced right through her. I saw nothing but fear in her eyes, which made sense, as I had managed to not only find her in her own domain, but I also managed to surprise and wound her before she could even react. Leaning in towards her ear, my voice was filled with disappointment and annoyance as I whispered, stop underestimating me, or you'll find yourself as nothing but a helpless rabbit in front of me. Leaning back, I let loose my entire blood lust in the area around me. It caused the air to stain red, and the trees around us to explode outwards in warped red chips. Pulling my sword out of her chest, I also started to suppress my blood lust again. 
As I held her shivering form by her chin still, I said, Now, do give it your all, Artemis. Store me for as long as you can, and pray to whatever god or goddess that is your boss that help arrives sooner than you were expecting. You are on several time limits now. After all, with that all said and done, I threw her hard in a random direction deep into her domain. A large sadistic smile was on my face as I glanced at my spell falling down towards us as I started to walk after her. With a malevolent laugh I said, time for round 2. 106, chapter 55, the more the merrier. As I lazily battered away another gold narrow, I sighed. As my eyes tracked Artemis centering another tree to teleport somewhere else I thought, this is boring. She is not even trying to engage me in any form. Just taking a pot shot at me and then teleporting as soon as she can. With a disappointed sigh I raised my sword up past my head with the blade pointing down and said, you are boring me, but it was my mistake to expect a deity of hunting to provide any entertainment. Let's. Feeling a sense of danger flaring up from my side. I quickly corrected my posture and blocked a two-handed sword strike that was clearly trying to cleave me in twain. I took a good look at my new opponent as my fist was coming up to crash into her stomach. She was a fully armored woman, with a style reminiscent of the Greek warriors but in a much more feminine and showy style. She had a large shield on her back, and an owl on her left shoulder. Time slowed down as my fist started to touch her breastplate. Looking into her green, blue and grey eyes all I could see was surprise mixed with immense anger. As my fist started to slowly dent her armor, she displayed a feat worthy of a goddess of battle. Although she was moving a great deal slower than I was, she still managed to bend her body with the strike to greatly lower the damage. However, even with her marvelous display she still shot off like a rocket as I relaxed my senses ever so slightly to resume time. Tilting my head to the left to dodge another useless arrow. I quickly rushed after the new goddess, the excited beat of a heart later, I was in front of her still flying form with my sword raised behind me to strike across her body, with an audible TCH from her. She wasted no time in drawing her shield to block my sword strike, as she crashed through a tree, my sword clashed with her shield. A loud and crushing sound was made as the two weapons of legends met. The force of my attack caused a kinetic burst of energy around us destroying several thousand meters of the forest in every direction. With a cry of anguish and a barely audible crunching sound of bones because of the impact, she shot off even faster while breaking the sound barrier. Not finished having fun with her, I stepped down with one foot onto the ground. Using mana burst for less than a heartbeat I pushed off the ground and rocketed after her once again. The ground was unable to handle such forces it soon exploded like a meteor had hit it seconds after I launched myself, appearing as if I teleported above her. I was already striking down with my left fist. She had once again displayed her authority for battle though, as she was already blocking with a freshly repaired shield. While my strike wasn't augmented by a mana burst, it was by a perfect reinforcement. Not nearly as strong as mana burst, but you cannot call it a weak effect either. As my fist connected with the shield, I could visually see it ripple outwards from the impact point. I had punched her with enough force to shatter my old earth's moon, though. The force of the attack was pretty evident given the massive crater her body had just created. With a casual wave of my hand I created a light breeze to clear all the dust away. I wasn't even halfway done with the gesture however before I had to bring up my sword to guard against another attack, this time the tip of a spear. An excited smile bloomed on my face as I saw Athena, the goddess of battle and wisdom still in a condition to fight me. While she has some golden glowing blood leaking down her face lightly, and some along her arms, she was more or less fine after regenerating. The dent I had left on her breastplate was also already gone. Her armor and armaments proving those of divine make are not so easily destroyed. I could feel my smile twist slightly as my battle lust started to leak out in my voice, Athena. It's so good to meet a deity who can take a hit. Now show me if you can give as well as you can take. Her eyes narrowed in disdain while it rang true in her voice. TCH, a battle nut. Just what I needed. Who, or what are you? As our weapons continued to push against each other I answered, 
My name is Artoria Alter. While I don't know the full extent of your strength, I do acknowledge it. Feel honored to be slain by one such as myself. Now fight with your all, because so much depends on it. Using my strength I shoved her weapon tip upwards into the air while bringing my empty left hand up as if to strike downwards with a sword slash. The confusion in her eyes lasted not even a second before they widened in realization. Both of our weapons disappeared from our hands, hers in a brilliant flash of gold while mine burst into red-black flames. My sword was reforming in my left hand just as fast as it was leaving my right. Athena had seen through this little trick however, as her shield was already being brought up to protect her as her spear was breaking apart into golden motes. A massive clash with an equally loud sound rang out as our two weapons met. However, much to my surprise she didn't move a centimeter this time. As I raised my eyebrow in interest I heard a male voice speak out from behind Athena. I take back what I said, Athena, you were indeed right to stay out of our game, removing my weapon from her shield. I floated back a bit to give them some space, I was curious who had shown up, but I had a strong inkling to their identity already. Athena lowered her shield into the ready stance as she kept both her eyes and reforming weapon trained on me and said, Ares, I am surprised you are here, said Deity stepped from behind Athena and said, Yeah, well, I couldn't very well miss this, now could I? Sure, the fighting down with the mortals was fun, but someone strong enough to attack our heaven? Honestly, as soon as I saw that beast in the sky, I knew I made the right choice coming back. Even if I am stuck here for a 1000 years before I can go back down, this fight will be worth it. Giving him a once over he has shining golden hair like a lion's mane and red eyes, along with masculine and robust features that draw close to those of a deity of beauty would have. If I had to guess, I'd say he was 190 centimeters tall which means he towers over me, even in my full released state. I'd be lying if I said that didn't spark a bit of jealousy from me. While hiding my silly jealousy I gave him a smirk and said, Welcome to the party, Ares. How nice of you to help Athena here so she could be spared another dirt bath. His shiny red armor almost seemed to glisten in the light as he gave a large cocky smile back and said, Thanks for having me, intruder. Judging by the absurdity in the sky, and the force of that last attack you should be fun to play with appearing as if teleporting with my right fist raised to crush his face. I yelled out, hey, phrasing. Hi's face split into a wild smile as his eyes widened by the sudden attack. He managed to raise his arms into an X pattern just as my fist connected. My fist had caused a loud crack as it broke the sound barrier before it connected, only for Ares to shoot off with an equally loud crack as his body did the same. I sadly had no time to chase after him though as I had to parry a spear thrust from Athena. Directing her spear to the sky again, I punched out with my right fist to meet the shield bash she was countering with. And while her shield rippled again, she didn't move a centimeter but instead glowed a very light red. Raising an eyebrow at that as I leaned back to dodge an arrow from the huntress I legitimately forgot about I muttered, interesting. While I battered another arrow away without paying any real attention to it I thought, I feel the authority of war from her now. I guess Ares is sharing a little. Interesting. This is interesting. My face cracked with a smile filled with battle lust as my power raged out of me as I was no longer able to hold back my excitement. Athena's eyes widened slightly in surprise as she muttered, what in there? I didn't give her time to finish that train of thought as I practically blinked next to her, swinging down my sword aimed at her neck. My power had not expanded in any way. I was just unable to suppress or hide it anymore, though you wouldn't be able to tell other than feeling it because there was nothing left around us but a massive crater Athena had made when I smacked her into the ground. Before my attack could connect with Athena's shield once again, I had to cancel it and guard against an incoming javelin. As I cut it into two Ares appeared, with an honestly comically large two-handed sword, mid-downward swing. He had a smile that matched my own as he yelled, yes. Our battle will be legendary. Bringing up my sword to block, I let the power of Null flow through it again as I cut his massive blade in two, moving at faster than light again. 
I kicked the top half I had cut off towards Athena. Naturally a loud crack rang out as the sound barrier was once again obliterated. While I was able to see surprise in Ares's eyes from my speed, he was otherwise unperturbed. He followed through with the motion from his attack to try and deliver a devastating axe kick. As I was adjusting my posture to meet his axe kick with a kick of my own, I couldn't help but think, it's like I have the speed force so long as I don't run. Why can't I sustain this type of speed while running and stuff baffles the shit out of me? Another loud kinetic explosion rang out as our legs clashed with each other. And while he wasn't glowing a soft red like Athena is, I can tell he's channeling his authority of war into himself to augment his body. As we backed away from each other, I noticed Artemis was no longer within my range to sense her. Taking a quick glance up at the super planet sized meteor above, I noted they only had around 10 minutes before its gravity well would be near enough to conflict with this dimensions. Assuming they even let their gravity be upset by outside forces, that is, I have no idea how they set up the rules for their dimension after all. Athena, who had rejoined Ares and was in a ready posture again, noticed my glance and said, Worried about your suicide spell? I could only look at her like she had grown a second head and scoff as I said, suicide spell? Frigid of Westium you sure are clueless? No, I am worried it'll end you all and thus my fun, too soon. Had I known Ares was willing to bless his allies with his authority over water strength and you lot, I wouldn't have set up such a time limit. I was absolutely positive my face was all kinds of twisted with battle lust by this point. If Athena's disturbed looking frown was any indication, I opened my arms wide as my voice quivered with excitement as I yelled out. If I had known you ants could team up like this, no not if, but rather, were willing to, I would have just tortured Artemis instead to pass the time while you all started to trickle in. I was going to continue my onslaught when the pendant Deerwin had given me to guard me against time magics glowed a bright pink for a second before dimming down. Glancing down at the now dimming fox I thought, huh, someone tried to displace me with time or something? I then heard a very annoyed TCH and a sigh as a woman shimmered into existence next to Ares and Athena. She had on a nice night sky blue one piece dress that had white and gold cogs running up the right hand side. Behind her head was the face of a timepiece that was calmly ticking away. Her sky blue eyes were narrowed at me in anger as she crossed her gloved arms over her rather ample chest. With a snicker Ares asked, What's got your panties all in a pre-wrapped bunch, crony? It took everything I had to not laugh when I realized that this was indeed a gender-bent and slightly renamed Cronos. Honestly, her brown hair that seemed to sway in time with the soft ticking of her halo was interesting. She was also so beautiful that if she said she had a minor authority in beauty I believe it. With a huff that sounded more annoyed than angry she complained, I don't know what it is, but something is blocking my authority of time completely when it has anything to do with this. Woman, neither her nor her big fucking rock in the sky can be altered in any way along the timeline. Athena nodded her head and used her spear to point at my chest while saying, you tried using your power a few moments ago, correct? She must have a nightem on her, because there was a glow emanating from her collar a few seconds ago. If we can get it and br. My mood immediately soured and I flooded the area with my bloodlust while aiming some killing intent at the three of them. As the area around us became dyed red and space started to bend and twist like a heat wave. They all flinched back. I raised my sword slightly to point it at Athena and with my voice laced with pure hate I said, I would sooner erase your everything before I let you break let alone touch something my sweet, sweet sister Deerwin has given me. I raised my sword into a two hand ready stance as I continued, I had warned Artemis of this, but you seem to have needed it too. You have ruined my mood by saying something unnecessary. Playtime is over. I am no longer interested. My body erupted into red-black flames, with some purple mixed in as I used mana burst. My sudden explosion in power caused the three of them to step back unconsciously, while even more fire and red light covered my sword as I prepped to burst her. I swung downwards at the three deities as my voice echoed out with anger. Die. 101. 
Chapter 56, A Small But Important Revelation Tilda My field of view was completely filled with nothing but dust and lightning arcs of my power flowing around in the cloud before me, relaxing my stance and lowering my sword to the right of myself. I waited for them to attack. I don't need my eyes to sense their strong souls after all, and I didn't have to wait long. Two yells rang out from the smoke as both Athena and Ares burst forth at different angles of attack. Athena was coming from directly in front of me with a spear glowing red in a thrust attack, while her right hand was holding the spear in a strong grip. Interestingly enough her owl was perched on top of her shield glowing gold, that was in her left hand. With a bit of interest I thought, the owl's back huh, where did it fuck off to I wonder? And why now? While I was thinking about the odd glowing owl, Ares was coming out of the debris cloud from above me. Like Athena, he too was yelling at the top of his lungs while bringing down another large two-handed sword at me. I made the mental note that everything about him was now glowing red, indicating he was heavily using his authority to augment himself and his attacks now. Both of them had some horrible burns across their bodies that were visibly healing, even now. But while it was visible, it was still a great deal slower than how fast they would normally heal. Another interesting thing was both of their blood was golden and glowing. I made no effort to defend myself, as while their attacks were indeed incredibly strong, they still fell short of being able to break my aura. As Ares's sword landed directly in the middle of my head, and Athena's spear struck over my heart, I flared up my aura in my defense. I was soon covered by my immense bloodlust powered aura as it pushed back their weapons with ease as it rippled a deep crimson red. Their eyes widened as they both yelled in confusion, what? Before they could react to my movement, I firmly grabbed Athena's spear with my left hand and lifted it. While she couldn't react to my speed, she still had an excellent grip on her weapon. So she was lifted along with the spear, which I used as a makeshift flizzwater to bat Ares out of the sky and both of them into the ground behind me. As I was raising my sword to stab into the two to make a deity shish kebab, they suddenly both glowed a sky purple. As my sword was coming down, they suddenly blurred out of the mini crater and appeared next to a perfectly fine crony. Ares rolled his shoulder as he said, well, that was a surprise, thank you. Crony, Athena was already back in her ready stance in front of Crony as she said, Yes, thank you Crony, but we need a plan, to have such bloodlust that she can actively use it in combat is frankly ludicrous. Is there any more you can do, Crony? With an annoyed sigh Crony said, No, I cannot affect her with my time authority at all. Even her attacks are immune. Worse yet. When I leave this time stream I cannot find one where she is in the past, and I cannot go to the future past eight minutes to ask ourselves how we dealt with her. Athena's eyes narrowed as she observed me as she said, explain please. Though, I fear that I know why. Crony pointed up at my meteor as she said, because of that fucking massive rock falling at us. As it stands, whatever Zeus is going to do about it fails. We have no future beyond eight minutes. I was calmly waiting for them to talk for a few reasons, one being I was in no hurry to destroy them, and second because I was interested how time interacted with me. While Deerwind's necklace does what she intended to prevent time magic, or in this case the authority, from affecting me it shouldn't prevent me from appearing in the past to a time traveler, which means I am currently a singular existence and can only be found where I currently was in a time stream. I was honestly getting a bit of a headache thinking about it, time is such a painful thing to deal with, but regardless, I need to give Deerwin extra snuggles for the necklace. While I didn't doubt it would work, I am surprised it's strong enough to prevent someone's authority over time from working. Granted, they are merely deities, and not actual gods, so it makes sense I guess. Their small conversation was soon interrupted however by a massive thunder crack and an absolutely titanic-sized rainbow-colored lightning bolt heading up to the sky. 
as the absurd lightning struck my meteor, it started to tunnel into it. Even from here I could tell that the lightning bolt had several extra authorities in it, enhancing it. Several seconds later the hole it had dug started to release a blinding light and rainbow cracks started to appear all over the meteor. Moments later, the meteor had exploded as it separated into various sized chunks and left a massive dust cloud. Those chunks started to rain randomly down onto their heaven out of the dust cloud immediately after. Ares let out a smug laugh as he turned to me and said, What now, woman? Soon you'll be flooded by there. Why are you smiling? I just started to laugh soon after as Crony said, Zeus failed. As I continued to laugh Athena turned to Crony and asked, What do you mean? Clearly the threat is gone now? It's nothing but chunks that are much easier to deal with. Crony just sighed as she pointed back up at the sky, and as the two deities looked back up, their faces soon paled. I could only laugh even harder as they finally realized how fucked they all were, because not long after another meteor had pushed through the dust cloud left behind from the first one's use destroyed. But the worst part? This one was even bigger. Ares's arms fell to his side as he stuttered. B but how? Crony looked crestfallen as she said, the first one was already so massive that we couldn't see nor sense anything behind it. As my laughing died down a bit I said, you all still do not notice it, do you? As they all turned to me in confusion I once again laughed hard in their faces. As I calmed down a cruel smile was on my face when I said, it took everything Zeus had along with several gods help if that rainbow color was any indication, to destroy that first meteor, and yet, I am here fighting the three of you just fine. Crony was the first one to clue in as she gasped in horror while taking a few steps back. You, you're still fine. She's still fine. Her mana is raging around her this very second in an absolutely absurd amount. Even after summoning two of those things, Athena let out an audible gulp as the blood drained even further from her face. Not even Ares was smiling anymore as he kept looking between myself and my meteor. Crony took another step back in fear as she whimpered, We. We need to flee. That can't be stopped. Heaven is doomed. I need to tell Zeus we need to descend to the mortal world in earnest, as she shimmered and disappeared. Ares reached out to her and yelled, wait, crony, damn it, fuck, Athena this is a lost fight, crony is right, even if we manage to defeat her, we die, we nay, I interrupted him as I practically teleported next to him with a kick to his chest, he managed to bring up his arms just in time to cushion the blow as much as he could before he left with a loud crack, as I parried a spear thrust from Athena she said, you have no intention of letting me go like the other two, do you? My cruel smile never left my face as I said, no, no I do not. I have use for the other deities. But you, you've pissed me off. And I am not in so much of a need to not act on it. Athena tightened her grip on her spear as I continued, you deities are more like holy spirits than actual gods. In fact you all may claim you have authorities, but in reality even your strongest connections are less than a low god's weakest. I'll be using your world as a training ground of sorts I think. And while you deities will not lose much if any power as you descend to the moral plane, you're bound to that planet. Should it be destroyed, you all go with it. I dismissed my visor so she could look directly into my golden glowing eyes as I finished, and unlike you all. I can bring back my servants should they fall. So I am not worried about you destroying the planet in some petty attempt at vengeance or vaunted justice. I looked towards where I had kicked Ares and could only smile slyly as I felt he had retreated beyond the range of my senses. Turning back to Athena, I raised my sword into the ready stance. My cruel smile returned as I asked, ready to die? I noticed her owl was circling above us as she shuffled a little bit when saying, no, and I will resist with everything I have. With a slight chuckle I said, oh, please do. I will enjoy breaking you before I leave you dead at my feet. With that said I charged at her with a downward swing of my sword as it hummed with the power of Null. She clearly felt something was off as instead of trying to block with her shield she dodged backwards. Thrusting my left hand out as a follow-up I said, winds of nihilism. 
black-tinted winds rushed from my hand towards Athena who was wide-eyed from an unknown magic attack. She wasted no time and brought up her shield. While a golden dome of power appeared around her, the wind howled something horrible as it crashed into her golden bubble and made terrible screeching sounds upon contact. It almost sounded like millions of souls were crying out in rage as the wind bombarded her bubble, slowly pushing her back. Even over the sound of the wind and her shield I was able to hear her screaming in effort to keep it all at bay. Her shield was starting to slowly flicker every now and then while a few tiny holes opened. Though they were closed nearly instantly after, some of the wind did manage to get through, and impact her actual shield. The areas the wind had touched became warped with black rust-like stains that were resisting the ability of her divine weapon to repair itself. I slowly floated towards her as I started to amp up the mana I poured into the spell. As I got closer, the wind got stronger and more terrible in its force. It wasn't long before her defenses were overwhelmed and her golden bubble shattered. I stopped my spell at the same time however and charged as she was still behind her shield when I arrived in front of it. I dropped kicked it with all my power. The shield that was struggling to heal itself from the damage caused by the wind shattered as I felt the force of the kick also shatter her arm. With a wonderfully sickening crunch sound Athena had shot off into the distance. As I was writing myself Hestia's voice sounded out in my head, My goddess, I have fully merged with my true body with no complications. Hefer Estus and I encountered no problems or opponents as well. It seems everyone was too busy with your impressive display of magic. Raising my eyebrow slightly I asked, Was? With a small giggle she answered, Indeed. After they destroyed the first meteor, and saw the second one Zeus ordered everyone to descend to the mortal plane. He also ordered the others to bring the true bodies of every god that was still down there as well. I hummed with glee as I responded, wonderful, that should create an even bigger and better war down there. I want the two of you to go and reinforce Bell and Lily. I am still toying with Athena, but I'll wrap up soon. I could practically feel her bow as she said, by your will. My goddess, shaking my head slightly I mumble to myself, still feels weird, gripping my sword and with a sigh I said, well, time to end this little game then. As I was preparing to rush to Athena to finish her off, I heard a very unexpected voice in my head. Hey sis, so, Tierwin actually let me watch your little scuffle there, totally badass by the way, and I actually have an idea of what to do with Athena, if you don't mind? I lowered my blade and relaxed my stance as I said in surprise, Neo, sure. I don't mind listening at the very least. What's this idea you have? With a slightly dark chuckle Neo said, well, you see. 99. Chapter 57 The Last Light Scout's Location Neo explained that having Athena as one of Deowin's Valkyries would be a huge boon. As a deity of battle and wisdom she'd make for an excellent general or any other leader type of position. I nodded my head and said, I agree, I'll rough her up a bit before I send her over. Thank you for the idea, Neo. With a hum Neo replied, no worries Tilda, Tierwin is my sister now as well. And she needs to be protected. Why not create one of the strongest armies in the true Omniverse to defend her? I launched myself after Athena with a smile as I said, damn right, I'll talk to you later, Neo. As I was approaching Athena. I couldn't help but notice that she was still pulling herself together after my last attack. Another thing I noted was that her healing was slowing down a great deal. With a small frown I thought, that can't be all a deity can do, right? We were still playing in my eyes. Shit, that fake her skill game Esh put up way more of a fight for fuck's sakes. Granted, she used a lot of spells that debuffed me heavily, but still, appearing in front of Athena. I was already throwing a crushing punch towards her solar plexus. Athena was not only healing slower, she was also reacting slower as well, as she only managed to widen her eyes as my fist connected. There was a violent discharge of wind as the force of my blow lifted her off her feet, and she coughed up golden blood. Tossing my sword in the air, I grabbed her by the head with my right hand and slammed her down hard. 
The ground exploded from the force of the impact as dust and debris were thrown into the air. With a wave of my hand, I cleared the dust cloud away and looked down at the pitiful form of Athena. She was groaning in pain while golden blood leaked from multiple areas of her head. I shook my head in disappointment as I caught my sword and sheathed it, looking at her with disgust. I used my foot to flip her onto her back. I didn't bother to hide the disappointment or disgust in my voice as I asked, Is this truly all the fury and might you can bring to bear? Athena, we only played for several minutes, and yet you seem spent. Shaking my head, I look up at the super planet come meteor and judge that it'll land within a few minutes by now. Having my attention drawn back to the wreck by my feet by her gurgles I noticed that she isn't even healing anymore. Athena coughed out some more golden blood mixed with spittle and said, Divinity. Drained. Only goddess left. Heaven Ababan abandoned. I raise an eyebrow and say, Oh, so that means you moved your power base down to the mortal plane then? But, why should that affect your power or abilities? I look at her as she just glared at me before I shrug my shoulders. I was fine with her not revealing anything, as I was just curious. Reaching down and grabbing her by the neck I say, Well, no matter. My sister has plans for you, so congratulations. Her glare intensified as she said, I refuse you and your plans. Kill me. With a cruel grin I bring her close to my face as I say, Nah, I don't think I will. Don't worry, you'll love your new job. As she started to weakly struggle, one of Deerwind's portals opened beside me. As I take one last look at the doomsday spell above me, I smirk. Then, without further to do, I went through the portal with a rather unhappy looking Athena. No sooner than when I stepped out of the portal, did I hear a cheer from Tierwin, sister. Tossing Athena down like the garbage she turned out to be, I quickly dismissed my armor as I caught the pink bullet. As I snuggled against Tierwin's cheek I cooed, Tierwin tilde. With a giggle she hugged me and said, Welcome back, I've got good news. I found the last reincarnator. I picked up the groaning Athena with some mental magic and hid her float behind me as I made my way to a pool of abyss water. Ignoring the soft but heated swearing behind me I asked Tierwin, Oh, did you now? I adjusted my arms so Tierwin could sit comfortably on them as she said, Yes, the Harry Potter movies. It took me forever to find the little bitch. My eyes widened at her little outburst before I started laughing. Ha ha ha. Little bitch is it? Tierwin nodded her head and said, Yes, little bitch. Neo said I should use more colorful vocabulary when dealing with the fuckers that don't know to leave you very well enough alone. I let out another boisterous laugh while nodding my head. After calming down a little I said, Yes. Yes, anything that comes after you deserves your contempt, Tierwin. Nothing that wants to hurt you deserves any modicum of respect in my opinion. Tierwin nodded her head as she said, that is exactly what Neo said. With a smile, I poke her cheek lightly as I say, well, Neo knows what's up. I am glad she and Raven became my sisters. I wonder what this Mahan is like that was briefly mentioned though. Tierwin threw her hands in the air as she excitedly said, Oh, oh, I know her. She's in a neutral god's area currently, but she is super fun looking, said neutral god is very nice too. I wouldn't mind hanging out with her one day, as we near the abyss pool. Or well, more like a lake that surrounded the freshly planted scent tree I say, sure. But, if you want to go there without a proxy, I will go with you. Even if that god seems nice. I will not trust anyone until I meet them personally. I reached behind me and grabbed the fallen deity, who was still swearing up a storm and trying to curse me, by the front of her dress. I then toss her towards the waters unceremoniously and disable the magic that was causing her to float. As she plunged into the waters Deowin cheered and said, Get dunked on. She'll be much nicer once she is done transforming. Then she gets to transform some more when Neo is done with her tilde. Fun times ahead for my new captain. I shook my head and giggled with mirth at her antics before asking, So, you said the last scout was in the Harry Potter universe? I think I'll enjoy my time there. I've always wanted to learn the most overpowered curse, the Cruciatus Curse, Crucio. Much to my disappointment Deowin jumped down from my arms and then said, 
it is a very powerful curse indeed, which is surprising given how generally low level that universe is in terms of magic, it'll be even better in your hands though. Raising an eyebrow I ask, oh, how come? Tierwin beamed a smile at me and said, because you don't need a wand, merely saying it and pointing at your target will be enough, though. Eventually you'll get to the point where you can cast all your magic with nothing but a thought, instead of just some of it. Suddenly thinking of a problem however, I couldn't help but frown and cross my arms as I voiced my worry, but, who can teach me? I doubt anything in that universe can see me now besides death. Tierwin giggled and gave me a few head pats with a tail of hers as she said, silly. Artoria, ever since you officially became a daughter of Big Sister Lily, she lifted a few downsides on you. And even if that was not the case, you can rip the information out of someone's mind. Widening my eyes in shock I asked, Mother did? Really? Also, at the risk of changing the subject, why do you call her Big Sister even though she's our mother? With a smile Tierwin said, simple, she likes being called Big Sister by me more than anything else and I like seeing her happy, so if calling her my big sister does that, then that is what I will call her, it doesn't change how much we love each other after all, with a smile, I give Tierwin a head pat while saying, very true, now, what has mother changed about some of the downsides on me, Tierwin flashed another heart melting smile at me before she popped away and appeared behind my head on my shoulders, feeling her lean on top of my head she said, well, the only real major thing she changed was the fact that you could only be seen by souls that were near you in strength. I felt her starting to play with my hair as she continued. She lifted the downside so that you could appear to anyone with any soul strength as long as you trained it, but the pressure your soul gives off will still extinguish anything that is too weak to stand up to it if you don't focus on changing its aura with that skill I gave you. As I hummed she added, but you'll always be invisible to anything without a soul. That's just the nature of your existence. So sadly for you, you'll always smash through automatic doors tilde. I couldn't help but blush a little and cough as I said, you. Saw that did you? With a giggle Tierwin said, yup, big sister Lilith showed me a little bit of your adventures after we first met. Gently shaking my head. I just chuckle a little. Our attention was then pulled to the waters as Athena was finally fully converted and I made her way out of them. As she pulled herself to shore and was coughing out any of the remaining water from her lungs I asked, How do you feel, Athena? She spent a few more seconds coughing out water before shaking her head lightly. After resting for a split second, she got up to one knee and bowed deeply. I felt Theowin lean comfortably on my head as she said, Raise your head, answer my sister. Athena nodded her head, and raised it. She gazed at the both of us for a few seconds before answering. I feel great, my goddess. I've never felt so free, as with my power. I could never know how liberating it would feel to not have my power or life tied to a realm sustained by the faith of worshippers. I nodded my head while I looked her over. I was going to make note of her new appearance. But since Tierwin said she'd change once again after Neo was done with her, I didn't bother. With another audible pop sound, Tierwin appeared near the kneeling Athena and said, Well, let's go. I am eager to add you to my Valkyries. Tierwin snapped her fingers and Athena vanished, sent to the lair that Neo has been developing. She then turned to me and said, I'll send you to the Harry Potter universe now. You'll need to train to let others see you but it should be easy. Honestly, with how powerful your soul is, most would start to feel you around them anyway at this point. Like something was wrong, or out of place but they couldn't say what. She snapped her fingers again, causing another portal to appear. I crouched down and gave her a big hug while stealing some snuggles. She giggled and returned the hug in full force by using her tails. After we broke away she said, have fun, sister, when you get back. Big Sister Lilith said she has something she'd like you to do. By what little she told me, it'll be fun. With a light chuckle I nod my head and say, Alrighty, I'll look forward to it. If you need me for anything, just call me Tierwin. Giving me a nod as I walked through she said, you bet. Stepping out of the portal, I looked around and took in the area. It seems I was standing on top of some building in a little village. 
As I kept looking around, I noticed a giant castle off into the distance that was behind me. Nodding my head in appreciation at its beauty I thought, well, safe bet that is Hogwarts. Wonder what time I am in. A, eh, no time like the present I guess. I got a spell to learn. Lifting off I started to fly towards Hogwarts and had the curious idea. I wonder if the room of requirements could help me train a bit in letting things see me. I think I'll stop there first if I can find it and try that out actually. 98. Chapter 58. A Surprise Visit. As I was nearing the mighty and quite frankly beautiful castle Hogwarts, I saw a shimmer of magic around the entire thing. Slowing down and coming to a stop, I floated there as I examined what I assumed was a barrier of sorts. With a hum and crossing my arms over my chest I thought, this must be one of the famous wards Hogwarts has. Let's see. I spent a few moments trying to examine the barrier and was quickly able to tell this was merely a barrier that would set off a sort of alarm to whomever was connected to it. I was surprised by how advanced this barrier was however, as it would scan your soul to divine your intentions, and if it was found that you meant harm to anyone inside, it would trigger and alert those connected to it. With another hum I thought, most impressive considering how low level this universe is for magic. Even now, I can barely feel any mana in the air. Well, compared to other universes with magic in them anyway. Tilting my head side to side I mumbled, do I go in all stealthy, or just say fuck it and crash the party? Taking a look around though, I noticed a few things now that I actually paid some attention. There was a tension in the air, and my authority of war also felt like it was humming in anticipation. With a shrug of my shoulders I said to myself, Hey, fuck it. I'll go stealthy this time. Maybe I can find the perfect moment to fuck with people and cause some havoc. I suddenly heard soft pop sounds on both sides of my head and felt a bit of weight on my shoulders, and then a voice I was not expecting to hear came from my right and said, Good idea. Let's cause some chaos and have some fun. Another familiar voice from my left chimed in with, Yes, let's see how you do things, sis. Blinking my eyes several times in disbelief, I snapped out of it quickly and gently used magic to hover the two little ones off my shoulders to have them float in front of me. As soon as I saw and confirmed who and what was now floating in front of me I squealed in happiness, Tia Wintilda and Neo. Oh my Lilith you are both adorable. I dismissed my armor and pulled both of them into a soft but tight embrace. I couldn't help but giggle as I hugged the two plush sized kitsunes. They were so cute, and tiny. I know I've seen Tia win like this before but I was quite filled with rage before and couldn't appreciate what I was seeing at the time. Neo started laughing while Tia Wynne was giggling and returning the hug. I floated there in the air hugging them for several minutes before I was finally able to get over the sudden appearance of them both. With a tinge of regret however, I still managed to stop cuddling their small and fluffy forms and let them go. As they floated back a bit I asked, How are you two here? Tierwin beamed a proud smile at Neo as she glomped onto her head and said, Neo here, one of her major authorities is magic. She is projecting herself like I do, and brought me along. Isn't that awesome? Because she is projecting herself along with me with her authority. We didn't need big sister Lilith to bend any divine laws for us. Granted we can't do as much, or anything really, as I can normally when I am with her. But it's still an amazing achievement for such a new goddess. I smiled at her energy and with a nod I said, It is. I see you are coming into your new existence quite well, Neo. Are you two going to stick around some and watch on my shoulders? Or was this just a test of sorts? Neo returned my smile and did a silly little bow and then said, We'd like to watch if possible, sis. Not much is going on at the moment since everyone else is asleep. With a nod of my head I motioned them to take up their spots on my shoulders. Though I would be completely lying if I said it was easy to concentrate on what I was here to do with dear Win nearby. But I pushed through my desire to cuddle her as I knew she wanted to watch me right now, and enjoy our time together like that. So, I let gravity claim me again and fell to the ground. I was a good distance in the air though, 
so both of my passengers laughed at the sudden drop and thoroughly enjoyed the free fall. However instead of crashing onto the ground, I slipped into my shadow, nearly instantly after the three of us emerged from the shadow of a pillar in the main hall of Hogwarts. While it was mostly empty, we were able to see a few students from each of the houses on the large tables, almost as if agreed beforehand. The three of us looked up at once and enjoyed the enchantment that was placed on the ceiling of the hall. I slightly nodded my head in appreciation at the view of the sky the enchantment emulated. I felt dear Win Bob a bit on my shoulder as she said in awe, Wow! That is really pretty. I could see Neo nod her head in agreement from the side of my view as she said, It really is. I think I'll steal it. As I turned my head to look at Neo in a little bit of surprise I felt dear Win stand up and lean on my head as she peered over it. With a raised eyebrow and amusement in my voice I asked, Steal it? Do you mean the idea, or the actual enchant? With a sly smile Neo looked up at dear Win and asked, both. I felt dear Wynne nod her head while she said, both. Neo smiled widely as they said at the same time, both. She then looked at me and said, both is good. I chuckled a little at the skit they just pulled and asked, well, how are you going to steal it? Are you able to use magic as a projection like this? Neo frowned for a few seconds before shrugging and said, it seems I cannot, sadly, but you can. Rolling my eyes and shaking my head I chuckle again while looking back up at the enchanted ceiling. Swaying my head back and forth gently I enjoyed dear Wynne's giggles, as she had moved to the top of my head, while I examined the full enchantment. After a few moments of the three of us looking over the enchantment Neo said, well, it looks like it's powered by the castle itself, but the enchantment is a series of runes etched into the stone. I gently nodded my head in agreement and said, that's what I noticed as well, it's like a very fancy illusion, it's got a bit of physicality to it, so it can react a tiny bit realistically to stimuli from inside, nothing fancy, but still very advanced for this world, the wizards of old were much stronger and way more creative than they are now it would seem. I felt dear Wynne playing with my hair as she said, stagnation regression and then stagnation again because of arrogance. Neo hummed slightly then said, such a waste of potential. Welp, time to steal us the sky, chicken little. Rolling my eyes again I asked, and how do I do that? Exactly. I don't think I have even a minor authority in magic. I felt a fluffy tail gently pat my head a few times then Tearwind said, it's easy. Just concentrate on the entire ceiling and spread your mana around it gently. Then wish to send whatever is coated into our dimension. Our apocalypse system will take care of the rest tilde. With a bit of surprise on my face, I simply nodded my head gently and did as Tearwin instructed. While I was able to do it gently, it was not, however, in any way subtle. The entire ceiling was now glowing a deep purple which had attracted the attention of everyone in the hall. The few students, most of which looked to be on the older side, all looked up in confusion and much to my confusion, extreme fright. It must have been visible on my face as Neo soon said, that is both an amazing and horrible display of mana control, sis. The fact that you are using that much mana and it's not crushing anything is astounding. Tilting my head and internally smiling at Deowin's giggle, I asked, what do you mean? Neo looked at me with a bit of a forced smile as she said, Sis, Artoria, you're using enough mana to power a spell to destroy a planet. I am sure everyone on this planet can feel the mana, and yet it is not applying the usual pressure this amount of mana would give off on the environment and people around it. I heard Deowin giggle again as she said, That's Artoria for you Tilda. Super fine control is not her strong suit in the slightest, but, we can't blame her for that. It's the nature of her power, it wants to be free, to rage and lash out. I then felt a soft fluffiness envelope me as Tearwin, along with her tails, hugged my head as she said, the fact that no one is feeling the pressure from that mana however, is testament to the training we've done with the skill I have given her. I am proud of you. I could feel my cheeks heat up in embarrassment at Tearwin's praise only for them to get even hotter when I heard Neo say, cute, unable to handle it anymore, 
and not wanting to have this amount of mana be sensed for long. I quickly concentrated on sending the ceiling to a dimension. More specifically, to Neo's floor behind the Starbucks she had just finished setting up. I reached back with my right hand and gave Tierwin some head pats right after as I said, Thank you Tierwin. I promptly tried to ignore Neo's little squeals of excitement and the sound of a camera taking pics. As I gave Tierwin one last head pat I thought, I don't want to come off as a tsundia after all. Ignoring all the gasps and fearful shouts of the students about the roof completely vanishing, I made my way out of the grand hall and into the hallway. I made sure to stand out of the way so the people I could feel that were starting to swarm to the hall wouldn't hit me. I closed my eyes and focused on all the souls in the castle trying to see if I could feel any light corruption. After a few moments I frowned and sighed a little then said, Well, I don't feel any light corruption in the castle. Maybe the scout is somewhere else in the world? Tierwin hopped off the top of my head back onto my shoulder, and as she was sitting down and getting comfortable she said, Most likely, if they are like all the others you've killed off so far, I can't help you at all, sorry. I simply shrugged while Neo said, not your fault, little plush Wintilda. I'll get better at this projection ability and one day we can all be little plushies around Artoria and not only watch, but kick some ass. I barked a soft laugh as I said, I can see it now. Our little family are all visiting a random world in plush form causing chaos and havoc. As I looked over at Neo, I could practically see her eyes turn into stars and sparkle as she yelled, Yes, that needs to happen. Oh Lily, that would be the funniest shit ever. I could feel Deerwin vibrate with excitement at the idea as she excitedly said, Yes yes, I could dress up as Artwin again. A large smile crossed my face as I nodded my head. Neo however seemed confused and intrigued as she asked, Artwin? With a light chuckle I said, I took Deerwin trick or treating once, and she dressed up as me, had a tiny Excalibur Morgan and everything, but in her colors. I called her Artwin and she loved it. I could see Deerwin nodding her head with a giant smile on her face out of the corner of my eye as she said, Yes, yes, I still do. I'll show you sometime soon, Neo. Neo nodded her head and said, Mmm, please do. Plush win. I imagine you'd look very cute. With the same big smile on my face I said, she was extremely cute. You're in for a treat, Neo. Neo clapped her hands together and excitedly said, I can't wait. Now, Plush win said you have a goal besides killing the light scout that's invaded. I nodded my head while I started to walk towards the strongest soul in the school I could feel and said, Yeah, I want to learn the Cruciatus Curse otherwise known as Crucio. All the spells I have are all lethal, and while people will go insane and even die from Crucio, its main feature is the pain it brings. While everything I do, pain is just a consequence and not the intent. Neo nodded her head and said, Ah, yes, good o late Crucio. Good plan. It's a great spell to have honestly. <clears throat> Maybe I should pick it up. As we turned around the corner I noticed we had made our way to the Gryffindor's bedrooms as we could see the main protagonist of this world, Harry Potter, along with his two friends Hermione Granger and Ron Weasley talking to a house elf, in front of a painting of a rather large woman. The unknown elf was pleading with Harry as he said, Please, Mr. Potter, listen. That mana we all felt was not normal, right? We need to get. He suddenly stopped talking and turned round and stared right at us, or rather me, while I kept a poker face. I couldn't help but feel great confusion as I quietly asked the two on my shoulders, I know you two can't sense it, but this can't be happening, right? No one in their right mind would ask for that, right? Neo and Deerwin both tilted their heads as they asked in sync, ask for what? The house elf seemed to pale drastically if that was even possible and took several fearful steps back as I answered, to be reincarnated as a fucking house self. 101, Chapter 59 All is not what it may seem to be. Announcement, bit of a beefy chappy for you all Tilda, couldn't find a good place to end it, so I didn't bother, while the three of us were just staring down the highly unexpected form of the reincarnator. 
he was freaking out and sweating buckets. We were brought out of our stunned silence when the little elf suddenly yelled and snapped his fingers, flee, we need to flee. I stood there for several moments just looking at the spot the little bugger had vacated until I asked, that, really happened right? Neo just started laughing her tiny little ass off as she managed to wheeze out, ha, huh? oh my lily, why in the shit would they go as a house elf? Well, then again, they have unique magic and they are basically the definition of under the radar. So, big brain play? I slumped my shoulders a tiny amount while I sighed then said, I guess the teleport has taken them out of the range I can detect him. So, I think I'll look for someone that know the spells I want. Well, off to the defense against the dark arts classroom. Best bet right now, which I have no clue where it is. Tierwin giggled then cheered. Exploration time. Neo joined in with Deerwin's excitement and started cheering as well. With a smile and a shake of my head, I turned away from the fat lady painting and started to head in a random direction. POV swap vessel, the house elf, tilde room of requirements, Hogwarts tilde. As the four of us suddenly appeared in the ROR, room of requirement, with a golden trio sprawled all over the floor, I was having a mental meltdown. It felt like the very emotion of dread and panic itself was flowing through this accursed body's veins as I held my head in thought. What the actual fuck was that? The evil that was emanating from that woman was unreal, impossible. And wasn't it fucking Sabralta? I ignored the slightly pained groans of the kids that, admittedly, I brought along solely because of the amount of duress I was under. I'm still under even. Time slowed down as I began to enter the mine palace. I have long since created with a clue Mency. Even the extravagant halls of my mine palace couldn't calm me down like they normally did as I sat on my throne and thought, she is not like the other reincarnators I had killed off some 200 years ago. No, I didn't even sense a system connected to her like I did with the other two. As I stood up from my throne, I appeared in my hall of memories moments later and started to comb through what I had about this situation. Honestly, these memories are so old, I nearly forgot I had them. With a huff I thought, just goes to show that even with a clumency, your memory can't be perfect. It's not photographic memory after all. Anyway, it's been so damn long since I've had to deal with anything that fucking cunt of a goddess is connected to, that I am rusty. Let's see. As I was flipping through the memories, I came across the one that had gotten me into this whole fucking mess. I couldn't help the frown and feelings of indignation that welled up within me as I remembered how that bitch fucked me over. Grinding my mental teeth in hate I thought, all because she was jealous that I had bigger breasts than her. All because of that, she fucking made me a male house elf. If I ever get my hands on her, taking a mental breath to calm myself down. I moved on from that memory, while it was true I was cursed because of that bitch, I also got a blessing out of it, only because she was so fucking stupid though, I smirked at the memory of my wish that she foolishly gave me, really though, who just gives someone the ability to magically generate system shop points by converting their mana at a ratio of 10 to 1, first thing I did when I noticed she fucked me over search the system shop for a way to fuck her over in return. It only took me 5 hours to convert enough magic power to points to get limited form of dimensional travel. Dismissing that memory, I couldn't help but smile as the next one was found, the one where I killed and absorbed the system of another reincarnator. While the dimensional travel skill let me do just that. It seemed I was only able to ever travel to Harry Potter universes. I remember the feeling of helplessness when I realized that, only to be freed from such feelings by a dick working for a dark god. Still smiling at the memory I thought, was worth the time getting a clumency and legilimency from the system right after I got dimensional traveling. Hey, the ten minutes each that they took, I learned so much from him and his system after all how they were upcoming champions while I was nothing but a cursed scout. Well, I bet they never expected their faith to change so drastically by meeting me. 
As I remembered that, I suddenly thought of something else and quickly acted on it. I summoned a representation of my soul a few moments later to look at how far the corruption of the light was going. I breathed a sigh of relief when I saw it had only progressed by about 1% in the last 100 years or so. Dismissing the picture of my soul and going back to rummaging around my memories I thought, another unexpected boon of taking that dark champion system and power for myself, drastically slowing down the change I am undergoing. Bitch couldn't stop at fucking me over like this, oh no, she just had to pour salt on the wounds and erase me too, slowly changing everything I am to a willing slave. After what felt like days going through my memories. I fell down onto my back in defeat. I had combed through everything I know, and tried to come up with a strategy to kill this new champion. With a huff I thought, champion. More like goddess from the mana I felt she released earlier. Will any of the unforgivables even work on something like that? I've held off on getting any of the shit marked in the system store as likely to instantly attract the attention of the ruling god, does all these years for obvious reasons, but I very much doubt I have that luxury anymore, I then heard Harry call out to me, and so with a defeated sigh I had one more thought as I left my mind palace, I really should have gotten him to free me from this self-slave shit as soon as possible, opening my eyes back in the real world, I turned to Harry and asked, yes, Mr. Potter, Harry was clearly confused, as were the other two, as he asked, what was with the sudden teleportation vessel? What spooked you so bad? With a sigh I said, the source of that mana appeared before us, Mr. Potter, and the evil she was casually giving off, made Voldemort feel like a fluffy kitten. Ron barked a small laugh as he said, there is the sarcastic vessel we've come to know and love over the years. But, why didn't we feel anything then? Or you know, see? I could only shrug my shoulders as I said, no idea, Mr. Weasley, but she is very dangerous, impossibly so, Hermione's eyebrows raised as she asked, even for a capable house self such as you, Vasil, that is, worrying, I could only shake my head in exasperation as I replied, I may be rather strong you three, but I am still an enslaved house self, that alone limits my potential very much. Harry's eyes seemed to light up a bit at my mention of slavery as he said, about that. I've been meaning to ask you, who your master is. Maybe I can trick them into giving you some clothes? I smiled at Harry for his thoughts and said, how very kind of you, Mr. Potter. My master was the old headmaster of this school, but he had, in his wisdom, set it up so that my ownership would change to you after his death. So, I've been yours for a while now. All three of them had wide eyes as Harry asked in a slight panic, why didn't you say anything Vasil? I could have freed you so much sooner. With a sad smile I said, part of the shackles that bind my kind, Mr. Potter, we cannot talk about our slavery freely unless directly asked. Harry had started to let out a few colorful curses as he sat down and took off one of his shoes. Bugger the damn house self curse. I still find it rather disgusting that the wizarding world practices such open slavery. I nodded my head as I thought, well, at least this will fully unlock my magic after all this time. 350 years of slavery, and it's about to finally end. I'd be crying tears of joy if it wasn't for that walking calamity. POV switch Artoria Tilda. Surprisingly, defense against the dark arts classroom Tilda. I gave Tierwin a pat on the head as I said, that it was a great idea Tierwin Tilda. Even if this isn't the classroom, the fact that this soul is stained by darkness should be a good indicator. They know dark magic. I felt one of Neo's tails brush against the back of my head as she started to also give Tierwin some head pats. Yes, yes, adorable and smart, MHMM. Deadly. Tierwin was all giggles as she bounced on my shoulder enjoying all the attention she was getting from the two of us. I turned my head slightly to look at Neo as I asked, so, who do you think we're walking up on? Judging by how old Harry looked, it could be, her. Neo's eyes gained a wonderfully deadly tint and gleam as she said, I hope so. She was garbage when I thought she was just fictional, but now that I know she is real, bah, off with her head. 
I leaned my head back and let out a hearty laugh as I agreed with her. With a smirk I said, even though I love the evil she spreads by her acts, I hate her as a person. An ant thinking it's a lion pisses me off, even more so when she's nothing but a slave. Catching dear when tilting her head out of the corner of my eye she asked, are you two talking about Dolores Sumbridge? With a nod at my head I answered, yes, we are dear Wintilda, what do you think of her? Tierwin let out an adorable hum, that caused both Neo and I to coo silently at, for a few seconds before she answered, I don't like her, I find my thoughts aligning with yours, sister, her actions are dark, but she herself is a joke, Neo and I both chuckled and said at the same time, and not even a funny joke, we both looked at each other for a few seconds, before we laughed again. We were still chuckling a little bit as I passed through the doorway to what I was thinking was the classroom for defense against the dark arts, and my smile instantly turned sinister after we entered the room and I saw her, Dolores Umbridge, teaching a class of youngsters. Letting out a chuckle that matched my smile I said, well, what luck we have. Time to learn some spells. As I was walking up to the teacher, Neo asked, so. How are you going to go about learning the spells? After a small hum I said, I may not have an authority in magic like you, Neo, but I do know magic, powerful magic at that, as you've seen. But, I think you'll enjoy what I am about to do. Walking right up to the woman as she was explaining how important it is to pay attention in class and learn all they can I started to reach out to her. However, before I grabbed her, dear Wynn spoke up. Wait wait, I got a great idea. I pulled my hand back as both Neo and I looked at her while I asked, Oh? Tierwin let out a mischievous giggle as she covered her mouth with a hand as she said, Make yourself visible. And then slowly walk over to her with a menacing aura. Let her practice what she preaches. He he tilled her. My eyebrows raised a bit as I turned my head to look at Neo, and noticed she had the exact same look on her face. Soon. Even a similar smile was on both of our faces as I said, brilliant, let's do that then. Neo nodded her head enthusiastically as I made my way to the back of the class again. I was about to start and try to make myself visible when it was Neo's turn to speak up with a great idea. Wait, let's add some more. Go back outside the classroom, and then drag a conjured sword to make that scary grinding sound. My eyes, as I am sure as dear winds as well lit up while I nodded my head. I quickly made my way back out of the classroom while saying, I am glad you didn't suggest using my Excalibur like that. Neo smirked as she said, a sword like that doesn't deserve to be used into what amounts to a silly prank. It deserves respect. I nodded my head as I agreed with her 100% as I closed my eyes to try and make myself visible. I effortlessly created a nondescript looking black longsword in my right hand via the trace spell. As I was focusing on what I wanted, I suddenly felt something click in my head and I just knew I had succeeded. Tierwin's little cheer and collapse also may have hinted at my success. As she was bouncing a little on my shoulder clapping her hands she said, that was fast, Artoria. Good job. R. Big Sister Lilith wanted me to remind you however that you'll always be invisible to most things without a soul. I tilted my head a tiny amount as I asked. Most? I got a sly grin on Tierwin's face as she said, spoilers. Chuckling lightly I said, fine then, keep your secrets. Now, however, before I could take even a single step, Neo said, wait, one last thing. This is the perfect time to show off a new dress I got you. Here, open a portal to our dimension, and I'll send it through. Raising an eyebrow in curiosity, I did as she asked, and seconds later, a nice little gift box with pink and purple ribbons popped out. Smiling as I reached down to it I said, cute box. As I was untying the ribbons Dearwin said, I helped Neo to wrap it. We also brainstormed the dress together. We both think you'll love it. Taking off the lid and pulling out the dress I said, Oh, thank you, you too, and you were both right. This looks amazing. With a snap of my fingers, the dress I was currently wearing and the one in my hand swapped places. Waving my hand to create a mirror out of ice, I looked over myself. I was very pleased with how I looked. Black's clearer, 
slitted pupils, abyss black with a glowing red outline corruption lines, silver white hair, I preened in glee at myself over what I saw, a quick glance at Neo was all it took for her to answer a question I had, I enchanted the dress myself, it's a divine artifact that you deserve, sis, self-cleaning, repairing, and enhancing all your stats like strength by a factor of 100, flood it with your mana, and it'll soul bind like your armor too, the accessories and makeup also auto apply whenever you equip it tilde, not wasting any time, I did as she had said and I instantly felt a permanent connection to the dress, she was right, though I had no reason to even doubt in the first place, in that the connection felt exactly like how my armor feels, a wide and satisfied smile was on my face as I spun around looking at myself, I also noticed that I looked quite a bit older, very close to how Lancer Alter looks in fact. This pleased me greatly, as I enjoyed the curves my body now had, as with my sizable bust and wondrous height. I honestly loved how my body was turning out, and how long my hair was now. If I had to guess, I am about 160 cm tall now. My dragon-like eyes were almost blinding in the golden glow with how happy I was feeling. Tierwin and Neo's claps pulled me back to reality as Tierwin said, You look great, Artoria. Very beautiful. I saw Neo nod her head in the mirror as she said, Yes, very. I knew this dress would be great on you. And the accessories and makeup are just perfect. Grey day, no X drip. As expected of me, really. I couldn't help myself as the most genuine smile appeared on my face as I gazed once again at my reflection. After I admired myself for a few more seconds, I then spoke up, thank you very much you two. I adore it with my everything. Now, let's break in this dress with a vile act against a vile person. Ha! Huh. Both Neo and Tierwin cackled in sinister delight as I started to make my way back into the classroom while dragging my fake sword on the ground. Neo was right, while this produced a very satisfying grinding sound, I couldn't do that to my Excalibur for something like this, in the middle of a fight, sure no problem. But this? No, I just couldn't do it, it may be hypocritical, but it is what it is, as I was entering the classroom I noticed that Dolores had stopped her lecture as she was yelling like a Karen about all the ungainly sounds. However, even her screams of indignation stopped when I came into full view and looked directly at her. While she was able to hide it from her class, I could see the flames of envy in her eyes as she looked me over. She narrowed her eyes as she asked, And who might you be? Can't you see I am teaching? Why have you interrupted my class? I responded by narrowing my own eyes ever so slightly while releasing the tiniest sliver of my bloodlust. The effect was nearly instantaneous as all the students froze up, while Dolores pulled her wand and pointed it at me. She glared at me with the might of a gerbil as she demanded, Name yourself. Disarm yourself as well before I take action. The tiniest smirk made it onto my lips as I ignored her, and started to slowly make my way to her. All the while I continued to drag my sword listlessly in my right hand on the ground. She let out an angry huff as she yelled. Fine then, stupefy, a little white light was released out of her wand and slammed into my chest, but much to my, and not hers, expectation it did jack shit. I didn't even feel it, if I were to be honest. Her eyebrows raised in surprise, but she quickly collected herself and tried another spell, Expelliarmus. Again, a light was released from her wand and slammed into my chest and again she was baffled that my sword was not ejected from my hand. I didn't even feel any kind of force on the weapon in my grip, as I was walking down the middle of the classroom, taking the most direct path to my target, the students had wisely cleared a way to avoid getting caught up in the situation. However, something told me that as I was getting closer and closer to Dolores she wouldn't have cared about the students' well-being. She was starting to visibly sweat and fear was coloring her voice as she yelled, What are you? Who are you? Damn it! Bombardo Maxima. There was a slight gust of wind around me, but other than that the spell itself failed to activate properly. My magic resistance was just so far beyond anything this universe could hope to produce that any wizard honestly had no hope, 
and judging by the clear fear I can now see in her eyes that my wide and sinister smile was provoking out of her, she was cluing into this fact as well. In a pitiable display and attempt to rally herself she yelled out in confused, scared anger, Avada Kedavara. The classroom of students gasped in horror as she had used one of the unforgivables. A sickly green-looking lightning bolt rushed out of her wand and crashed into me. Yet to the absolute horror of everyone in the room, my pace didn't even slow down while the smile on my face twisted to an even larger degree as I was enjoying the fear she was soaked in. All the while, the two tiny, blush-sized adorable kids soon on my shoulders were laughing and pointing at her. Neo was trying to gasp for breath as she said, Oh my lily. I think she's going to piss herself if this continues. Ha <laughs> ha. While Deowin who was equally out of breath said, too late. E w w w. Ha ha ha. And much to my disgust, she was right as I saw a wet spot slowly appear on her dress and down her legs as she crashed on her butt and started to scooch away from me. Not wanting to walk through the puddle she created, I pulled her to myself with magic and gripped her by the throat with my left hand. Naturally. She started to panic wildly and scream in horror, which caused the students to break out of their daze at the fact I ignored the killing curse. They all joined her in screaming, and started to quickly make their way out of the room. I ignored it all though, as I looked Dolores dead in the eyes and said only one word, command. The spell instantly took hold, and she went limp in my grip while the light in her eyes faded slightly. I let her go and she caught herself from falling and just stood there looking at me. I waved my hand to her little mishap and said, clean that up. Now, she lazily nodded her head, as she turned to the mess and with a wave of her wand she said in a monotone voice, Ivanesco. While I was watching the spell, I felt my minor authority of Null react ever so slightly causing me to raise an eyebrow in thought. Well, that is interesting. That spell has a minuscule connection to Null it would seem. Another spell to add to the list. After all the unsightly yellow was gone, she turned back to me and waited for a new command, which I was all too happy to give her. I want you to make a pensive with the memoirs and know how of all the spells you know. She nodded her head, and with a swish of her wand, hundreds of glass vials appeared out of thin air. She then raised her wand to her temple and slowly pulled out silvery mist-like substance and deposited it into a vial and corked it. Several minutes later I had a few hundred filled vials all floating around us with a thought. A tiny portal appeared near us to our dimension and moments later all the vials started to disappear into it. With a satisfied nod I said, great, this way you all can learn these spells too at your leisure. Now, what to do with this thing? Neo let out a sinister giggle as she said, if you don't mind, I would love to take her off your hands. And don't worry, she won't be a Valkyrie for Tierwin. I've got much darker plans for a woman like this. As the woman was disappearing into the portal Tierwin cheered, yay, more torture time. Which caused me to bark a laugh, with an amused sigh and a shake of my head I asked, Neo teaching you some interesting things, ha huh, Tierwin? As I looked over at her she beamed me a smile and said, yes, I am having a lot of fun learning all these new things. I smiled warmly at her while I raised my left hand to my shoulder and gave Plush Neo a high five as I said, good, good, now, time to look at some of the spells I want to learn before I come back to find that little light rat. I couldn't help the sadistic smile that crept up on my face as I walked through the portal while thinking about learning the Cruciatus Curse. 92. Chapter 60, A New Ally? Announcement. Warning. This chapter deals with transgender in a fantasy setting. Way, you've been warned. Stepping out of the portal back into the Harry Potter universe, I took a quick glance at my surroundings to see where we ended up, which didn't take long, as it looked very much like a bar of sorts, with some magicals drinking and being merry. As I was currently standing on the loft overlooking the rest of the bar below me, I started to make my way to the stairs with a slight smirk on my face. Neo and Deowin were still with me in their tiny forms and had clearly noticed my smirk since Neo asked, I know that smirk, eager to put to practice some of the new spells, eh? I get it, shiny new toys and all. Chuckling a little while I gave her a nod I said, 
caught me red-handed and in 4K tilde. It was a nice surprise that I could take in that thing's magical knowledge so easily and adapt it to my own form of magic. The insights I got from their magic and her understanding of it all was a wonderful boon. I felt dear wind bounce a bit as she said, to be expected from my sister. While you may not remember your past life directly, it still influences you in a positive way like that Tilda, though. I do hope you take big sister Lilith's warning to heart, Artoria. I saw Neo tilt her head cutely to the left with a finger on the side of her lips as she asked, Oh, did Mommy Lilith stop by? I missed a chance damn it. Oh well. What did she say to you, sis? As I stepped off the stairs I took one last look at all the magicals around me to see if I could see anyone I knew, but alas I didn't. So with a shrug I made my way to the large double doors that would lead outside as I answered Neo, she warned me to not learn a clumency or legilimency magic. Opening both doors and ignoring a few of the startled gasps, I made my way into the center of the street. I smiled as I was able to see Hogwarts in the distance, so I must have zoned into Hog's Midtown. As I lifted off the ground into the air Neo asked, how come, shouldn't both of those be extremely useful to you? I glanced at Neo for a second before focusing back to the front as I said, it's because of my wish I made, and the actions of Great Red from the DXD universe, he had used some magic to look into the memories of my soul to judge my character, I was pulled along and was able to see some of my past as Artoria Pendragon, was awesome by the way, I saw myself subjugate an entire world for some demon king, anyway, I paused my story as I landed on the ground and sunk into a shadow to bypass the Hogwarts barriers again, though, as I stepped out near the entrance to the school I faced myself for flying first to begin with, shaking my head and sighing, I continued, as I was saying, because of his actions, the memories of my past are starting to gently flood back into my mind instead of being locked into the soul. If I started to use a clumency it would break the dam so to speak. Essentially all of my memories from the millions of years would crush my current ego and I would fundamentally change. I would be a new entity, but would heavily lean into my personality as Artoria Pendragon instead of Artoria Alta, smiling as a few students walked past us while whispering about the disappearance of the pink toad named Dolores. I added, and I very much like the current me, so, I won't be touching a clue Mency. There was another unexpected side effect of Great Red Spell actually, while people tend to build a mind palace or forts and things to protect themselves. It seems I instinctually built something due some of the memories that leaked into me. Before I could continue though, Tierwin stood up on my shoulder and leaned on my head as she excitedly said, It's really cool, Neo. Her mind is a literal battlefield, a war zone without a beginning or end. Neo let out an impressed whistle then said, Nice Tilda, bringing nothing but fighting on the mind for battle nuts to a new level, eh? And so, what about Legilimency? A sly smile crept on my face as I started to make my way through Hogwarts in a random direction while trying to sense either that house elf, or Harry. I soon found Harry's soul signature, and it was somewhere above me, most likely in the Gryfind or Dorms. As I started to climb the ever-shifting staircase that was famous, I finally answered Neo. It's kind of funny actually, and it deals with the fact that I can't really control my power output with my mana, as well as my mana type. Neo tilted her head as she asked, hm, I can understand the output problem, might pop their heads like a melon by using too much, but I, as I was going to answer, Tierwin said, oh, oh, I'll tell her, as you know. Your authorities will affect you in a few ways beyond just letting you control said authority. At the early stages as you're getting used to your authorities, it'll color your mana. So, in Artoria's case, since her connection with the corruption authority is her strongest, her mana has taken on that aspect, turning my head to smile at Tierwin. I also gave her a few gentle head pats while I continued her explanation for her as she enjoyed the attention, and because of how I use my magic, my mana will also color the spell, meaning all my spells will subtly corrupt anything they come into contact with. This isn't normally a big deal, 
as the effect is very subtle and generally vanishes when the spell is finished being casted. Finally turning around a corner and making my way down a hallway with a painting of a rather large woman at the end of it I continued, the problem though is with how legal immensely functions. It soaks the person's brain with your mana as you pick up on their thoughts. Worse is if I were to try and dive in to get what I really want out of them. Because my mana is corruption and not my black water, it's very harmful and random in what it does. It could corrupt their memories by twisting the memory into something new that never happened for example, or, it could corrupt it like a computer, and just wipe it out. Neo nodded her head in understanding as she said, ah. I get it now, yeah, it'd be pointless to try and get memories and information if it's all randomly corrupted. With a small giggle Dear Win added, that's if they survive the amount of mana that would be poured into them tilde. The three of us laughed lightly at her quip before I came to a stop in front of the painting that protects the dorms. While I was thinking of how I wanted to get into the dorm rooms, I suddenly felt Harry's soul vanish and then reappear in another part of the castle. With a shrug of my shoulders I stepped into the shadow of the window near me, and appeared in Harry's shadow instantly. The three of us looked up out of his shadow as Harry was pacing back and forth in a hallway while muttering something. He soon stopped however as a door suddenly appeared in the wall. As Harry opened the door I was able to hear him complain that he still didn't understand why that house elf, Vassal, was able to operate into the room of requirement but no one else could. What greeted us was a rather large room filled with things you wouldn't exactly expect in a school. If it was a normal school that is, maybe this was par for the course. As Harry made his way deeper into the room, the three of us were enjoying the sights. Numerous training dummies, scorch marks abound. Several potted plants and what looked to be alchemy tables with cauldrons mixing themselves making what I assumed to be potions of some kind. Harry was clearly used to this as he ignored everything and made his way up some stairs and into another room. As Harry entered the room we heard a female voice, most likely Hermione Granger, talking, you know Vassal, even now I can't get over the fact you managed to get Mull technology to work in Hogwarts. Harry joined them on the couch they were all sitting on watching TV as the house self replied, it's a lot easier and not as exciting as you might think, Miss Granger. All I did was ask the room to be created out of Hogwarts influence. So, technically, what we've all been training and relaxing in is a pocket dimension. And while it is connected to Hogwarts, it doesn't fall under its domain for the rules. Raising an eyebrow I said, ah. So that is why I could no longer sense them when they first teleported. Sneaky. Anyway, I'll just kill this scout and go back. I am eager to unlock my fourth seal. And I want to know what mother has in store for me. Looking over to the house elf. I moved to the shadow of the couch behind him and stepped out. He must have wonderful senses as his head started to snap directly to me the second I stepped out of the shadows. Sadly for him. I was much faster and I grabbed him by the neck. As I lifted him off the couch and applied enough pressure to his throat to silence him I said in a cold voice, before you think to teleport away again you disgusting light scout, if you do I will murder the three kids here. Speaking of the golden trio, after the initial shock of seeing Vassal be lifted in the air by seemingly nothing, they wasted no time drawing their wands and raising their guards. It was pretty impressive to be honest. While they were in the later stages of the movie's timeline they are calm, collected, and ready to help their friend. However, while the house self didn't seem like he'll teleport away, he is still trying to struggle out of my grasp. As he was clawing at my hands, I noticed he was trying desperately to talk so I loosened my grip to give him the chance as I was curious what drivel would come out of his mouth, did. Did that whore of a bitch Lee GHT go DDS send you? Or are you a champion of the Dark God sent to avenge the other Dark Champion I killed? As I slightly tilted my head in confusion with a raised eyebrow, Neo spoke up, Oh wow, they have a skill called System Absorption, X. I didn't know the factions would give someone that ability, more so if they have so little corruption like he does. Before I could ask more about that skill, Deerwin said, she. Her soul is very much female. Why would she be placed in a male body? 
That's horrible. Glancing at Tierwin I asked. What do you mean, Tierwin? Tierwin had a face that looked like she was hurt, and that honestly almost made me crush the insect in my hand for that. The only thing stopping me though was it was not their fault, so I calmed myself down as Tierwin explained. Each soul has an affinity for a type of body, and to place a soul that is so very much clearly female into a male body is akin to torture. They would never feel comfortable in their body, and resist merging completely like she has. Her life would be adversely affected as the soul and body warred against each other. Tierwin's tails and ears drooped as she continued. It can get to the point where it'll either affect the soul or body. Even both sometimes is not unheard of. I've seen it happen to a few mortals where this happens naturally, and the outcome can be disastrous for the soul. It can leave a scar on the soul and will affect future reincarnations. Us gods are supposed to help such souls when we come across them, either by modifying the soul's affinity, and or healing the scar. If left alone, that scar will eventually worsen and lead to soul death, which would destroy the soul, and send it back to the seat of creation. Tierwin hopped off my shoulder and walked down my arm and sat down in front of the struggling elf as she said, for a goddess to do this intentionally to a soul is horrible. Being so close to her, I can see her fate if she was left alone till the light's corruption was complete. With a sad sigh, she continued, or, more like I should say was nearly completed. Her soul wouldn't survive, and would be destroyed. It would be an agonizing 1,500 years of torment she wouldn't and couldn't understand as to why she was suffering before her soul would break down. The light's corruption would push her to accept her new body because it came from a goddess of light, but corruption doesn't change one's affinity like that. The pressure put on the soul from the mind trying to force itself to accept its new body would only build and build until the soul literally exploded with the force of a supernova. Neo gasped beside me as she hesitantly asked, What about the boy I? Tierwin shook her head and interrupted Neo. No, she's fine. The second you sent her soul into our dimension I modified her affinity. It's extremely easy for God slash disses to do. That's why something like this is horrible. I may be a dark goddess, but even for us doing something like this is taboo and frowned upon. A god may punish a mortal by placing them in a body that clashes with their affinity for a single lifetime, but they'll heal the scar after all is said and done. With a sigh and a shake of her head she said, but for a goddess, of the light no less, to do this to a soul, they have fallen incredibly far. To think such a goddess like that is targeting me, it scares me. Tierwin then stood up on my arm and walked over to my face and gave me a tight hug with all she had. I felt Neo stand up and move over to Tierwin and join in the hug as she tried to cheer her up. Tierwin had watery eyes as she looked directly into mine as she asked, Can you save her, Sister Artoria? Instead of killing her, seeing Tierwin almost in tears nearly ripped my heart apart. I raised my free hand and gave her a few back rubs as I nodded my head. As she hugged me tighter with closed eyes and whispered thank you I said, Anything for you Tierwin. You know that, Tierwin quickly settled down, but she joined Neo on my left shoulder and was still hugging her as I turned my attention back to the elf in my hand. While he, she had a look of confusion about what was going on with me, I loosened my grip even further. Looking her dead in the eyes I asked, how would you like to get revenge on the light goddess that did this to you? How would you like to be put back into a body you actually care for? All the struggle left her as she peered into my eyes searching for falsehood or some kind of trap. After a few seconds she said, I'm listening. 98. Chapter 61. A new adventure tilde. A non-smile was on my face as I tossed down the miserable little creature out of my grasp as I said, My sisters and I will give you a new body. One that befits a soul such as yours. I'll remove that light sickness in your soul, by blotting it out with evil thus making you immune from further infection from either the light or dark. 
I ignored the golden trio as they shouted Vassal's name and rushed to her aid for an interesting little prompt that had suddenly appeared in my mind. With a curiously raised eyebrow I focused inward and read the alert from my system that I nearly forgot was there. Tilda Apocalypse System Tilda. An update to the system has been requested and approved of from sub-administrator, Neo, goddess of, dash dash, and co-administrator, Tierwin, goddess of fluff, respectively. The Apocalypse System will now absorb sub-administrator, Neo, goddess of, dash, dash s system, omniversal chat room system, and all of its subsystems, into itself. Please stand by as the Apocalypse System applies the update and reboots. I glance at Neo, and see the biggest shit-eating grin I've ever seen on her face as she was bouncing around happily on my shoulder. She was quick to sense my gaze and said, Surprised? It's a solution to your win and I have come up with to help people be busy, and as a currency for our dimension. With a slight nod of my head I motion for her to continue. Right, well, us sisters, and naturally our sexy mama Lily, can post quests for system points that residents can accept. These points will be used in the system shop naturally, but will also be used around our dimension for various goods and services that people feel like charging for. Tierwin hopped over to the same shoulder as Neo and gave her a gentle bonk on the head with her tiny hand then said, way to ruin the super serious mood I had set, sis. Neo had fake little tears well up in the corner of her eyes as she gave Tierwin a sly smile. Tierwin merely snickered at her and turned to me and said, but yes, I think it'll be a great plan. And we can use it to send out our own reincarnators on missions. And because they are all now linked to the apocalypse system, their souls are safe from any form of corruption outside of yours, Artoria. I gently shrugged my shoulders as I said, I do not mind. If this is how you want to go about things Tierwin, I fully support you and my sisters in this. Both Neo and Tierwin's fluffy ears and tails perked up and they said at the same time, thanks, sis. They then turned to each other and stared for a few seconds before both breaking out laughing. A gentle but forceful cough caught my attention, and I turned towards its source, looking up at me with an uneasy face. The house elf asked, what exactly, do you mean blotting out the light in my soul with evil? With a wicked smirk I replied, exactly that, I trust you know who I am? Her face twisted a bit into confusion, as she said, no, I mean, you look like Saba Alter, but, with an annoyed huff I said, I don't look like her, I am her, that seemed to send the little creature for a bit of a spin before she collected herself and asked, wait, really, no lies? You're not just a reincarnator like me with her body? With a little bit of heat in my voice from the annoyance that she suggested I was a fake, I answered, no. While I do have my own situation around reincarnation, I am truly Artoria Pendragon Alter. Alter being my last name, and Pendragon my middle. Enough stalling mortal. I would have your answer as I have other things to do, and entertaining you is not on that list. Nodding her head awkwardly she asked, okay, but my question before still stands, I'd like to know what this evil business is before, interrupting her by lifting my hand and causing the golden trio to float in the air away from her, a small little puddle of black water started to form under my feet before widening a few meters and moving to my right, with a simple thought I had the mortals float over to my puddle as they were screaming in confusion and fear, they were even trying to operate but because of all the knowledge I gained, stole, about their magic I finally was able to understand how magical teleportation generally worked. I was able to lock down space around me in a rather large area to prevent said teleportation now. With a smile filled with a bit more sadism than I likely intended on my face, I said, this is what I mean. I then released my hold on the teens and watched as they all plunged into the depths. I heard Deerwin and Neo clapping their hands while laughing as Deerwin said, I'll never get tired of you doing that to people, Sister Artoria. The surprise on their face as they start to sink into your waters is always hilarious. With a smirk that was filled with as much sadistic glee as my own, Neo added, I agree. This could get addicting. 
I feel I can summon your black water now that my old system has merged with yours, sis. Which I was shocked to find out you had. Being able to make any sacred gear you want is such hacks by the way Tilda. With a less evil and more mischievous look on her face she continued, I'll have to take that for a spin one day. But, I might try dunking some people in your waters one day. While my authority of balance is at odds with it a bit, my other authority of freedom sings in joy at the thought of your water. As it really does release them from the chains life normally has around people. Tierwin must have sensed my surprise about Neo being able to summon my black water because she clarified something rather quick. The key word here is summon, Sister Ratoria Tilda. She cannot create any, and only summon some via the system because she is a sub-administrator. My face gained an understanding look as I nodded my head before I turned my attention to the trio of mortals pulling themselves out of my waters. All three of them were hacking and coughing out some black water in their lungs while spewing out some colorful expletives. Taking a peek at the little elf out of the corner of my eye, I could see they had understood my demonstration and while they had fear coloring their eyes there was also determination. With a soft hum I thought to myself, good, though, I think I should ask dear Wynne if she thinks her soul is strong enough for my abyss waters. While I don't want her worship, I do however want our first real soldier to be as powerful as possible. Before I could ask though, Vasil spoke up, I'll do it, I recognize that sludge. Water. Whatever, it'll blacken me like what happened to you, right? I turned my full attention back to the little elf while nodding my head as I said, Yes, that is correct, but also wrong at the same time. My version of black water is so much more than the original all the world's evils by now. But you get the general idea. However, I have a question. She pried her eyes away from the black and golden trio, who I must say look rather dashing now with my corruption I must admit as she motioned me to continue. Looking directly into her eyes I asked, how badly do you want your revenge? How much are you willing to risk for it? For power to stand as one of my, and my sister's, generals? You may not stand by our side as an equal for some time, but we won't deny you that growth. By the way, I was pleased to see her eyes flare with hate as she obviously thought of the light goddess who did this to her and then gain a delightful amount of determination and resolve. With absolute confidence in her voice she said, everything. My face split into a warped smile as I asked, even your very existence? Everything that would make you? You? Would you risk it all to try and ascend to something far beyond what you thought possible? She gave me a hard nod, which honestly looked absolutely fucking hilarious coming from a damn house elf. As she said, my answer is unchanged. My eyes lit up in glee as I said, perfect, I will send you to my sister, Tierwin. You will treat her with respect, or I will personally erase your soul from existence after torturing you for an eternity and then some. Understood? With a nervous scalp and a nod of her head she answered, yes. I relaxed my posture and withdrew the minuscule amount of killing intent I was directing at her as I opened a portal for her to enter. I gave a look to both Deowin and Neo, and they simply nodded their heads before they both vanished with a small pop. As the soon-to-be former house elf entered the portal, I turned my attention back to the only ones left in the room besides me, the Golden Trio. They've been inspecting their new forms and I was able to hear them comment on the changes they felt while I was busy with Vasil. Harry was still looking at his hands as if they were the most interesting thing in the world as he was saying, I feel so. Different. Yet the same. I feel so free. Unburdened by all the pressure I've been feeling lately. I feel bloody fantastic. While the three of them were talking animatedly between each other, I noticed something interesting about Harry. While he still had his scar on his forehead, the soul of he who is missing a nose is gone. I turned to look at the puddle of black water as I was curious if somehow Voldy was removed because of it. And sure enough, there was a wretched little soul floating around in it, looking a little too comfortable, if I had to be honest. As I raised my hand to remove the soul, I noticed a powerful soul suddenly manifest above my waters. Lowering my hand, 
I looked at the newcomer with some caution and raised my guard a little. This universe's incarnation of death had manifested above my waters and was looking down at the soul with interest. A few moments later it turned its attention to myself, and floated over, with a raspy voice that was of neither gender it said, You may relax budding goddess of corruption and war. I would never deign to hurt the sister of my goddess. I have come to you to ask for a boon. That soul you have trapped in that corruption of yours. May I have it? Lowering my guard. I simply nodded before I raised my hand and summoned back all my waters. As it all merged with me. It left behind the wretched little soul that started to whimper. Death looked down on him and with its voice filled with interest said, Fascinating. Your corruption has solidified this shard of his soul, into a full entity. I need not wait for the rest of the shards to start on this one. I thank you, goddess. With your leave, I will take this new one where it belongs. With a dismissive wave, I gave death a nod. It was interesting that an entity like that was being respectful to myself. I honestly don't know how well I would last against something like that now with all the changes I've undergone, and the seals lifted. As if it was waiting for that moment, I suddenly felt a massive rush of power return to me as my fourth seal was broken. I closed my eyes and basked in the feeling of the power welling up within me, while resisting the moan I really wanted to release. Sadly, my euphoria was short-lived as it was over all too soon. With a disappointed sigh, I opened my eyes and quickly noticed that the teens were all looking at me with wide eyes that were colored by fear and interest. They were all pressed against the wall shivering a little as they looked at me, which caused me to remember that those dunked into my waters form a link of sorts and thus can see me. I opened a portal to a dimension to my left and turned to go through it before stopping. Turning my head to look at the teens I said, Well, now you know what that little house self was talking to. Enjoy the changes to yourselves, and raise some hell. After all, Harry, you're no longer bound by fate. So go nuts. With a smirk at Harry's eyes widening, I walked through the portal. I instantly exited it underneath the massive tree that Raven had planted. I crank my head back as I look up at the massive thing and let out a low whistle. This thing was growing at an unprecedented rate, and the fruits that were growing on it were already giving off such a wonderful feeling. I suddenly felt a very familiar presence behind me, and a calming feeling that came with it. With a smile I turned round and said, Hello, mother. With a soft smile on her lips Lilith said, Hello, daughter Tilda. A bit of a spoiler, but you eating that fruit is a lot sooner than you may think. Now, congratulations on your fourth seal Tilda. There was another cheer as a pink bullet crashed into my chest and hugged me. Yes, Grit's sister Artoria. Embracing Tiawin and giving her some snuggles I thank them both before I sit down and rest my back on the tree. As I let Tiawin get comfortable in my lap, I look up at mother and ask, So, you said you have something special planned? She nodded her head as she sat down on a fancy chair that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Along with the chair, a little table and a tea set with cake also appeared. I shook my head at her offer of a cake, but I did ask for some tea. Tearwind did the reverse, naturally. As I took a sip of the mysterious tea that somehow tasted like the stars themselves, leaving me baffled, Mother spoke up with a smile, I am glad you like my tea, and cake. Daughters Tilda, to answer your question, Artoria. Yes I do. Some light gods are up to some shenanigans, and are trying to erase you by proxy Tilda. But... Instead of just going about it the boring way, I thought I could use this as a little opportunity for your growth. Not being able to help myself as Tearwin was all smiles as she ate her cake. I gave her a few head pats. I then nodded at mother's idea, and asked her to continue. It was nice to see such a warm smile on the ever-elusive Nell Kit soon as she gazed at Tearwin. She took a sip of her tea before she continued. They may think they're being clever, but honestly... These newer gods slash disses are so simple-minded, even I struggle to understand how they have not been killed yet Tilda. With a sigh filled with exacerbation she continued, Anyway Tilda, they are attempting to bypass my threat of having them erased for killing you outright by summoning you to a universe that they think would do such a thing. With a tilt of my head and an amused smile I asked, And what universe is it? Mother returned the smile and said, 
you'll see Tilda, this is part of my idea for your growth. Now, tell me Tilda, how do you feel like being the attacker for once, like those you've been killing? The fools are summoning you to a universe they have recently come into ownership of. Never once thinking of how Tilda, Tierwin started to giggle as she said, let me guess, you gifted it to them. Dumb bitches Tilda, mother just blinked a few times while looking at Tierwin before looking at me and asking, Neo, with a sly smile I nodded my head, to which she said, I think I'll give one of my daughters a little visit soon. Tilda, as mother licked her lips. I couldn't help but feel a shiver run down my spine as I gave a prayer to Neo. Mother then gently hummed in amusement as she said, Don't worry, I am sure she'll enjoy our meeting. She needs to be spanked for teaching my cute little kid such words Tilda. With a smirk I couldn't quite categorize. Mother then waved a hand lazily to dismiss the matter before taking another sip of her tea. Deciding it was also in my best interest to drop the matter I followed suit and took another sip. I hummed in delight at the taste, as I was sure I would never find something like this out in the true omniverse. Of that, I was sure. Mother nodded her head at me with a smile before she continued once again. As I was saying Tilda, they are going to summon you to a universe they think will either outright delete you, or at the very least violently reject your existence to the point of getting rid of you. Here is my trial for you Tilda, with every penalty I place on you, I will lift an additional seal when you are finished. My eyes widened as my eyebrows shot to the sky, threatening to leave my face. Tierwin also snapped to me with an excited expression and was bouncing in my lap. Seeing as I was fully interested in the idea, Mother said, So here are the limitations you may select Tilda. With a snap of her fingers a screen appeared in front of me with check boxes. Beside each box was a simple description of what would be sealed in return of releasing one after the whole thing was over. One box I selected without any hesitation, no foreknowledge of what universe you are going to. Before I could even ask why such an easy thing was worth a seal, Mother spoke up. I know what you're thinking, little Artoria Tilda, but that is a bigger downside than you are thinking. With zero knowledge of where you are going. You can't make any informed decisions about the other options in regards to where you lend up. You have no idea what you'll be facing Tilda. While it's true I won't let anything outright kill you as you enter, it won't be a walk in the park either if you get too greedy Tilda. With a nod of my head, I continued to look over my options. As I was browsing the long list, I asked, By the way, mother, how many can I pick? Enough to remove all my seals? She finished her sip of tea before shaking her head and answering, No Tilda, you can have up to a total of four options selected. I have two wonderful trials set up for you for seals 9 and 10 Tilda. With a hum, I went back to the list. As I was looking it over I asked Tierwin, What do you think, Tierwin? She hummed herself as she looked over the list before pointing to one and saying, This could be interesting. It could be both an easy one or a super bad one though. Looking at the option she was pointing at, I couldn't help but agree. She was pointing at, have the ritual that summons you take full effect on you. Unable to break the binding for the duration of the trial, I tilted my head back and forth for a few seconds before shrugging and clicking the checkbox. As I took a peek at mother, who was now calmly eating a piece of cake, I thought. I'd like to think mother wouldn't let something absolutely horrible happen to me via a ritual. So while it might be a pain to deal with, I don't think it'd totally cripple me. I was more or less confident mother was after her usual entertainment from this trial. And I also wanted to trust her as my actual mother. While this trial may test me, even to my limits and possibly beyond, I can't see mother doing this just to have me die a dog's death, though. I should take her warning seriously, and not get too greedy. After all, she did say she won't protect us from the consequences of our choices. Feeling more sure of my selection, I continued inspecting the list as I thought, that's two. So now when I finish this I will have six seals unlocked. Tierwin then perked up and pointed at another one while saying, oh, this one, it's more of a buff to someone like you. Sister Artoria, looking at the option, I immediately selected it without hesitation. Temporary removal of your soul pressure and ability to hide from weak souls. Note, 
does not weaken you in any way. I had to agree with dear Win again. This was a buff in my eyes. While it would let anyone fight me unhindered by my pressure, it would also let me enjoy going all out on some ants without having to worry about them just dying outright because of how weak their souls were if I got too excited and let my control over my aura falter. I also couldn't care less if people could see me, honestly. The next option under it also appealed to me, and I was quick to select it as well, unable to summon your black water in any form. Note does not seal your authority. I had a smile as I looked over my options to confirm what I had selected, no foreknowledge of what universe you are going to, have the ritual that summons you take full effect on you. Unable to break the binding for the duration of the trial, temporary removal of your soul pressure and ability to hide from weak souls. Note, does not weaken you in any way, unable to summon your black water in any form. Note, does not seal your authority. With a nod of my head, I looked up at the mother who waved her hand to summon the list before her. As she was looking over the options she nodded her head and smiled. Turning her attention to me she said, Excellent choices Tilda. Now, are you ready to go? Giving Tearwin one more snuggle and kissing her on the cheek. I gently set her down as I stood up with a nod. Tearwin walked a bit away from me before turning back and cheering. You can do it, Artoria. You're getting closer and closer to ascension like our sisters. Keep at it, and be safe. And most of all, have fun Tilda. She then conjured up some confetti before she disappeared. I couldn't help but share a chuckle with mother at her antics before I said, All right, I am ready. Let's get this show on the road. With another chuckle, mother snapped her fingers causing a large magic circle to appear underneath me. As it lit up in a wonderful purple hue, mother said, goodbye for now, my lovely daughter Tilda. And remember, while this is a trial, do keep dear Wynne's words in mind, have fun Tilda. I didn't have time to do anything other than flash her a smile before I found myself in a rather familiar cocoon, flower made of red ribbons. As they faded away into black particles I looked on at my summoner and instantly recognized who it was. I felt a very strong compulsion to speak. And suddenly I said to the woman, I ask thee, are you the weakling seeking my power? The woman before me was absolutely gobsmacked as she stared with an open mouth. As she was collecting herself I thought, well, I am glad I didn't weaken myself. Should I say it's good to be home? After all, the woman who stood before me, who was my summoner, was none other than Rin Totica. 98. Chapter 62. I have stats. POV Rintataka. Tilda seconds after summon ritual spell was casted Tilda. The moment I had finished the last verse of the ritual to summon Saba, I immediately knew something had gone wrong. Nearly all the mana in the immediate area was suddenly absorbed by the ritual circle, along with a majority of my own. Ad. And then as if to mock me for thinking something simple had gone wrong, the room I was in suddenly lost all light and warmth, with a startled yell. I was suddenly pushed away from the ritual circle and slammed into the wall. As the ritual circle started to glow an eerie purple I thought, what the hell is going on? This isn't like anything I was taught would happen. Ugh, even with a quick application of reinforcement, that knockback still hurts. As I was gathering myself up from the floor, there was yet another change to the ritual circle. A black substance of sorts started to seep out of it and flood the immediate area around the circle, and it felt extraordinarily vile, and wrong in every sense of the words. Much to my relief the black sludge didn't move past the circle, but once again as if to mock me for my simple thoughts, black ribbons with red outlines shot out of the black sludge and rapidly started to take a form. Within seconds the ribbons had created what looked like a rosebud of sorts, but what worried me was if the black sludge felt vile and wrong. The ribbons felt like pure evil. What was even worse was the waves of power I suddenly started to feel coming out of the said flower bud. With sweat trickling down my back I took a worried gulp and thought, what have I summoned? Is it some kind of eldritch monstrosity, a horror that mankind should never know? My thoughts came to an abrupt end when the flower bud suddenly bloomed. As everything started to flake away in black particles, all that was left was the most radiant woman I have ever seen in my life. It was childish, but I couldn't help myself as I glanced at her chest, 
and then at mine. Before I could even put thoughts to this childish action however, she spoke. I ask thee, are you the weakling seeking my power? It was too much. My mind ground to a halt upon hearing her talk. Her ethereal looks mixed with her voice was too much of a contrast for what I had just witnessed the ritual due before she showed up. Even the sting of being called a weakling was ignored in favor of basking in her presence. She was in a gorgeous purple dress that left nothing to the imagination, while also adorned with priceless looking jewelry and a crown, tiara. Even the pitch black lines that were tracing her body and occasionally glowing with a red, purple energy only heightened her looks and her eyes. Sharp, slitted like dragons and glowing gold were captivating me. They were beautiful beyond measure, even if I could see endless cruelty in them. As my mind finally rebooted I only had one prevalent thought. This is who I summoned, Poviatoria Alter. While she was rebooting herself, I in the meantime was internally frowning. Not even a second after I had thought that I was glad I didn't weaken myself. I was hit with a sudden realization that I spoke too soon. I was drastically weaker than what I was moments ago. But I wasn't a weakling per se. The only thing I can think of that would be responsible was the ritual. With a sigh I thought, no wonder that option was worth a seal. Do these rituals actually dictate the power of the servant though? Or was this something mother added? Or maybe it's the class I was given upon being summoned? <laughs> While I can't crack a planet with my fist anymore, I am still way stronger than any normal summon I bet. I was taken out of my thoughts by the stammering of Rin. Why yes, I. I was the one who summoned you. I am your master. I narrowed my eyes and said, I would be careful with the term master mortal. I am no slave. But fine. I will help you burn your world to ash should you desire it. She blinked at me dumbfoundedly for a second before she hissed in pain and held her left hand. I could see my command seals forming on it and it looked just like what that loser had back on Remnant. A three-tailed fox with Excalibur in its mouth. Shaking her hand lightly while softly blowing on it she asked, Why did that hurt? It's not supposed to hurt. I tactfully ignored her question and asked one of my own instead. What is your name, mortal? While I don't mind calling you that, I don't want you to get confused when there are more of you around making an annoyed face while looking at her hand for a few seconds. She then looked up at me and said, My name is Rin Tassica, and yours? I briefly considered if I wanted to tell her my name or just the class, which I honestly still had no idea what it was for some reason, she quickly said, Hold that thought, please, come with me to my room. I have an artifact I would like to use to see your parameters and abilities. With that, she turned on her heel and quickly left the room. I merely shrugged my shoulders and followed. While we were making our way to the room, I was trying to look inward to see if I could see my own class and specs. However the only thing that ever came to me was the word foreigner and nothing else. With a quiet hum I thought, foreigner, is it? Well, I am outside of this reality, and of general human comprehension now I guess. Makes sense. It didn't take us long before we made it to our destination, but before we could enter in turned around and said, please wait here. Raising my eyebrow at a barely noticeable blush I merely nodded my head. With a quick nod of hers, she opened the door and closed it right behind her. While I could hear her rummaging around in her room and complaining about the location of the book I thought, what was that about? And why the blush? Is she hitting for the same team in this timeline or something? Soon I heard Rin shout in glee as she found her elusive book, and rushed back to the hallway, opening and closing her bedroom door with such speed that honestly shocked me. She walked up to me and handed me an old leather-bound tome, accepting the book. I looked up at Rin with a bit of confusion on my face. She took the hint and said, Right, say your full true name with the intention to read about yourself while looking at the book. As your mass, she noticed my look and instantly changed what she was going to say with a cough. I mean summoner. I feel like I have the right to know about my summons. I honestly wanted to know my stats and abilities too, but I also wanted to mess with her a bit. So I just stared at her for a few seconds with narrowed eyes to let her sweat a tiny bit. I chuckled a bit with a smirk before looking down at the book and doing as instructed, Artoria Pendragon Alter. 
The book shone a brilliant rainbow before it faded away to reveal my name as the title of the book. With a hum, I opened the book and was honestly a little excited to see what was inside. But much to my surprise the pages started to flap by at an extreme speed before stopping suddenly on an entry about myself. Seeing as Rin made her way over to my side to read the book, I held it out a bit so it'd be easier for her to see it. Personal space is very much ignored by her when she gets lost in her own little world it would seem. Class, Foreigner, Master, Rin Tessica. True Name, Arturia Pendragon Altar. Alignment, Neutral Evil, Strength. X. Endurance. X. Agility. X. Mana. X. Luck. X. Noble Phantasm. X. Class Abilities. Existence outside the domain. X. Personal Abilities. Independent Manifestation. X. Sadly, before I could go further, Rin suddenly collapsed beside me and started to half mutter while giggling. X. All of her stats are X. And Pendragon. King Arthur. But. Why foreigner? I don't understand. UGH, looking down at her, I asked. You okay, more er, uh, Rin? She looked up at me with excitement in her eyes as she said, Okay, okay? I summoned the strongest servant ever. I wanted Seba, but you are so much stronger. She suddenly froze after yelling and blushed a bit before looking away. She then quickly stood up, dusted herself off, and asked, Sorry, I got too excited. Now, Please show me your abilities. Giving her a side glance as I went back to reading the book I said, Right. Looking at independent manifestation I got the feel that this was actually my heaven's feel wish in the form of a skill. It basically let me just. Be here. No need for a master to do anything at all. As I could supply myself with an infinite amount of mana. Next was magic resistance also at the X rank. Which wasn't a surprise, honestly. I was practically immune to all magic in this world. Go me. The next one was a little surprise to be sure. Tear wins love. And all it did was change my alignment from chaotic evil to neutral evil. I internally snickered at that, as it was totally true. After that it was shield of bloodlust at X. It was just my aura that Ruby unlocked for me. It was interesting as the skill said I was able to use my unending bloodlust to reduce all damage taken by up to 100% depending on the rank of the attack. Anything below A rank would be fully blocked, while anything A plus or above would go all the way down to 30% reduction at the X rank. Up next was battle continuation at the X rank, which basically let me ignore fatal wounds and keep fighting most likely a representation of how my body isn't actually a body and I am more or less immortal. I also had a lot of other combat-related abilities at the X rank. Honestly, I was horribly overpowered, but I was also so much more than some mere heroic spirit, as an entity on its way to ascension. The ritual or class may have limited my power output, but it had no effect on my skills and abilities it seems, or my clothes. As I still felt the enchantment from Neo just fine, Rin was practically vibrating with excitement and disbelief after reading through several pages worth of my abilities. I don't think I saw a single one that was not of the X rank. With a soft and amused huff I thought, three and a half million years adds up after all tilde. As Rin flipped the page that finally held a new category, my noble phantasms, she said, this is cheating, you're a total cheat. How was I able to summon you? With another amused hum I asked, who knows? Rin then read out my first noble phantasm out loud for some reason, Excalibur Morgan. X rank. Anti-existence. An ant anti existence She then promptly fainted when she read that it had no target limit as well. I chuckled softly at her expense and just turned back to the book to read the description of my beloved blade. And while the text was corrupted, I had no problem reading it myself unsurprisingly. Excalibur Morgan is the holy blade of Null. It is soaked in an uncountable number of destroyed lives destroyed an uncountable number of existences, and has bathed in the outer reaches of the Null, blessing the blade with its attribute, the first of its kind. This noble phantasm is more of a soul weapon but is classified as a noble phantasm by the root for ease of explanation. My next noble phantasm was pandemonium and read as follows, once called Avalon, 
This scabbard has abandoned the ideals that it was crafted with and for, much like its master. While it provides the same level of healing as it used to, it now also enhances its master's other noble phantasms while boosting their stats greatly. The increase is so grand that the other noble phantasms become slightly harder to control and gain passive effects. I was not in the least surprised to see my Blackwater listed as a noble phantasm, nor surprised it was sealed. Its description though was enlightening. This is less a noble phantasm and more an extension of Artoria. It has the ability to absolutely corrupt the existence of anything it touches, while simultaneously leaving the core of their being intact. This corruption has several levels and degrees of effects. At its most basic level, it will simply inverse someone's morals, or flip their alignment. At its highest, it pulls on the authority of corruption from Artoria to remodel the entity's soul and body if available or applicable. This act also forms a soul corridor between them, much like what gods form with their most zealot believers, if the soul and or body survives the transformation. This bond can be broken, however. The description continued on the next page, causing me to let out an amused huff with how long its description was compared to the others. The longer this black water stays in a world, the more evils it will start to absorb to strengthen itself and Artoria has the ability to permanently absorb new effects from existences that are similar to it in function. The corruption may only be purged by something with a higher level of authority of corruption or cleansing. After reading that corrupted wall of text I had another surprise in store for myself however. I had several other noble phantasms. Much to my disappointment though, they were completely corrupted. And I couldn't read them. The only word I could read on all of them however was sealed. While I was disappointed that this book wasn't a catch-all, a low moan from the floor drew my attention. Looking down at Rin, I had a small sly smile as I thought. I totally forgot she was there. Oh well. Snapping the book closed like an angry librarian I asked the poor girl. Are you okay, Rin? She groaned and held her head as she said, no more. Please, I'll take my book back and promptly forget it exists while you are here. You're too much. With another chuckle I hand her the book and say, Mortals, 98, Chapter 63, What do you mean 14? The next day came quickly, and before I knew it, Rin and I were on our way to her school, and while she was making small talk, I was not paying any attention, as I was still wondering what I wanted to do with the dipshit known as Shiru Imiyur. I found it absolutely insulting that a worthless mortal with no talent but plot armor had my former Avalon. I was honestly considering just tripping it out of him the second I see him, but on the other hand I was wondering if he'd still managed to summon the version of myself in this reality if left alone. Still lost in my own thoughts. I was brought out however when I noticed Rin waving her hand in front of my face and asking if I was paying attention to her. With mild annoyance in my voice I asked, What do you need, Rin? She huffed, crossed her arms over her chest and looked away while saying, It's rude to ignore someone who is talking to you. I merely scoff and say, If any of the drivel leaving your mouth was of import, I would pay attention. Her head snapped to me in anger, but all she did was glare before scoffing herself and looking away. Ignoring the woman, I went back to my thoughts about Shiru and the others. While I was thinking, two thoughts suddenly forced their way to the forefront of my mind. What exact timeline was I in, if any that I knew of, and could I even open a portal back to our dimension since I was summoned here, deciding to check the portal bit since it was easy. I was surprised that I actually couldn't. I could still feel my connection to Tierwin, the dimension, and my system but I couldn't interact with any of it. With a soft hum to myself I thought, I really should have asked mother how many god, disses I am dealing with. Must be more than one at least if they can block my ability to open a portal. Rin suddenly facepamed herself out of nowhere and turned to me while asking, I just remembered. Why are you not in your spirit form? Tilting my head I asked. I have no such form though. Her mouth hung open before she asked. What do you mean you have no such form? How are you supposed to come with me anywhere if anyone can see you? With my head still slightly tilted I raised an eyebrow and asked. But no one can see me? 
Did you not find it weird how none of the mortals we've walked by didn't drop to their knees and ask to be stepped on? She immediately blushed up a storm and stuttered, WH what? While she was stuttering, blushing and throwing all kinds of statements at me, even I was kind of taken aback with myself as I also registered what I had said. I quietly mumbled to myself, is Neo corrupting me? Is that possible? Shaking my head lightly to clear my thoughts I raised my hand to stop her avalanche of useless comments as I said, either way, no one will see me but you. Well, they will see me, but they can't register my existence in their minds. So, same thing really. With the wind still taken from her sails she released a massive sigh before asking, what do you mean they can't register your existence? I crack a smug smile as I say, just that. It's a nice little charm I picked up rather recently. Simple and yet very complex magic from a generation of mortals that had no right creating such magic honestly. With her blush finally leaving her face, she raised an eyebrow in interest as she asked, Would you be able to teach me such magic? Raising my hand to my chin in thought while closing my eyes I think for a few moments. With an eventual shrug I say, Maybe but I have no desire or reason to. With a slightly sinister chuckle I said, you could use a command seal to make me try though. With a sigh and a wave of her hand she turned slightly and started walking again as she said, no, not worth it right now. Now come on, I don't want to be late for school. With a shrug I say, your choice. With that our conversation died and we walked in comfortable to me at least, silence all the way to her school. As we passed the school gates and near the building I couldn't help the TSK that escaped my lips. Rin sighed eyed me as she asked, what was that for? Releasing an annoyed sigh I said, so many useless mortals, a few of them may be summoners at least, but the vast majority of them are garbage. As we arrived at her locker and she started to put her things away and get others she said, I didn't take you for a king that would disparage the common folk. I could only scoff as I said, I have long since abandoned my identity as a king. That chapter of my life was just as worthless as the rabble surrounding us. She looked at me with surprise as she asked, You think that your reign as a king was useless? I nodded my head, but kept silent on the matter. Honestly, I could only remember a shard of my time as a king. And that is only because of what Great Red had done to check who I was. A few memories have trickled their way in since that event, but not much and most of it was after I was corrupted as a heroic spirit to begin with. Rin finished gathering her things, closed her locker and started to make her way to class while mumbling. I am starting to see why you're a foreigner class. Beyond your broken stats. It didn't take us long before we arrived in Rin's classroom and she started to get herself situated. As she was prepping her stuff on her desk for whatever class she had I said, I am going to go explore, and check the other mortals here that I feel are potential summoners. Call if you need me for some reason, I guess. Since she was surrounded by her fellow students she just gave me a light nod as acknowledgement and left it at that. As I turned to leave I let my senses sweep over the school to find strong souls, and magic. I frowned slightly when I felt three rather strong sources of magic from the corners of the school, while a fourth one was growing slightly in power gently. With a very gentle crack, I teleported operated, myself to the forming power. Arriving with another soft crack sound I looked around and thought, even though I was able to reduce the sound generated by the spell a great deal, I couldn't remove it entirely, it's almost like it's a part of the spell if I am being honest. Seeing that the area was clear I looked down at the rune that was etching itself into the ground while I continued my train of thought, at least I was able to remove the awful feeling and distance limitations. Now. This is rather interesting, I have no idea what this rune means, but I can feel the malevolence of it clear as day. Who is etching this though, and from where? Closing my eyes, I extended the range of my scan to the maximum but sadly I felt nothing. With a deeper frown I thought, I can sense a lot of strong souls and powerful magic, but none of them are linked to these runes. How very interesting. Another interesting thing is I can sense seven heroic spirits. But if I include myself, that's eight. With a thought, I left the area with another soft crack and appeared next to Rin and gave her a little startle. 
She glared at me and in a low voice with a bit of heat she asked, What in the world Artoria? Are you trying to scare me in the middle of class to embarrass me? I just gave her a dismissive wave of my hand as I said, I care not if you are scared easily. But more importantly, how many servants are supposed to appear in this grail wall? Giving me another glare, she turned back to paying attention to her teacher but still answered in a low voice, 14. Why? I raise an eyebrow in interest as I answer her. I thought it was 7. She merely shook her head and said, No, it's always been 14. With a hum I asked, And what number is this wall? She tapped a finger on her desk for a few moments in thought before she answered, This will be the ninth if I recall correctly. Why all these questions? I just shrugged and said, Just clarifying some things. So we got 13 opponents to murder, eh? Well, it's better than 7 at least. I noticed Rin stiffed at the word murder and could only grin slyly while I thought, still a bit naive it seems. Well, I'll be sure to show her exactly what war is about. Not feeling like staying, I said, well, I got the information I wanted. I am going back to exploring. She didn't get a chance to respond as her teacher had called on her to read some passage in a book so I just teleported out. I appeared right next to Shiru, who had his eyes closed and was touching a TV. I could feel his pathetic amount of magic wash over the broken piece of technology as he was using his famous trace ability. Even standing here I could feel the rage start to build as I was gazing on his clueless form. I could sense the reality marble just above his heart in the center of his body. That bit was interesting at least, as it was truly massive in scope. I also felt a few threads of magic linking to the marble from his soul, and as I followed them it was no surprise they led to Avalon. I narrowed my eyes as I thought, no surprise there. Avalon is nourishing his soul, and even providing a bit of power to his reality marble, or, maybe augmenting it is the correct term. But, something is off with this Avalon. The ambient mana it's giving off, is too, bright for a lack of a better word. Weird. That alone was reason enough to stay my hand if I was being honest. This universe was already weird. So if you add it along with the odd feeling Avalon was giving off, I was willing to bet something interesting would happen if I left him be. So I pushed my rage down and focused on my senses again. Spreading them to the entire city and a bit beyond I focused in on the strongest magical presence and teleported myself there. I looked around in curiosity and noticed I was in some kind of cathedral. And before me was a woman in a purple robe with a black hood. Much of her face was hidden aside from her mouth and her blue hair that reached her shoulders. She was busy looking at some kind of spell that was generating an orb that had a projection in it. Looking at it, it seemed she was spying on Shiru of all people. She let out a random chuckle for some reason, before the vision switched to Shirin's classroom. However, she was not focused on Rin but rather her teacher, if I remember correctly, that was her summoner and they have fallen in love, and if the sigh of longing that escaped her lips was any indication, I was correct, I stood there for a good solid minute before I got bored, and annoyed, of her constant sighing, I dropped my disillusionment charm and asked, why not take a picture, it'll last longer, her reaction was brilliant as she nearly jumped out of her skin with a yelp and vanished and appeared several meters away. I couldn't help myself as I laughed lightly at her while saying, Now that was funny. She gazed at me for a few moments before she asked, Who are you? With a cheeky sly grin I said, Wouldn't you like to know, my dear? She gasped, and while I couldn't see her eyes I was willing to bet they were wide. She wasted no time before she jumped into the air and started to generate numerous spells around her. Seconds later, she let them loose on me while generating several more to pelt me with. While her barrage of spells was rather impressive with how fast she was able to generate it, in the end however it was ultimately useless. All her barrage managed to do was kick up some dust and debris around me. Any spell that managed to hit my still form just exploded, or vanished doing nothing at all. When she was done with her casting, I waved my hand to cast a wind cantrip to clear all the dust away. As the dust was cleared I looked up at the floating form of Medea and said with a cruel grin, Is that all, caster? 
my turn. I raised my left hand and pointed at her with my index finger. Nearly instantly a large amount of mana started to swirl around the tip of my finger before it compressed and a ball formed that glowed a black red with purple lightning arcing around it wildly. While the spell was merely an imitation of one of my favorite abilities in anime, I still called out the name, Soro. The world was suddenly dyed in black with a tint of red as an absolutely massive beam of energy was released from my attack. The building gave no resistance whatsoever as it passed through the brick walls and roof. The only sound was the loud hum of magic as I sustained my attack for a few seconds before the beam thinned and petered out of existence. I lowered my hand and put both of them behind my back as I relaxed. The ground around me was nothing but molten slag in an area of 10 meters, as well as with the edges of the citadel. Molten rock casually dropped off. What was left as parts of the building were still melting from the residue heat of the areas that were in contact with my spell. As I looked up at the clear sky through the large hole I created in the building I casually said, it would see my mist. I had sensed that Medea had teleported away before my attack hit her, but I made no effort to correct the path or speed of my attack to make sure I hit her. One shots were boring after all, for the most part that is, and so, I had let her teleport to the side to avoid my attack, though I did wonder why she didn't teleport away, or even behind me to attack while I was busy releasing mine. With a mental shrug, I turned my head to look at Medea as she said with a ting of fear in her voice, Who are you? What? Are you? I just gave her a mocking, crooked smile as I said, Who knows? Well, it was nice meeting you Medea, let's play again sometime. With that, I tapped my foot on the ground while I silently cast the mending charm Reparo. I watched with mild interest as it looked like time itself was rewound on the building as it repaired itself. In a matter of seconds, it was back to normal. No, it was even better than what it was when I arrived if the shine of the floor and walls was anything to go by. Sending another mocking smile to Medea, I recast my disillusionment charm and teleported back to Rin. As I appeared next to her, the teacher Medea was in love with had just left the room and the class was getting ready for its next lesson. Rin glared at me, and in a hushed voice said, I told you not to do that. With a sly grin I ignored her complaint as I said, the teacher that just left is a summoner. Shall I kill him? Rin froze in the middle of packing her books, and looked at me and asked, What? Can you repeat that please? 103, Chapter 64, Unforgivable? Rin's eyes were wide as she asked once again say that again? Giving her a sly grin I answered, your teacher, the one that just left, he's a summoner, or a master as you mortals like to say. There was a lot of sarcasm in my voice as I made air quotes when I said master. I could only silently scoff to myself as I thought, leave it to the weak to try and prop themselves up with lofty titles. To her credit Rin managed to collect herself rather quickly, then asked in a lower voice as to not draw more, attention to herself, are you sure, like, really sure, with a soft hum I nodded my head before I responded, yes, I am sure, Rin, the servant he summoned is Medea, so I ask again, shall I kill him, Rin frowned and bit her thumb in thought for several minutes while she sank into her own little world, I patiently waited for her while keeping tabs on Medea's soul signature and her master Suichiru Kuzuki, Rin's teacher, while Rin was thinking on what to do, I was making note of what a servant's soul felt like. This is interesting, it's like a fake soul, a copy even. I can tell it's linked to something that leaves this reality but I can't follow it. I wonder if their servant's souls act like shadow clones from Naruto in that they transfer everything they did to their main soul, body when killed. I can only assume so. I was brought out of my musing by Rin when she said, I need to do this. I entered this war with the intent to win, my wish has to be granted. A cruel grin appeared on my face as I said, good. I know just the way to kill him, want to watch? It'll be very dramatic. Heartbreaking even, she seemed a little put off as she leaned back with narrowed eyes before responding, um, right. Evil alignment. All of my instincts are screaming to say no but I need to see this through, 
Let's go. My face cracked and nearly inhumanly wide and sadistic smile as I said, Excellent. He's going to meet her at the back of the school like some kind of fucking angst I teen right now. Ha <laughs> ha. Casting disillusionment on the both of us. I then grabbed Rin by the shoulder and we sank into the shadows. I didn't want to risk alerting Medea with operating, or having Rin do it by puking her guts out because of the spell. Moments later, we stepped out of the shadow of the building a few meters away from Kuzuki. Seeing that we arrived before Medea, I quickly took action. I pointed at Kuzuki and said, Imperio. The spell took effect without a hitch and Kuzuki relaxed and his eyes looked glazed and a little lifeless. With a thought, he went back to his proper stance, and his normal indifferent look appeared on his face. Rin noticed the sudden change in his demeanor that appeared for a second before vanishing, so she asked, What was that? What did you do? With a sinister chuckle I said, The start of a wonderful play. Do you know the history of Medea? Rin frowned and tilted her head in thought for a bit before she said, just a bit. The Grail is giving very condensed footnotes of her past. Most of the information is about her strengths and weaknesses with a few notable achievements and highlights of her life. Why? When I turned to her, she visibly flinched and leaned back because of the face I was making as I said, because you're about to see that strength in war is not only just measured by one's power output from their magic or muscles. As I turned my head back to Kuzuki I continued, and that there are a few things much worse, and effective, at killing someone than steel or flashy spells. And as if on cue, Medea appeared via teleportation, I made a mental note to try and figure out how she was teleporting like that later, as it was better than apparition in my eyes. As Medea smiled at Kuzuki after she appeared and walked over to embrace him I whispered to Rin. They were in love, by the way. I could see Rin's eyes widen every so slightly out of the corner of mine as she asked, were? With a sinister chuckle I said, just watch. Only a few seconds after they hugged, Kuzuki pushed Medea away, much to her confusion. She asked, what's wrong, Suichiru? Kuzuki sighed and said, I am sorry, Medea. I can't do this anymore. I can't keep this up. She pulled down her hood and had a look of absolute confusion on her face as she asked, Do what? What do? She was interrupted by Kuzuki raising his hand, with the command seal facing Medea, and saying I command you to not move or talk. She instantly shut her mouth and stopped moving, while the look of pure confusion only seemed to grow on her face. Kuzuki sighed again and said, You can come out, dear. I am sorry. I can't do this anymore. It makes me feel dirty being around her and not you. With a wave of my hand, and a few spells there was a glow of red and pink near Kuzuki before a humanoid figure condensed in the light. It started to take the shape of a very defined woman, and after a few seconds the light seemed to flake away into rose petals to reveal a stunningly beautiful woman in a skimpy white dress with long, lush red hair. Medea's eyes widened at the woman's appearance, and she started to struggle against the command seal's effects when the woman floated down and hung herself off of Kuzuki's neck like a human gape. In an incredibly seductive voice the new woman said, It's okay, my love. I understand, she is rather vile after all. Kuzuki closed his eyes and sighed while leaning under the woman's arms for a few moments before he said, Still, I hate to disappoint you like this, my love but I just couldn't stand being around someone that wouldn't hesitate to betray me at the drop of a hat. The woman hummed in agreement before floating to the front of Kuzuki and giving him a deep kiss. I smiled in sadistic glee as Medea's struggle started to increase in intensity from being called a traitor and the woman's kiss. After the long and overly dramatic kiss, she floated back to her original position behind Kuzuki and looked at Medea with a mocking smile. She floated lower and leaned her chin on his shoulder as she asked, What's the matter, my dear? Do you not recognize me? Well, I cannot blame you. It's been so terribly long after all. The woman ran a finger over the side of Kuzuki's face, before pressing their cheeks together and saying, It's very surprising a princess like you could forget me. After all, it's not every day a goddess of love blessing a mere mortal with pure love for another after all. Even though the woman spoke in a jovial manner, 
Her smile was anything but, and the woman's words had the effect she was after, as Medea's eyes were wide, and she was starting to move ever so slightly, despite the command still being in effect. Medea was struggling with all her fury, and madness started to color her eyes as she struggled to say, of dot trod dot height, the woman let out a boisterous, yet mocking laugh as she gleefully said, so you do remember me, Aphrodite then forced Kuzuki to face her as she kissed him deeply again, much to the extreme ire of Medea, she even made a show of it by moaning loudly into his mouth before pulling back with a wide smile as she looked at the positively livid and raging Medea, Aphrodite scoffed, and with her voice filled with disdain she said, look at her, my love, what did I tell you, nothing but a rabid beast, best put her down, and out of our misery, Kuzuki nodded his head and said, as you wish, my love, while his face was full of love and longing when he was looking at Aphrodite, when he turned to Medea though it became blank and emotionless, he raised his hand again and said, I command you, heal yourself, Medea then took out a blade from inside her robes and I could only smile slyly as I mumbled, clever girl, the dagger she took out was her noble phantasm, and its jagged blade was already glowing with magic, she screamed loudly as she stabbed herself in the heart with her own blade, only for it to activate, purple threads of magic were escaping where the wound was, and for several seconds this continued with her screaming, a shattering sound, almost like glass, came from Kuzuki's hand as the last command seal vanished from it, Medea was panting wildly as she pulled her dagger out of her body, drawing some blood. She looked up at the duo with nothing but hatred and madness coloring her eyes as she screamed, Aphrodite, Suichiru Kuzuki, and as she charged at them, I let go of the imperious curse on Kuzuki. He moaned and looked confused for a second, but before he could even gather his wits, Medea was already tackling him. With a grunt the two of them crashed against the school building before falling to the ground in a heap, all the while Medea was screaming their names, and to his credit he managed to irk out a single weight, before Medea plunged the dagger into his chest, with hatred and madness unending she screamed out, I am not a traitor, you are, you both are, die, die die die, she stabbed wildly with reckless abandon at Kuzuki's body, while repeatedly screaming at him, this went on for several minutes, before there was nearly nothing left of Kuzuki's chest that even remotely looked human, she was brought out of her madness induced rage by a soft giggle above her from Aphrodite, Medea's head whipped to her direction, and the madness started to seep back into her eyes as Aphrodite said, oh my my, such barbaric behavior, to think you would betray the man you loved so easily just like that, with a scream that promised nothing but the most epic of pain, Medea lunged at Aphrodite with her dagger, however, as soon as Medea made contact with Aphrodite, she simply phased through her, Medea hit the ground hard, and quickly scrambled back to her feet and looked at the goddess in confusion, Aphrodite floated down to the ground, and simply smiled as she said, were you not paying attention to me, I had asked why you betrayed your lover so easily, I ask this because, well, she then faded away, and I revealed myself standing over Kuzuki's corpse with a sinister smile, my voice was filled with sarcasm as I mocked her, well, how could you kill your lover like that, my dear, I squatted down and looked over the mutilated corpse and continued, he had nothing but love for you in his heart, you were his everything, and you betrayed that with a cruel and painful death, I looked back up at the stun Medea and finished with, truly, you are the princess of betrayal, Medea's eyes started to rapidly move between myself and the body of her former lover, and soon, realization and grief flooded her eyes, she looked down at her blood-covered hands and started to hyperventilate, she then grabbed the sides of her head and screamed in grief as she crashed to her knees, I couldn't help myself when she started to spiral down in grief and sorrow at her actions and started to laugh, she stopped her wild mumbling to look at me as I stood up while I was laughing at the whole situation, a few moments later I settled down and said, to think you would kill a lover who was bent to someone's will in a similar way to what was done to you, in your madness, you didn't even notice I had let that spell go, and he tried to talk to you, 
I couldn't help but laugh again for a few more seconds before I continued, even his last breath was used to say sorry to you. Even his final thoughts were filled with nothing but shame at how he was used to hurt you, and how he was powerless to even resist. I cracked a sadistic grin as I closed with, truly, a fine gentleman who gave his heart, which was full of nothing but pure love, to you. Only to have you literally break it without a second thought, par for the course though. When you are involved no, my sadistic smile only grew as Medea digested what I was saying, and she started to vibrate in rage. Soon, all the sanity and grief in her eyes was replaced with unbridled fury and hate, as she stood up, and started to charge me I said, here, I'll show you what your lover went through since I am such a wonderfully considerate person. Imperio, when she was only a few centimeters from stabbing me with her dagger, she froze. I could only nod my head in appreciation to her will, as I could feel her struggling against my control, I leaned in and whispered to her ear, how does it feel, I know your true self can hear me above her adult brain right now, this is what your lover felt like the entire time, he was screaming against my control like you are, but even you are not strong enough, your will, your magic just cannot compare to something like myself. I straightened my posture and with a mocking chuckle I said, now, I think it's only fair that you give your heart to your lover, like he did for you, and with a blank face, and a non-glowing dagger, Medea started to carve out her own heart, not even a grunt escaped her lips as she went about the macabre task, it didn't take her long before she was pulling out her own heart and emotionlessly dropping it onto her ex-lover's corpse, I released the spell, and she collapsed to the ground with a pain cry. Tears were falling from her eyes as she crawled to her ex-lover's face with the last remaining strength she had. She started to fade away in short order as she could no longer keep her form because of the damage. With a final whimper she looked up at me and whispered, You. Are. A. Moon monster. She breathed her last as her body disintegrated into magic particles. Interestingly though. Her heart was still on Kuzuki's chest, as I was smiling at my work, I heard a very disturbed and yet softly spoke, what the fuck, turning around, I saw Rin on the ground with a look of absolute horror on her face, 102, chapter 65, an ominous wind blows, I just scoffed at Rin as I said, don't you think you are overreacting a bit, Rin tore her eyes away from my handiwork and shook her head with wide eyes as she said, no, no, I do not think I am overreacting, I think I am reacting at the perfect level for what I had just witnessed. She then pointed at the corpse with a shaking hand and said, what in the actual fuck? Why? I brought my hand up to my chin and nodded while humming in thought for a few seconds before I said, why not? I said I was going to kill him, didn't I? Still wide-eyed she answered, when you said kill, I assumed you meant with a spell or a sword or something normal, not whatever in the fuck that was, I am freaking out here, again I scoffed as I said, oh, quit being such a baby, you're a magus, I am sure you know of worse things than this little play I did, she was starting to finally calm down, but still whipped her head to the sides as she said, that's true, but, none of that was done in front of me, I just shrugged my shoulders as I said, don't worry, you'll get used to it, and eventually it won't affect you at all, hell, you might even enjoy it one day, she stood up, and then crossed her arms into an X formation in front of her as she said, I very, very much doubt any of that will ever happen, taking a stealthy peek at the command seal on her hand I said with a subtly sly grin, you never know, Rin, you never know, fully in control of her emotions again, she just waved me off before looking back at the body and saying, can you get rid of you? Actions now, please. With a hum I nodded my head and raised my hand to snap for theatrics. But before I could use my spell the body started to glow much like how Medea did moments before she died. Seconds later the body, along with the heart, started to disintegrate just like how Medea did. With a raised eyebrow I said, well, that is interesting. I wonder if he, or even the both of them, will be paying me a visit again? Rin tilted her head and asked, that wasn't you? I shook my head as I answered, no, it was not, it seems like the grill wants to play a bit, anyway, 
You got your shit together enough to go back to class? Rin froze for a second before her eyes went wide and said, shit, as she ran past me, with rather impressive speed if I'm being honest, I turned my attention to the glyphs that were around the school. The final glyph that was writing itself had completed during my little puppet play, and now the boundary was ready to be activated. As I teleported to one of the glyphs I thought, interesting that they are still primed. Didn't the boundary fail when it's creator? Oh, maybe that's why. It's not active. And to that point it's no longer linked to anyone. I wonder. I sent a tether of my own mana into the glyph and it latched onto it like a drowning man to a lifeboat. In a matter of seconds my mana overtook the entire boundary array and the color of the glyph had turned from a blue to a pitch black, ignoring the color change. I was able to confirm this was the life drain array that Caster had set up in the anime now that I was connected to the whole completed formation. I stood there for a while as I pondered what I wanted to do with this thing as using it as is would be a complete waste for someone like myself. A cruel smile slowly crept up onto my face as an idea began to form. I raised my hand toward the glyph and used my authority of corruption on it. Doing so caused half my arm to be covered in an inky black mist, and unbeknownst to myself my eyes were glowing much brighter than normal. A toothy grin cracked my face as I finished corrupting the array moments later. I couldn't help the dark giggles that escaped my lips as I teleported away while thinking, this is going to be fun. As I appeared onto the school roof, I looked up and snapped my fingers. The boundary field activated and I saw my magic shoot out from the four corners of the school and converged above me. When the beams hit each other a massive symbol briefly appeared before a dome slowly formed round the school. As the massive symbol faded, which looked like my sword in its scabbard loosely, I thought, I may not be able to summon my black water, but like it said, still have access to my authority. I guess I am kind of using my black water like how Thor uses his hammer to channel his authority. Or something. With the boundary in place, I felt the surrounding mana begin to slowly, extremely slowly, start to be converted into corruption mana. Everything inside this boundary will start to become slowly corrupted, magus or not, and because I was feeling playful, I didn't define what kind of corruption, so I have no idea what will happen to everyone. I couldn't help but laugh out loud like a B-rate villain before settling down and thinking, this is going to be so interesting. I've never used my authority like this before. I looked down with my senses as I continued that train of thought. Who knows what kind of monsters will be born because of this. Maybe even a few literal ones. I hummed in glee as I saw the mana starting to take effect on everyone inside. While the corruption speed was dramatically slower than my black waters, it is still rather quick. I narrowed my eyes in thought as I pondered the rate. HMM. It should be a few days at most. Changes should start to appear by tomorrow, even if they'll only be subtle. With a final dark chakra like casted disillusionment on myself and teleported to Rin, she was focusing on her studies as the teacher droned on about math. Looking at the clock, it seems it only took me 15 minutes, give or take, to set up my new entertainment. I sighed as I thought, this is going to be boring. Tilda after the final bell has rung Tilda. As Rin was heading towards her locker I thought, and I was right. My thoughts were interrupted when Shiru himself nearly bumped into Rin in some kind of classic rom-com scene. Rin gave him a glare as he scratched the back of his head and apologized. I am so sorry, Rin. I was lost in my own head for a few there. She scoffed at him while giving him a light glare as she said, Just watch where you are going. You would have slammed into me if I was as empty-headed as you. He continued to rub the back of his head as he chuckled awkwardly for a few seconds before he frowned a little and said, Um, Rin's glare just deepened as she asked, What? He winced a little at her tone before he just shook his head and said, No, never mind. Again, I am really sorry Rin, but I have to go. With a small bow to Rin, he quickly ran off while Rin just glared at his back for a few more moments before turning on her heel and resuming her walk back to her locker. Ignoring whatever that just was, I asked, So, what is the plan for this evening, Rin? Without looking back at me she said, Well, 
You've already taken out one master. Even if it was a little over the top. With a sly grin I thought, only a little. Ignorant to my thoughts she continued, so I thought we could keep up the pressure and go after another. Are there any more masters in school? I lazily answered. There isn't any. But, that could change if all of the masters have not been selected after all Tilda. We arrived at Rin's locker and as she was transferring her things she hummed in thought before saying, and what about servants, any more in the area? I nodded my head as I answered, yes, there are a few, no idea who they are without actually going to them though, but it seems your cuff might be blown, as there has been one that has been hovering around the school for a few hours now. Rin closed her locker and had gotten everything situated before she nodded her head as she turned to the door while saying, then we'll come back after dusk. I know this area rather well, and it would be a nice home field advantage. I simply hummed and followed her while I thought. I wonder if it's still Lancer. Another interesting thing is that Shiru was completely uncorrupted. I wonder if Avalon is protecting him since the effect from the boundary field is very weak. Tilda back at the school after dusk. Tilda. Rin and I have been walking around the school grounds randomly for a good twenty or so minutes before our stalker had finally decided to show up, and much as I suspected, it was indeed Lancer. He suddenly appeared before and standing a basketball hoop of all things, looking down at her smugly, with a scoff he said, If it isn't Rin Tessica, rumor has it that you are a master, but I see no servant. Did they abandon you? Rin took a glance at me and then in another random area to make it look like she was searching for someone else before saying, how do you know who I am, as for you, Lancer, I presume, he spun his lance in a showy flourish while the smugness that was radiating off him intensified a thousandfold, after spinning his weapon around like a damn cheerleader's baton for a few seconds he said, indeed, as for how I know you, he then jumped off the basket towards Rin, and it must have been faster than she could see if her gasp was any hint, but for myself, it looked like a rather normal jump to be honest, as he was above her with his weapon swinging down he said, maybe someone will tell you in the afterlife, I merely stepped in front of Rin, grabbed his spear and threw him towards the school, all at a speed that was far greater than his little jump attack, as he crashed through the school's wall, I idly thought, now that I think about it, that attack kind of looked like a jump attack from a dragoon from Final Fantasy. Ha, huh, neat. The annoyed groan from Lancer, aka Kuchilane, pulled me out of my musings as he pulled himself out of the rubble, as he dusted himself off and cracked his neck, much to my confusion, he said. What was that? A spell of sorts? I looked back at Rin to see how she was going to play this, and saw a smirk on her face as she said. Who knows, maybe someone will tell you in the afterlife. Looking back at Lancer a wide smile split his face as he laughed for a few seconds before saying, Ha, huh, I deserved that. But, if it is a spell, how long will it hold? His smile turned bloodthirsty as he once again charged Rin. This time, he tried to circle around her and come from behind and on land. Again, I simply grabbed his weapon before it could reach her but this time I just held it in place. Feeling the wind from the attack brush by her, Rin turned around and seeing that I was lazily holding his weapon while he was struggling to pull it back she just smirked. She crossed her arms and imitated his pose from before as she said, long enough it would seem. How about another trip into a wall? Lancer stopped struggling for a second to look up at Rin and as he was starting to get his question out I heaved his weapon, which he refused to let go of into another wall. A minute or so later, as he was grumbling and dusting himself off again, we all heard a soft, Rin, we all turned our heads to the sound, and there peeking from a corner was Shiru. Lancer grinned wildly as he shouted. No witnesses. Shiru made a startled noise and then started to hightail it out of there with Lancer laughing right on his heels. Rin cursed behind me as she started to run after them while saying, what is that dumbass still doing in school this late? Damn it, not feeling up to running after them all, I simply sank into the shadows and rested in Rin's as she ran after the duo. I quietly snickered to myself as I thought, 
She totally forgot I could just teleport her to Shiru. Oh well, not my problem. She spent quite a while running around the hallways looking for the little peeping Tom, completely forgetting I could also just sense him. Lancer had already dealt with him as well, and was leaving the area. As Rin finally found him, and started to run up to his still form I thought, kind of disappointed. I was having fun playing around like that. He looked so annoyed at the whole situation. Hey, as Rin came to a stop next to the barely alive Shiru, I stepped out of a shadow on the wall, and to my slight surprise, Rin wasn't panicking or anything, she just looked like she was in deep thought. As I joined her I simply asked, so, what's the plan here? Make sure he dies? Save him? Rin just sighed before she answered, I am thinking of saving him. She then glanced at me and asked, thoughts? I shrugged my shoulders and said, do as you will. She released a deep sigh before she said, I'll save him. I feel responsible. It was my harebrained idea to fight at the school. Even if this Thomas shouldn't be here this late. As she pulled out her necklace and started the ritual to save his life I said, A, hey, you do you. She ignored me in favor of making sure the ritual was done properly. As it completed, Shiru's wounded heart started to seal up, and he regained color in his face. If only slightly, she dropped the necklace she used as a focus for the ritual with a sigh and stood up. She gazed at him for a few moments before asking me to teleport us back to her home. As we appeared in her living room, she collapsed on her couch with yet another long and drawn out sigh, after which she said, I am going for a bath. She promptly stood up and walked out of the room, leaving me my own devices. I sat down on the couch that Rin had just vacated and spread my senses over the city again. A small frown formed quickly however as I sensed the number of servants. The count should have gone down after I killed Medea, but it didn't. I still sense seven. Turning my senses to Shiru, I confirmed he was still without a servant, and still making his way home, though I did notice Avalon was pulling mana from the surroundings into itself. With slight interest I thought, so it's getting ready to summon Saba then. I can't wait to see her reaction when she meets me. Ignoring that for now, I went back trying to count the servants but no matter how much I pushed my sense, I still counted seven. With a bit of irritation I thought, did one of them come out of hiding or something? As I was annoying myself, I heard Rin enter the room, turning to look at her with a raised eyebrow. She frowned at me and asked, what? Tilting my head I asked, I thought you were going for a bath. It was Rin's turn to raise an eyebrow towards me as she said, I was in the bath for a good hour or so. I blinked a few times before saying, oh, I guess I was totally lost in deeper thought than I suspected. Well, ignoring my lack of awareness of time, did the bath clear your head? She hummed as she sat down on a chair across from me before saying, it did, and honestly, I feel like it was a waste to save him, I nodded my head as I said, <clears throat> it was, but it was your choice, well, even more of a waste since he's about to be killed again, Rin slumped forward and released an annoyed sigh as she asked, really, I hummed in confirmation before saying, indeed, Lance noticed he didn't exactly die, and is assaulting him right now, Rin released a frustrated growl before standing up and saying, let's go, I saved his dumb ass, and I'll be damned if my work is negated so soon, with a light chuckle I said, sure, let's go, I laid my hand on her shoulder and teleported us near where I felt Shiru, Lancer, and now another, we appeared outside of his little shed, which had its door in ruins, before either of us could take a step a loud and rather young voice rang out, have at thee, knave, then there was a sound of metal clashing before Lancer's body was violently ejected from the little shed and through another wall. I couldn't help the little snicker that escaped my lips at his situation. However, that snicker died in my throat rather soon as I turned to see Sabah walk out of the shed. She took a proud stance and said, I will protect my master to the best of my ability, and your evil will not touch him. This time it was my turn to gawk at the scene in front of me and say, what the fuck? Saba shifted her stance for combat and said, now that white Saba is here, you are destined to lose. 86. Chapter 66. What is? Rin glanced at my outburst and asked, 
What's wrong? I pointed at White Saber, Lily, and said, There is no way in hell I was ever, ever like that. No, zero, no. The purity of her soul disgusts me on a fundamental level. It shines like millions of stars, brimming with hope and wonder. Che. I actually felt repulsed to be around her, like I ran the risk of the absolute purity of her soul washing away my beloved corruption. I could hear Anne's voice dripping with smugness as she asked, Wait, that's you? A younger version of you? Crossing my arms in an X, while shaking my head I absolutely refused. Nope. Nope. Um, MMM. No. 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 Hell no. 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 My face went through various stages of denial and anger. But Rin only had the biggest, most shit-eating grin I've ever seen the whole time. With dramatics, she raised her left hand to her forehead and with a sigh said, Oh, what a tragedy to go from such a pew maiden to. She then motioned my way lazily as she finished with suppressed giggles, this much to my annoyance. Even the withering glare I sent her way did little to stop her from giggling at the entire situation. While Rin was enjoying my self-loathing of my younger self, said self was actually doing rather well against Lancer considering her master. After Lancer speared her in the heart with his noble phantasm's release, Gae Bolg, I felt like I took actual damage to the core of myself when Lily yelled, to pierce a maiden's heart and then flee like a drunkard father, as expected of such a scoundrel. However, the straw that broke the proverbial camel's back was when Rin fell on her ass and started laughing hysterically at the retort. Unable to handle such pure cringe and shame, I teleported next to Lily and threw a punch right to the side of her head. Much to my surprise, she raised her sword to block the attack just in the nick of time, and quickly shot off through the center of Shiru's little shack completely obliterating it, and nearly taking him out as well as a consequence. I was confused at how she was able to block my attack, if only barely, before I noticed my disillusionment charm had deactivated with a soft hum. I corrected my posture and thought, HMM, maybe because I actually attacked this time, instead of merely defending? Or was it the bloodlust that I released that broke the charm? A shout from Shiru brought me out of my musings along with a complaint from Lily, geez, what the heck was that? She came out of nowhere, an assassin? With a wave of my hand I dispersed the dust cloud that was kicked up before returning my hands behind my back and taking up a regal posture. With a groan, and a sigh of relief from Shiru, Lily got up from the ground and dusted herself off a bit. As she cleaning up a bit she said, a low blow such as that won't be able to. However, her taunts seemed to die in her throat when she looked up at me. She immediately froze mid-motion before asking with wide eyes. Morgan, with several blinks, she asked again, Sister, is that you? I just glared at her while I debated if I wanted to correct that statement. But I would be lying if I said I'd rather that narrative go around than admitting that I was ever like her at any point in my life. So, with a mental shrug, I said with venom dripping freely in my voice, Artoria, Lily had a sly smile as she said, you look, older, I merely huffed and raised my nose to her, and with disdain I replied, and you are still a brat, I sneered slightly when I saw her flinch a tiny amount, tossing Rin a subtle nod when she joined me at my side I said, still full of hopes and dreams I see, she took a proud stance and puffed out her chest as she exclaimed, but of course, I will be a great king one day. I released a laugh much like a classic villainous while covering my mouth with the back of my left hand. Oh oh her hot Ilda. That's cute. But, we both know you don't. You fail. And in this day and age, your vaunted kingdom is even debated if it existed in the first place. My malicious sneer only grew when I saw her visibly deflate. But much to my annoyance she recovered in no time and declared. That is what I intend to correct with my wish. I will do it right this time. With a sigh, I roll my eyes as I say, sure, sure. But, I already see a glaring flaw in your plans, Artoria. She raised an eyebrow in confusion and emotioned me to continue. Conjuring a fan made of shadows to hide the absolutely nasty smile I was sporting, I said, I stand before you, and in opposition of you. 
With a flick of my wrist I dismissed the fan and rested my right arm in my palm before continuing, and this time, I will be actively doing my own dirty work with a devious smile. I drew my hand backwards and the javelin made of pure shadow was created along the motion. When I was ready to throw it, the javelin was four meters long with a tip crackling with an ominous purple lightning. My smile turned cruel as I turned my head to Shiru, and threw the spear. I heard three gasps as the spear left my hand. Lily wasted no time, and appeared in front of Shiru, and was using her sword along with a mana burst to hold the spear at bay. The sound of grinding metal was ringing out, along with the crackling of thunder as the two weapons clashed in a test of might. With a mighty yell, Lily diverted the spear into the air with all her strength. There was a crack as the spear broke the sound barrier as it left the city skyline before exploding into a massive purple ball of hatred and rage. I didn't get to see their reaction however, as when Ren saw the spell get deflected she asked me to teleport us back to her house. As we arrived with a soft crack, Rin bent over and was softly groaning. Before I could say anything though, she held up a single finger and asked me to wait a moment. With a few long drawn out sighs, she collected herself, and with a nod she turned to me and said, Why did you try and kill Shiru? I raised a brow and asked, do you have a problem with my actions in attempting to remove an opponent? She instantly said, no. She frowned slightly to herself before saying, yes. Adding a tilted head to my raised eyebrow I asked, well, which is it? She seemed to struggle for a few moments before throwing up her hands in the air and yelling, oh, forget it. Crossing her arms under her breasts she said, just forget it for now. I am going to go to sleep and I'll tell you after I've thought about it. Releasing a hum and a half shrug I said, sure, you do that. She narrowed her eyes at me and said, I will. She then huffed and left the living room while I just smiled slyly at her. After I confirmed she was in the room, I walked over to the couch and released a long sigh as I collapsed into the soft cushions. Sitting in a rather unladylike fashion I just closed my eyes and thought, well, that went from zero to one hundred rather fast, but really? Her soul threw me for such a loop. How is it so pure? It makes Asia's from DXD look like his eyes damn it. As that thought passed through my mind I hummed as I asked myself, speaking of a sigh, I wonder what happened to Rias after I killed him. I think I should send someone to make sure I don't have some light touched she devil after me. That's a pain I don't want to deal with. A cruel smile appeared on my face when I thought of the DC universe that had kicked off my entire ascension. I wonder how long it's been since I've been there. I did say I would go back one day. I'll have to check if I can teleport there one day. If I even remember after all of this tilde. With a soft chuckle. I correct my posture and sat like the ex-king I am as I mulled over what I wanted to do next. I focused my senses on the city and the area around it and to my surprise I now sense nine servants, excluding me, slightly swaying my head back and forth I think. So, assuming Medea isn't replaced, and is counted as a down and out that leaves three more to show up? With an interested hum I continued, while there are some major differences. Some are still the same. I want to meet the real Gilgamesh and punch his fucking pretty face through the damn planet's core. Turning my head lazily toward the front of Rin's home, I released another interested hum as I stood up. Interesting. A master and two servants are rapidly making their way here. A writing to the front gate. I hovered in the air with my hands behind me in a relaxed state as I waited for my guests to appear. I didn't have to wait long before they arrived. A little girl sitting on the shoulder of an absolute tank of a man who was nothing but muscle, and standing next to him was. My thoughts froze as I gazed at the other servant and before I could even register what I was doing I said, You are extraordinarily beautiful. All three of them froze at the sudden declaration, and the one who I directed to it blushed an equally beautiful red, and before I could stop myself I once again blurted out, Your blushing face is just as gorgeous. The servant's face was absolutely red as she stuttered out, Yo you're rather fetching as well, but now is not the time. I was completely ignoring the other servant and master, Heracles and Elias Veil von Innsman respectively, and focusing my entire attention on the stunning fairy knight. 
Bargast. I was not surprised she didn't confuse me with her king, Morgan Le Fay, like Lily did. I would be immensely disappointed in her if she did, honestly. Truthfully, I was blown away by the cute little fidgeting she was doing trying to conceal a smile that was threatening to sprout from the compliments. I beamed a toothy smile of my own at her and said, I will make it the time then. I glanced at the other two who were still rebooting from the semi-pink atmosphere before I looked back and continued, I would rather spend time with you, than do whatever your summoner has planned. That seemed to finish Ilya's reboot sadly as she said with a slight startle, ah, no wait, stop, we're here to fight, you hurt my Anna-chan, only I am allowed to do that. Feeling annoyed at the interruption, I glanced at the duo before I moved. Appearing in front of Berserker instantly, I smashed my fist directly into his chest. There was a glorious sickening crunch sound and a massive backlash of kinetic energy from the attack. The wind rushed away from the point of impact as his body started to fold in on itself before he shot off faster than a jet. Ilya released a surprised yelp as she fell a few feet before I caught her by the nape. I had silently casted a barrier around her to prevent any damage. As I didn't want to risk having Bargast getting disummoned on the off chance I can't become a master, I turned Ilya so she was forced to look into my glowing golden eyes as I calmly said, young ladies should stay silent when the adults are speaking. There was a loud explosion sound, and an equally huge dust cloud forming in the distance from Bazooka's landing. Ilya glanced at the rising cloud before looking back at me and nodding stiffly. I gently set her down as I said, that's a good girl. I looked up at Bargast, and while she didn't rush in to save her master, she nonetheless was ready to do just that if the need arose and she was given the chance. I smiled at her and said, you've got great instincts, fairy knight Bargast. She relaxed her posture when I had set her master down gently, and was looking at me with a raised eyebrow as she asked, you know me? Getting a small smirk I said, I do. Indeed, though, I must confess my knowledge of you was sorely lacking when it came to your beauty. I was not blowing hot air when I called you beautiful, Bargast. The blush came back in full force as she smiled slightly while she asked, May I know who owns such a silver tongue? I smile wildly as I grab the sides of my dress and do a full royal-like courtesy while I introduce myself. My full name is Arturia Pendragon Alter. It is my greatest pleasure to make your acquaintance. She raised her eyebrow and before she could ask I nodded my head and said, What you are thinking is correct, but it is also wrong. A story for another time. She nodded her head as she did a knight's bow and returned a greeting in earnest. My full name is Fairy Knight though, but I would be most appreciative of you, if you would continue to call me by my fairy name, Bargast. I gave her an odd and said, of course. I then had a sly grin as I added, I'll call you whatever you want, whenever you want. She seemed confused for only a split moment before her blush was up to a few degrees, giggling softly. I continued when she was looking back at me, I know you adore a strong lover, and while I did display such strength, I did a flourish as I summoned a sword of shadow in my right hand and took a combat stance. Smiling at her I finished. You won't be satisfied with just that, will you? Come, test your mettle against me, and let me prove to you that I have more than what it takes, to take you as my lover. While she was still blushing up a storm, her face turned serious as she drew her sword before saying, Are we not going a tad fast? I smiled widely as I answered, Something about you calls to me, my bargast. I desire you, and I want to see where this might lead. I could have sworn I was able to see smoke coming from her ears for a few seconds before she shook her head and declared, then have it thee, do not take this lightly, bear your all to my blade while I do the same, let our souls sing in battle. 107. Chapter 67. Wife. Get. Question mark. As we stared at each other in total concentration, I suddenly heard Rin call out, Caster, what was that new Uaeus, dash. Dash, time seemed to come to a total halt as Bargus charged at me, as if it held its breath in anticipation. I angled my shadow sword slightly in front of me to block her straightforward slash. My arm held strong as she tried to lean into the blade lock, 
while I leaned in close to her face and softly spoke. Your eyes are absolutely stunning, my bargast. I pushed upwards to break the sword lock, while simultaneously breaking her stance for a few seconds from the sudden force as her form was broken and she was stepping back. I gently tossed my sword up to catch it with my downward swinging left hand. She wasted no time, and was already in a blocking motion when my sword came down upon her, causing us to lock swords once again. As I pushed against her form, I once again leaned close to her face as I said, Your right eye makes rubies wish they sparkled with such radiance and purity, and your left makes Gaia weep at its inability to seed such a vibrant green in nature. While she was blushing and struggling to not smile, she did not lose focus in the slightest. This caused me to smile even wider at her as I released the pressure I was using and stepped back. With the sword lock broken, she quickly spun clockwise and aimed her sword towards my neck. Bringing up my sword with the blade pointed down, I parry the attack causing her sword to bounce back with no small amount of force. With her form broken, I threw out my left fist in a punch towards her chest. Realizing she couldn't block the attack properly, she simply tensed the muscles in her arm braced for the impact. A small shock wave of force erupted from the point of impact and she was shoved several meters away. As I reset my stance, I saw nothing but a massive smile on her face. One that I knew we shared, she gained a gleam in those wondrous eyes, and changed her stance to a double-handed grip on her sword. With a yell, she ran at an incredible speed and then did a jumping leap attack. I raised my sword horizontally above my head and blocked the attack. The sheer force and power she put in the attack however caused the ground to explode around me as I was lowered about an entire meter into it. I paid no attention to the rocks and debris that also came to a standstill all around me shortly after the initial attack while Bargus shifted and sent out a mighty kick with her right leg. I used the forearm of my free hand to block the kick as she was still pushing down with enough force against my sword to keep the lock going. I was not at all surprised with the strength in her kick though when it caused me to be pushed to the right and dig further into the concrete driveway. When our eyes met, hers flashed with intended my situation, sunk into the concrete up to my waist. Kicking off the air itself. She did a somersault, with a mighty yell and an equally mighty looking axe kick, she brought her right leg down. Bringing up my hand so my palm is facing myself, I caught her by the ankle. The force of the attack was still strong enough to drive me further into the pavement however, while also causing the area immediately around me to explode outwards. My smile nearly split my face as I teased her. Thanks for the meal, my bargast. I heard her gasp and saw her eyes widen out of the corner of my vision when she realized where I was staring. Before she could act or say anything however, I shifted around and tightened my hold on her ankle. She let out the most adorable yelp of surprise as I started to bring her body down towards the ground in front of me as I said, Time for you to serve up some dessert, my bargast. The pavement offered up no resistance as it acted as if a meteor had impacted it when I slammed down Bargast. The ground shifted under me as the impact had created a large 8 meter wide crater. I jumped away from her and caused several of the floating chunks of debris to shatter as I passed through them. As she was groaning and getting up I let out a sharp whistle and said, and what a fine dessert you have offered up. She huffed and dusted herself off while turning to me. She sent a glare that lacked any fire in it, and only held embarrassment if her blush was anything to go by. She suddenly hid a sly smile as she said, You are not the only one who has been enjoying the view, Artoria. A toothy smile split my face as she rushed me from the right. Our swords made no sound as they clashed, as mine was created from shadow but they did cause bursts of wind from the speed and force of the impacts. I continued to block all of her swings for a few seconds before I asked, and, what about me appeals to you, my bargast? As we continued this dance, causing slashes to appear all around us from the force bargast was using in her swings, she smiled as she said, as you marveled at mine, I too adore your eyes. They are resplendent and shimmer like liquid gold. 
Their equally golden glow is filled with nothing but confidence and surety of oneself. Using a parry to suddenly break the stalemate, I summoned a second sword of shadow in my free hand and put pressure on her as I pressed the attack. Even as she was put on the back foot from my sudden increase in attack, she was still defending with relative ease and her form still radiated with beauty. As I continued my flurry of attacks I asked, and, what else do? However, I didn't need to finish my question as I was able to see her quickly and not so subtly glance at my chest with a small blush and smile. I barked a laugh before I did a spin and attacked with both swords to her right side. She was able to tell this attack had more strength in it than my others, as she had braced herself with one hand on the flat part of her sword. It was her turn to slide several meters away and into the concrete slightly. As I dismissed my extra sword and fixed my stance I said, this dress may not be the most practical of wear for sword fighting. This point I will concede. She walked a few steps away from the line of damage she created and fixed her stance while saying, I do not mind, and as you have said, it is quite the feast for the eyes. I laughed at that for a few seconds while she smiled and further appreciated the view. It wasn't long before she frowned slightly and then asked, but why have you not tried to draw any blood with your blade? Surely, you are not looking down on me? I shook my head with a slight smile as I answered her, not in the slightest, my bargest. I just refused to overly harm my future wife, even more so by actually cutting her. My smile turned sly as I continued. Besides, there are other ways to dominate you, my bargest. While her eyes widened at the implications of my statement I added, Besides, my goal in this fight is not to slay you or even hurt you, my bargest. It is to impress you, to prove to you I can handle your everything, and that I am worthy to stand by your side, as I find you worthy to stand beside mine. She beamed a wondrous smile at me for a few moments before she lost it to a one filled with some melancholy. She shook her head and her face hardened as her gaze became determined. We locked eyes for several moments before she asked, My everything you know of me and are willing to accept everything that I am? I relaxed my posture and with a nod I said, everything. She closed her eyes and tilted her head ever so slightly forward and I barely heard her whisper, my everything. We'll see if you are yet another liar. She started to expel an enormous amount of mana, and then moments later her entire being started to glow a deep crimson. Her form started to change, including her sword, while dark crimson flames started to waft off her. The small flames around her soon turned into a small tornado of crimson red fire. It wasn't long before I felt a large amount of bloodlust pour out, and for the tornado to explode to reveal a changed Vargas. She slowly opened her eyes, and gently breathed out which released steam from how hot her breath was. Her gaze soon locked onto mine in moments before she asked, Behold, my power unrestrained, is it not? Her voice brought me back to reality and I accidentally interrupted her as I automatically said, Beautiful. She hitched on her question as she was startled by my sudden proclamation. She stuttered a little as she tried asking again, W what? You don't find me? Repulsive? I lightly shook my head in a dazed-like manner as I answered, Beauty incarnate, is what you are. Her eyes widened as I continued, Your flames are so beautiful amateurish to herself weeps in jealousy. Your beauty, so unmatched that Aphrodite cowers in shame. Your bloodlust is so fierce that it makes Kratos seem like a child throwing a simple tantrum. Her face got redder and redder as I continued, One look at you and Ares is forced to heighten his bar for fitness for war. Your hair is so luscious and full, and most likely softer than any silk. Your muscles ripple with strength that Heracles aspires to. You. She quickly raised her free hand and said, Please, stop. I cannot handle any more. She looked at me with a face full of doubt, yet with eyes filled with hope as she asked, do dot do you speak truthfully? I smiled softly at her as I dismissed my shadow sword and started walking to her. I made no effort to avoid the floating rocks that still seemed to be suspended in time. They simply exploded upon contact with myself and scattered before they returned to being suspended. 
My eyes stayed locked onto her eyes, even as I had to tilt my head back to look up at her beautiful face when I was standing only a few feet from her. My smile grew, yet was just as soft. As I said, I will never lie to you, my bargast. You are all that, and oh so much more. I reached up and gently wiped away the small tear that escaped her right eye. To my surprise she stopped me from removing my hand, and instead held it in place as she leaned into my palm. She closed her eyes and just rested on my hand for a few moments before speaking. I know not why, but I know your words to be true. Caressing the side of her face I asked, Did you wish to continue? She gently shook her head and said, No, it is unneeded. My instincts are much stronger in this form, and they are screaming at me about you. She opened her eyes and a wry grin appeared as she continued, and don't think I didn't notice you were not using Excalibur. A small sly grin formed on my face as I gently shrugged before saying, I hope you do not take it as an insult, my bargast. As it was not meant as one, she closed her eyes and snuggled into my palm again before saying, I do not. I was a little offended at first, until the first time our swords clashed. It was then that I realized it mattered not what was in your hands. She couldn't see my sly grin deepen as I said, Now look at what's in them. Perfection personified. A large amount of steam was released when she huffed before she chuckled lightly. She opened her eyes slightly in a mock glare as she said, I was wrong about your silver tongue. It is clearly golden. She gently sighed before she stepped back away from myself and was covered by flames for a few moments. When they vanished she was back to her normal bluish-gray tinted armor. The breath that time seemed to be holding was finally released as everything started to resume as I heard Rin's yell, C-E-E, -E -E. oh my god what the F. She was interrupted by several loud explosions and debris flying everywhere. Ilya released a startled yell as well, but she was protected from anything hitting her as it seemed Berserker had rejoined us sometime during my spa with Bargast. After the sound of several explosions finished ringing out and everything seemed to settle down, I heard Rin yell, Caster. As I turned to look at her confused and furious face she continued, What the shit? 98. Chapter 68. Pink is a good color. No? While sending Rin an amused smile I turned to Bargast, causing my smile to soften greatly while I said, just enjoying a friendly bout with my girlfriend, resisting the urge to coo at Bargist's forming blush and smile. I turned back to Rin as she stuttered, GG girlfriend. I smirked at the growing blush on Rin's face as she started to become a stuttering mess, which only increased in intensity as I walked over to Bargist and took hold of her right arm and placed it between my breasts while I leaned into her. I released a content sigh as I gently rested my head on her cool feeling armor, and giggled softly as I felt Bargast go ramrod stiff once she processed the whole situation. The little gasp from Rin caught my attention, and upon opening my eyes to look at her I saw her pointing hand wildly moving around in my direction while her left was covering, albeit failing to also stay steady, her mouth. She struggled with the sentence but eventually mentioned to spit it out. Why why you dot you? BB but. Enemy. She's the enemy. I merely scoffed as I continued to snuggle further into Bargast as I said. Enemy? No, no. My future wife could never be an enemy to myself. I glanced at their, frankly adorable, duo of Berserka and Ilya as I continued. I would also destroy anything that would cause my Bargast to unwillingly raise her blade against me with all my rage. Bargast's smooth voice instantly caught my attention, causing me to look up at her wonderful face as she asked, and she cleared her throat quickly to prevent more stuttering and to calm herself down a bit before continuing. Unwillingly? I smiled at her with a mischievousness coloring both it and my eyes as I raised one of my free hands without releasing my hold on her arm, to her face. I caressed her right cheek with the back of my fingers as I said, I won't pretend that my actions might cause your night training to flare up in defiance of them which would in turn cause you to draw your blade, my lovely Bargast. My eyes gleamed with playfulness as I added, at said time, I do not mind having another lover's duel to decide if I should back off. I then licked my lips gently and with a sultry tone I finished by adding, 
even more so if you use your true form that you just showed me. However, I had to quickly look away so she wouldn't see my face twist into hate as I quietly said, that reminds me, destroy whoever called you repulsive, their entire soul line must be extinguished. Unsurprisingly Bargast heard my whisper when she in turn said in a low tone, thank you, and my Artoria. I looked up at her, and while she was blushing a bit she didn't turn away from my eyes as they locked onto hers, I beamed a wide, jubilant smile at her as I nodded my head and returned to leaning against her arm comfortably. The sudden frustrated yell from Ren drew my attention to her as she had both her hands above her head in exacerbation. She slumped forward in what looked like defeat before she noticed I was looking at her, which caused her to quickly right her posture. She crossed her arms under her breasts and turned her head away with UHMPH. Several seconds later she sighed and slumped even so slightly before shaking her head and looking at me with a, not, fierce glare while saying, fine, whatever, good for you I guess, but what are we going to do about all of this massive damage, it's too extensive for me to repair. I just humped softly before raising my right leg back a bit and tapping my toes against the road. After casting several silent reparos on the area around us, all the damage and debris started to glow a faint purple as it was all covered in my mana. Everyone's surprised faces were quite amusing to see as everything started to fix itself in what frankly looked like time magic, and they wouldn't be wrong, as that is exactly what is happening. It seems the magic population of the Harry Potter world is a lot more powerful, even if they don't understand exactly how their magic works, than one would initially think. A large amount of their spells actually touch onto concepts ever so slightly to work, and they have no idea. The main reason Reparo doesn't work on organics, is because the spell actually rips something from your current time stream and rewinds it before placing it back into said time stream. Doing so to something organic has very delightful consequences. The spell itself was actually crafted to make it unable to work on organic matter for that very reason I found. I was broken out of my thoughts about spell work by Bargast saying, This is very impressive. Such a subtle use of time magic. I raise a brow in curiosity at her comment as I tilt my head to the right ever so slightly and look up at her. While she continued to watch the spells undo all of the damage our first date caused I asked. You can tell what type of spell that is, my bargast? She looked down at me with a slight smirk as she answered. I have been around my queen for numerous years. While I am unable to reproduce much of the magic she uses, I still have learned much about magic in general from my liege lady. I simply hum softly and nod my head at her explanation while she looks back at the spells that are finishing up. When the last bit of damage was repaired, and my magic washed away from the area, everyone was still just standing there and blinking. It was Rin who broke the silence as she said with a still dumbfounded face, what marvelous magcraft. Much to my surprise even Ilya spoke up. I agree, such a large scale spell casted instantly, and without a spell circle to guide it, I preened from the praise and smugly said, feel free to praise me more. Though I may not be able to hold a candle against my sister Neo in terms of magic, I am no slouch. Catching Bargus turning her head towards me out of the corner of my eye I looked up at her as she asked, you have siblings? I smiled and chuckled a little as I nodded my head before I said, several. I would love to introduce you to them, and my mother, Lily. They'll all love you, I am sure. I can guarantee Tearwin would just adore you as well Tilda. My smile widened as Bargast blushed lightly as she mumbled, meet my mother-in-law. I was about to say something when Rin suddenly said, oh please, get a room you too. When her eyes widened when she realized what she said she quickly corrected herself in a panic. No, don't do that, it's a turn of phrase. I didn't mean literally. I just laughed out loud at her actions while I felt Bargast fidget embarrassingly in my grip, which only caused me to laugh louder. When I finally settled down to quiet chuckles our attention was turned to Ilya as she coughed lightly into her hand. Seeing she had everyone's attention she asked with a bit of trepidation, so, what now? I am still mad at you for harming Anna-chan. Though I know I can't do anything about that now. 
I smirked as I said, I'll be honest with you, Ilya, there is a very good chance I will end up killing Shiru before this war is done. Her little face frowned as she asked, why? I just casually shrugged as I answered, do you think Shiru will stand by, let alone surrender, to an entity like myself? I am quite literally everything he stands against. Evil, uncaring to most. I have enough blood on my hands that could drown worlds. Do you think someone of his disposition can stand by idly against something like myself? Her frown deepened and after thinking over it for several seconds she shook her head and answered, No, he won't. I lazily nodded my head as I said, he's too hung up on the useless ideal of being a hero who can save everyone. He's so blinded by his righteousness that he can't see that if you try to save everyone, you'll most likely lose everyone. I saw Bargus nod her head as she added, that is correct. Life is unfair, and it is a futile gesture to try and save everything and everyone. Save who and what you can, and be content with that. It's important to try your hardest, but it is even more important to recognize when you are out of options and it becomes futile or even harmful to continue. Ilya just sighed before saying, I wish Anna Chan never got caught up in this dumb war. I hummed with disinterest before I said, but he is, and if he doesn't quit while he's ahead he will die. If not by my hand, someone else's. Even you may be forced to kill him. Ilya. The frown returned in full force on her face as she shook her head before yelling, No, I will never hurt Anna Chan. He's family. I just chuckled at her naivety for several seconds and then said, Ilya, you should know firsthand that there are fates far worse than death. She froze for several seconds before slumping forward a tiny bit in defeat and weakly nodding. A not so subtle cough from Rin, however, drew our attention to her. Seeing she had everyone's attention, she said, Back to your original question. What do we do now? I clamped down harder on Bargast's arm, squishing it between my breasts. As I said, I don't really care, honestly. I want to spend more time with my girlfriend. Catching Bargus nod out of the corner of my eye, I had a huge smile on my face after she said, I too, would like to spend time with my G-girlfriend. Rin just glared at us and I swore I could hear her thoughts of just explode normies. Before she turned her attention to Ilya and asked, Well? Ilya just sighed heavily for an impressive amount of time before saying, I need to think on what to do. Saba, I don't mind you staying with Castor, but I would like to ask both of you, Rin and Castor, if I need some help to come and help. I just shrugged and said, I don't mind helping the summoner of my Bargist if that is what she desires. Rin however looked totally flabbergasted at me as she said, why you? She then sighed in defeat and said, whatever, fine, I don't mind Castor helping you out Ilya. I expect the same courtesy if I need it however. Ilya just nodded her head before simply saying berserker, causing the large mountain of muscle to turn and dash away. Another sigh from Rin drew our attention to her as she said, well, come on you two, let's go inside. It's been a long night, and I feel like I have aged 10 years. I am so done, and ready for bed. I just chuckled softly as I started to drag Bargus gently towards the gate leading up to Rin's house. As we passed the gate, Rin had already entered her house and left the door open for us, so we quickened our pace a bit. As we crossed the threshold into Rin's house, Bargus said, This is a very nice home. A sly smile formed on my lips as I said, if you think the house is nice, just wait until you see the beds. I couldn't help but bark a laugh as I heard a very audible groan from Rin as she yelled, Damn it, just get a room already. And I could only laugh harder as quickly added, AA and make sure to use some sort of silencing spell. 100. Chapter 69. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. NSFW chapter. Announcement. This is my very first attempt at lemon. Do not expect much. Seeing the smirk on my face Bargist asked. You are not going to use a silencing spell at all, are you? My face split into a smile instantly as I answered her. Nope Tilda. As I popped the pee, I was back to smirking and asking in a sultry tone. And judging by that sentence, you are willing to share my bed tonight? Bargist blushed deeply before meekly nodding her head and saying. I greatly desire for this to be real. 
She then looked me directly in the eyes, while determination and something else, something primal burned in them as she added, I will have you prove your honesty, your desire for me, make me yours, mark me as yours. While I do the same, my smile became predatory as my eyes beamed with desire as I said, remember, my bargast, you asked for this. I wrapped my arms round her neck, and roughly pushed her against the wall behind her causing it to crack heavily as I kissed her deeply. Soon we were in another battle, our tongues fighting for dominance in our mouths. I moaned rather loudly into her mouth when she used her wonderfully strong hands to cup my ass cheeks and raised me up. Even feeling her armor wasn't a turn off in the moment, the cool metal being the only thing not panting from the heat we were now both giving off. Finally breaking off the kiss, I rested my forehead against hers as I whispered in a husky and needy tone, Bedroom. Now, looking into her eyes, and seeing an equal amount of desire and lust coloring them would have made my nipples rock hard if they weren't already. My black lace panties were already starting to give up on life as they struggled to hold up at their new job as floodgates. Panting heavily she started to say, I don't. My lust however, was no longer willing to wait and I simply teleported us to an unoccupied guest bedroom in the mansion. In my need to have bargast, I didn't even notice I had used a new form of teleportation, one that used neither fate or potiverse magic. Bargast blinked a few times at the sudden change of scenery, before she looked behind me and frowned. Having a bit of the haze from my lust cleared up in confusion. I tiled my head and looked behind us, before I could voice my question Bargast said, well that is a nice bed, it is too small, and weak. With a wave of my hand, I sucked the bed into the shadows and ejected it somewhere randomly. Having cleared the area, I snapped my fingers and a new triple king sized bed started to materialize. Because it cost me nothing but a bit of imagination and some more of my infinite mana pool, I went all out on creating the bed. A few moments later, the entire construct stopped glowing and what was left was a bed fit for two goddesses. The mattress, if you could still call it that from the sheer size of it, was colored like Bargast size. The left side is her ruby red, and the right her forest green. The two colors faded into each other in the middle, rather than just a sudden color change. The covers and pillows were my royal purple, and the silk canopy was her wonderful gray-blue in a soft tone. Turning back to her, I whispered gently into her ear, I know it's over the top, but so are we. I started to nibble on her earlobe gently as I added in an almost needy, husky tone, no more stalling, my bargast, claim me. I then went to her well-defined neck and softly bit down and started to give her a hickey. That was the action that broke her out of her little days, and with speed that far surpassed anything she used in our duel. We were suddenly beside the bed, as I pushed myself from her hold to fall back onto the bed, my clothes dissolved into shadowy smoke. All that was left was my extraordinary racy bra and very much wet panties. Bargast wasted no time at all, and her armor glowed a bright blue before it shattered like glass leaving behind a pair of undergarments much like my own. Raising an eyebrow, she answered my unasked question with a blush that is never left, or grown. Her face since we started, I may not be able to be a full-fledged mage like my king, but a simple change of garments is child's play. It didn't take long though for my lust to come back in full force at seeing Bargast in all her glory wearing only a skimpy pair of white undergarments. Her massive breasts, muscular and perfectly toned arms and legs. Her six-pack that demanded respect. Everything about her screamed perfect in my eyes, and noticing a nice trail of glistening liquid dripping down her inner thighs only heightened my own lust even further. Much to my glee, I didn't have to wait long before her towering form joined me on the bed and lovely golden hair joined mine against the mattress as she hovered her face mere centimeters above mine. I noticed her right eye flicker slightly as the sclera dyed itself black for a few moments as she said, mine. I reached up and pulled her down onto my lips as I kissed her deeply, our tongues resuming their battle. My hands explored her muscular back as I closed my eyes in pleasure as she explored my body with hers. I was leaking so much from her caressing and had a micro-orgasm when she cupped my right breast in her strong hand, 
causing me to moan loudly into her mouth. She then broke off the kiss, and started to lightly plant several as she trailed down the side of my neck. As she started to approach the breast she was gently kneading, she used her other hand to roughly rip off my bra and then took up my now freed breasts with a bit more force. She started to kiss around my areola gently, and then teased my left nipple with a few flicks of a finger. I threw my head back while letting go of Bargist and gripping the sheets strongly as a loud moan escaped my throat. I could feel my lust growing rapidly, and much to my inner surprise, I still had enough clarity to think about my next action, albeit barely. My hands glowed purple as digital like lines of mana raced across the bed and soon covered the entire room. Bargis clearly noticed my spell but all she said was, good foresight. Now we do not need to worry about damage. You deserve an award. She then bit down on my right nipple, while roughly pinching and tweaking my left. With nothing but lust coloring my voice I yelled on in pleasure as I orgasmed. I shivered in pleasure and anticipation as Vargas moaned into my breast as she huskily said, That's one. While still nibbling on my nipple, she reached down and pressed several fingers through the cloth of my panties against my vagina causing me to orgasm once again. Releasing my nipple from her teeth she started to trail down my stomach with kisses as she gently said, Two. When she got to my panties, she growled and ripped them off easily. She leaned down and gently licked the tip of my clitoris several times, causing me to whine in anticipation, as I propped myself onto my elbows, and pushed myself into her face to try and get her to stop teasing me, she did something I did not expect. She put one arm against my ass, and the other against my lower back and then lifted me up as she straightened out. She quickly guided my legs over her shoulders and then dove deep into me with her tongue. My eyes widened as I gasped as I instantly orgasmed from her actions, but she didn't let up. Instead, she started to moan into my vagina as she picked up the speed of her tongue's exploration of my inner walls. As she was starting to massage my ass with both her hands, I could only scream in pleasure as I leaned against her head. As I gripped her scalp through her lush hair I continued to scream out in pleasure. Yes, yes, don't stop, Bargist, don't stop, I keep coming, can't stop. I crossed my legs against her back, and tried to pull myself even further into her embrace as she listened and picked up her speed once again. My lust addled mind didn't even pick up the sudden sensation of her toying with my back door with a few fingers, before plunging deep into my ass. My entire grip on her head and body tightened greatly as I let out my biggest orgasm yet while I screamed, oh no, fuck yes. I continued to cry out in pure pleasure as a bit of my own fluid splashed onto my face from the sheer force I had come with while I was hunched over Bargist's head. As she continued to work me, I started to act on instinct. On my need to also pleasure my lover, not at all aware of my actions, I ripped off her clothes with a burst of magic telekinesis and conjured up a rather large and bumpy dildo. I then doubled it and quickly shoved them into Bargist. Her loud moan of pleasure as she continued to eat me out sent vibrations through my entire body, eliciting yet another orgasm. This continued for several minutes as we both worked each other, the sheets below us completely soaked from both of our many, many discharges. She made me come one final time, before she gently laid me back down on the mattress, a little further up from the absolutely huge puddle we both had created. As my mind started to clear from the fog of pure lust I was in, I unconsciously waved my hand and vanished all of our sweat and fluids from our bodies and bed. Noticing everything was clean again, Bargis hummed happily as she cuddled against me. With some pride in her voice she whispered into my ear, I do believe I have claimed you, and won that round. Turning my head slightly, I kissed the tip of her nose and smiled dryly as I said, I have thoroughly been claimed, and I do concede that round, but the night is young, and I have a surprise you my lovely Bargist. Since she was leaning on her side, I was able to see the wonders that were her breasts on full display. I couldn't help myself as I turned into her while groping both of her wondrous mounds. Truly omniversal treasures, she moaned softly as I continued to gently play with her breasts before saying, 
You know of my legend as King Arthur, no? Her eyes were closed as she gently nodded her head and continued to enjoy my groping. With a smirk she couldn't see I continued. Well, you also know of the wizard who trained me to be that failure of a king, Merlin. With her eyes still closed she only answered me with a low moan. So I continued. Well, he may be known as an extraordinarily powerful wizard, but I know him as something else. A pervert. I quickly kissed her on the lips before I gently made her lay on her stomach as I got up on her back. I massaged her perfectly muscular back gently and kissed the back of her neck softly as I whispered, he didn't mean to teach me the spell, but I learned it nonetheless. I hope you're ready, my love, my bargast. As she tried to turn over to look at me, I pushed against her shoulder and said, no no, no peeking. I suggest you grab hold of a pillow though. It's my turn to claim you, and make you scream. She gently giggled and took my advice and grabbed a pillow to rest her head on. I shuffled down her body, and over her large, perfectly toned ass which I slapped a few times in appreciation. Mana started to gather near my abdomen, before lowering down to the front of my vagina. As my spell was taking hold, and finished its job I said to Bargast, mine. I then spread the lips of her vagina with my thumbs before plunging my newly grown, fully functioning penis deep into her depths. She screamed out in pleasure as she gripped the pillow tightly from my sudden intrusion. Her inner walls gripped me tightly as I started to roughly pound into her, causing her to gasp and speak brokenly, wh. What is that? What I think? It? Yes. Harder. I wrapped my hands around her stomach and lifted her up into the doggy style and then followed her command. I started to plow into her with reckless abandon and speed, causing her to orgasm with every other pound. It really was a good thing I had used reinforcement on the bed and room, as I was not holding back very much. Ripples of energy appeared with every thrust into her, as her ass itself rippled from the impacts. I had to decrease my speed ever so slightly as the constant snaps of the sound barrier breaking from each thrust was starting to annoy me. I was thoroughly enjoying her screams of pleasure as much as I was enjoying watching all the muscles throughout her body flex and contract from the impacts. It wasn't long before I felt myself coming close to my limit, and so I said, Bargast, I am about to. She didn't let me finish as she yelled, do it. I demand IT, fill me. Her vagina clamped down on me with a vice grip sending me over the edge, causing me to explode inside her. We both moaned loudly as Bargast joined me as she exploded into an impressive squirting orgasm despite me being inside her. As I pulled myself out of her I said, you are mine, I am yours. More? She flipped over causing my eyes to drop to her massive breasts, which were honestly larger than my head. As they jiggled, she smirked at my still lust-filled gaze as she said, I am yours, as you are mine. And it fills me with an unending desire to see that look in your eyes as you look upon my body. As you said, the night is young, break me, as I break you. She then dove at me and plunged my still very much erect penis into herself with a loud moan. It was going to be a long night, and I couldn't be more excited for it. To smut or not to smut Tilda? Yes, smut. Votes, 164.80.4%. Nah, waste of time Tilda. Votes, 40.19.6%. Total voters, 204 middle dot this poll was closed on April 30th 2023 6 47 p.m. 73 chapter 70 when a soul shivers I blink slowly as I look around in confusion with a frown I thought wasn't I just resting beside Bargast how the fuck did I my train of thought was interrupted by the sound of a large explosion behind me causing my frown to morph into confusion when I turned around to look at the source. In front of me was a massive field of battle, or more to say, what was the aftermath of such a battle? Starting from the bottom of the little hill I was standing on, there was a body every half a meter or so. All the corpses had varying degrees of gear and types, as well as quality, from simple leather armor, to night armor, to even what seemed to be farmers. I guessed that last one because they had nothing on but simple clothes and pitchforks in their hands. 
The state of all the corpses were just as varied as their attire. Some had simply suffered a beheading, while others were petrified, soggy as if drowned, mutilated as if torn limb from limb by bare hands, and a few were even cut cleanly in half vertically. The list went on. The final thing I noted was the age of everyone was all over the place as well. Some seemed to be as young as teens, while others were clearly in retirement. My frown deepened as I thought. I missed out on something like this. There are bodies as far as I can see. Just then there was a soft chuckle that sounded like the stars themselves as a large fox tail softly gave me a head pat. Not having any of my instincts go off, and recognizing the voice I turned and asked. Mother, what is going on? Before answering me, she scooped me up on another one of her tails and lifted me closer to her as she said, Hello my daughter, my little Artoria Tilda. She smiled as she gave me another head pat before continuing, I felt your soul shiver as more of your memories were shunted loose because of your recent conquest. Good choice by the way. Bargus is such a sweet little child Tilda. She then cast her gaze to the remnants of the battlefield and sighed with a slight smile on her lips as she said, I remember this day. This was the final atrocity you committed to have to hear when born Tilda. I raised an eyebrow in question, and Mother Lilith chuckled lightly before answering, while I am sure you would agree that Tearwin is a special little kit. It goes well beyond that Tilda. You remember how I had told Raven and Salem they were soulmates? I gave a small nod before my eyes widened a little as a thought crossed my mind. Mother's smile widened as she said, You're so quick on the uptake, little Artoria Tilda. Yes, Tierwin is your soulmate. Soulmates don't always have to be romantic in nature, but can also be family or even simply friend-oriented Tilda. I nodded slightly at the revelation as I turned back to the remnant of the battlefield with a gesture of my hand towards it. I asked, and this, she placed a hand directly on my head as she said, the final battlefield, of the final atrocity as I said, birthing a god isn't simple, or else every faction would be doing it after all Tilda, this planet is actually an excess world for several trillion omniverses, she must have taken up a seated position, because I suddenly found myself in her lap with her resting her chin on my head as she continued, and you killed every last one of them, from kings and emperors, to peasant children and wives Tilda. I blinked and suddenly we were in another place, surrounded by what seemed to be an endless tide of corpses and broken armaments. As I was looking around, movement suddenly drew my attention. Shifting my gaze, what I saw brought a wide and wild smile to my face. It was me, looking exactly like Saba Alter, but I was absolutely covered in blood. My armor was shattered in several places as well, and I had some nasty looking wounds, but through it all, my sword was pristine. If not covered in as much blood as I was, but otherwise it looked as if it was brand new. With her voice low, Mother Lilith said, this was also the day you achieved your major authority in War Tilda, and the moment your noble phantasm became so much more Tilda. As I gazed at my past self walking slowly with a bit of an awkward limp, but with purpose, I noticed she was bleeding black blood. I felt Mother Lilith shake her head as she corrected my observation, that is not blood, it's what you've come to call Blackwater apostrophe tilde, that was your first major authority unlock, corruption. My past self had come to a halt as she stared at a pair of monstrous doors that blocked her way. They were as large as a two-story house if I had to guess, and made from some kind of white-looking marble. I quickly noticed that along the doors and walls all around it, were what seemed to be shadows burning into them. The walls themselves seemed to go on forever as well in both length and height. With a hum, Mother Lilith said, that it was a brilliant spell you used, albeit a bit risky tilde. You didn't have infinite mana at the time and you used nearly your entire reserve that you had left to kill everything between you and those doors Tilda. She chuckled lightly before continuing. It was so amusing to watch the last bastion of the defenders become nothing but shadows burned into a wall. Their faces of pure despair and outrage at being denied a battle was priceless Tilda. Do you see those shadows high above the others, on the door itself? I followed her hand and saw two massive shadows with what looked to be wings, seared onto the door, 
As I gave a nod Mother Lilith said, those were two of the highest seraph in the light and dark faction had that they could send Tilda, and they died before your magical might as if they were but pigeons. Even she was surprised you managed to kill the two seraphim like that Tilda. Tilting my head and frowning as the words she sounded warped and odd, Mother Lilith just shook her head before saying, don't worry about it for now, little Artoria, I'll just say that she is this cycle's goddess of creation. My antithesis, my eyes widened at the implication and I just numbly nodded my head, taking mother's advice though, I pushed it from my mind as I turned my attention back to my past self as she pushed open the doors. Another blink, and I found that we had moved once again. Looking around, it was the room my past self had just opened as I could see her making her way into it from the giant doors. My eyes widened in wonder and surprise as I looked around. The room we were in was not a room at all. There was a long pathway that my past self was limping down, made of rainbow. Much like the Bifrost from the Thor movies. At the end of the path, it split two ways to form a massive circle around an equally massive beam of light or energy. Look outwards. There were no walls but instead what seemed to be universes, all of them fading in and out, displaying seemingly random events and people, or rather, their dead corpses for the most part. I was quick to notice that everything that had displayed something other than a wasteland, was me creating said wastelands. With another gentle hum Mother Lilith spoke up, and here is the nexus of the nexus world Tilda. While not anywhere close in power to the nexus world you originally came from, that is to say the first nexus world, this one is still quite powerful Tilda, everything you are seeing beyond the path are the events that led up to this point, infinitely playing out by copies of you. Turning to look up at her in confusion I asked, copies? I have copies of me running around, before I could dwell on that fact, she answered, not anymore, no Tilda. Watch Tilda, nodding my head. I turned my attention back to my past self who had just reached the giant pillar of energy, light. She held up her sword to her face and even though she was whispering I was still able to hear, there must only be one. For my family I want, and need, for dear win and our unending future. Then much to my surprise, she stabbed herself with the sword and jumped into the pillar of energy. The effects were immediate, as it turned black. Seconds later. A huge wave of power rippled out of the beam, and shook the very shape of reality itself. Sounds of glass cracking echoed out all around us, before every single universe and event shattered into uncountable pieces. Soon all that was left was only the path and beam of blackness. I glanced back, and even the world beyond the doors was gone. Before I could wonder what exactly had happened, Soon all of the shards and pieces of the universes started to swirl and converge on the black beam. As the swirl of broken reality started to converge near the platform that was still around, the beam started to compress itself and very quickly formed a ball shape. I struggled to see exactly what was going on, as the whirlwind of reality shards was hard to see through, and the energy pillar had compressed so much that it was roughly the size of a golf ball now. Suddenly. A random bell tolled out, and all the reality shards started to rush to the ball to be absorbed. It didn't take long before the only thing left was a rather large ball of darkness in the shape of what seemed to be an egg. If I had to guess, I'd say it was as large as a single story house. I felt another pulse of power and one of the sides of the egg-like thing rippled, and then my past self was suddenly ejected. She was completely naked and only had her sword left in her right hand. I took note that the corruption lines on her body did not match the shape of the ones I have now. I was broken out of my musing when Mother Lilith said, and then there were two Tilda. Tilting my head I asked, two? I felt her gently nod her head as her chin bobbed on mine as she answered, yes Tilda. That action you did, was the final atrocity. You killed every single version of yourself and every version of every entity you had killed previously by destroying the Nexus world and absorbing it along with every Omniverse it was connected to. She then pointed at the large egg and said, and then you gave up all that power, willingly and with pure intentions, to have Tia Win be born Tilda. She is in that god egg, 
My eyes widened before I frowned in thought. Once again, Mother Lilith answered before I could voice my question. The key words I said before were pure intentions. You didn't want to birth a new god for power, for help in the war, or anything like that Tilda. You wanted a body for your soulmate that would enable her to live eternally by your side. This is why it is hard to intentionally create a new god, Dis, exactly as she and I intended Tilda. Otherwise, the little play that the factions have going on would just become exhausting to watch Tilda. With a small chuckle she added, and most would not be willing to give up their powers either. You had attained Godeshood by destroying an Exus world, and absorbing it all. But you gave it up without even a second thought, or any hesitation Tilda. With a gesture to my past self she finished, and I do mean everything. All that was left was the power of your soul and your authorities. Nothing of the powers you gained in the millions of years you had towards this goal remained Tilda. My past self started to glow a purple that I instantly recognized before she flaked away like a victim of a Thanos snap. With an eyebrow raised I turned and gave my mother a point to look. She just giggled before saying, What Tilda, you held up your end of the bargain. And so I held up mine. Noticing my confused face she elaborated, I won't reveal it all right now, for dramatic purposes Tilda. But what I will tell you, is that part of the bargain was to help dear win a little bit Tilda. But let's be honest, I would have done that anyway most likely. She's so cute after all Tilda. It was my turn to chuckle, and I could only nod my head as I agreed. Tierwin was indeed very cute and adorable. I was broken out of my thoughts by the sudden flickering of the world around us. With a sigh, Mother Lilith said, It seems you are awakening, so that's all for this little reminiscence of the past Tilda. More and more of your past will start to leak out of your soul's memory, so just be warned little Artoria Tilda. I gave her an odd before I started to feel a bit dizzy and the world was turning black. As my mind left my soul space, I didn't register what Mother Lilith quietly said. I'll be watching my daughters, watching, and hoping you two will finally be the ones who. 93. Chapter 71. A Meeting of the Minds. As I slowly opened my eyes I expected to see the room I went to sleep in, cuddled up to Bargast. Instead however I am standing in endless grasslands in all directions around me. Glancing skyward, I was greeted by an equally endless blue and cloudless sky. Another point to note however was the absence of the sun. Sighing in exacerbation while looking around myself one last time I finally say, All right, what is going on? Several seconds passed in complete silence before a pressure started to push down on my person. Said pressure only continued to grow exponentially when I noticed a small ball of green light start to form in front of me. In a matter of seconds the little ball expanded to the size of a basketball before it stopped growing, along with the pressure. I tilted my head with a raised eyebrow as I gazed at the odd little thing. I could tell this pressure was a form, sad as it is of intimidation however, unfortunately for this little ball thing, being around my mother and the pressure she naturally gives off, suppressed or not, makes this seem like a kid throwing a tantrum, smirking at the thought I gave voice to it, if you're trying to intimidate me, you can just stop, you'll never be able to match up to my mother, that little declaration seemed to piss it off a bit as the pressure increased a little bit before it tapered off and calmed down while settling to much lower level. I only chuckled a little before I asked, Well, what or who are you? You interrupted my time with my new lover. I don't have a saint's level of patience at the best of times, let alone right now, so out with it. The green ball floated there for a few seconds before a voice that sounded like billions yet singular at the same time said, Anomaly. What is your purpose? I narrowed my eyes as I gazed at the ball for a few moments before saying, Anomaly? Is it? Who am I dealing with? Allah? Or Gaia? Interestingly the surface of the ball seemed to shimmer and ripple ever so slightly before it said with a hint of surprise and reluctance, Allah. I chuckled and smirked as I answered. The will of humanity's efforts to survive is it? Well, an anomaly I may be, but before I answer that I would pose one to you. Am I the only anomaly you've detected in this timeline so far? With the same reluctance as before Ella answered, yes. With a head tilt and a raised eyebrow I smiled as I said, well now, 
Isn't that a surprise? You see, I also happen to know about the timeline I am currently in. I can safely say I am not the only anomaly. That is, unless something forced an unprecedented change on the timeline that even you and Gaia thought was naturally occurring. The pressure from Allah grew as she demanded. Explain. With another chuckle and a dark yet playful grin I answered, Well you see, the one whom I had such an intimate and wondrous night with isn't supposed to be summoned in this timeline. Another anomaly is the summon of that broken, hero-obsessed brat Shiru Imiur. He was originally meant to summon Saba, Arturia Pendragon, not the Lily version. Alla floated there for a few moments before saying, Fools, you are the only anomaly. State your purpose. I barked a laugh and said, Oh this is just brilliant. The almighty Alla being nothing but a tool of the light. Though, I also admit I take no small amount of pleasure knowing my mother also had a hand in it. The pressure around myself grew exponentially as Ella seemed to be losing her patience with my refusal to simply answer her question. I only gave her a cheeky, toothy smile as I said, Your posturing means nothing to me Ella. I admit that while you are strong, stronger than even my current self, you are not a threat to me. I narrowed my gaze and glared at Ella while releasing my own pressure and some killing intent as I said, No stop annoying me. Don't think I didn't realize that we're in a dreamscape. You may feel safe, but I assure you I still have full access to all of my abilities here. I can, and will, obliterate you if you continue down this path of annoyance. The pressure slowly ebbed off again before Ella demanded once again, state your purpose, anomaly. I sighed and crossed my arms below my breasts while rolling my eyes in annoyance. Shaking my head I said, not one to let things go are you? Fine, I am here to kill the god or goddess of light. Might be a few of them, or just one. I can't remember. Ella was silent for a moment before she said, The age of gods is over. You seek the reverse side for war? I shake my head as I answer, No, Ella, the gods I hunt are not from around here. They are greater than even you. A prime example of their power being that you cannot see any anomaly besides myself in the current timeline. Ella was silent for several minutes this time before finally speaking up. Cannot understand. Your words are factually false, and yet they ring true. An idea suddenly came to me, and with a sly smile I raised my right hand to my temple and lightly pinched the air near it. I slowly pulled away and what followed was a silky white substance flowing as if it was underwater. Holding my hand out with the slightly swaying yet gently flowing substance I said, Here, my memory of exactly what I am hunting. It should shed some light on the light. Hey, as I let go of the memory, it slowly floated over to Ella but stopped just in front of her. She seemed to be hesitating for a few moments before coming to a decision and absorbing the memory strand. We were both silent as I waited patiently for Ella to pass the information that was contained in the memory strand. While she was going over everything I knew of the light and dark faction, the war, and snippets of my own faction, my thoughts drifted back to Bargast and a problem I was ignoring at the start. However I was quickly coming to a realization that I indeed really felt attracted to Bargast, and as cheesy and cliche as it may be, it might truly be love at first sight. Now, my biggest problem is that I want Bargus to be with me beyond just this measly dimension. Meaning, I need to remove her from the throne of heroes. I'll be damned if I let Ella or Gaia have her any longer. With a sigh I think, but therein is the problem. How do I get to the throne of heroes? I am not connected to it anymore. Maybe I can follow the link Bargus has with her main soul? My internal scheming was interrupted by Ella finally speaking. I think I could honestly hear a hint of worry in the billions of voices speaking. How can you fight such entities? A cocky smile graced my lips as I said, Well, I am a bit special myself. But what about you and Gaia? Can the two of you resist the light's corruption? I am thinking no, personally. Doubly so if an actual god or goddess comes here. With an internal sneer I think. Not like they can actually corrupt you though. Being that you are in their own domain of control and divine law prevents an entity from corrupting its own domain tilde. But you don't need to know that. Ella was thinking for a while again before she said, cannot resist. Options? A cruel smile formed on my lips, 
a smile that would surely cause any normal person to shudder and step back in worry. Sporting such a smile I said, for you precious little. Right now, I think you most likely have a very serious problem. The surface of Ella's bubble thing rippled again before she said, explain. With a dismissive shrug I answered, well, from what I know about these light shits they don't waste any time in spreading their corruption. So, right now I fully expect it to be spreading at this very moment via some means. Agreed. Ella simply responded with, continue. With a chuckle I obliged her. Well going with that train of thought. Ella, can you feel any corruption in your multiverse? Any at all? Again the basketball sized light tripled and shimmered for a few moments before she answered, no. With a predatory smile I said, so that means one of two things. Either they, the light gods, have not started to spread their corruption. Or, with a motion of my hand towards Ella to finish my sentence, she answered, or I can not sense the infection. As a mocking gesture I clapped my hands and said, good girl. Folding my arms under my breasts again I mocked her, like I said. You may have a very serious problem on your hands, Ella. What if the light corrupts Gaia, or yourself, or the throne of heroes? Hell, what if it corrupts the beasts, or the types? With a chuckle I continued, horrifying, isn't it? Despite all your power and resources you have access to, you have very little options. Everything you send, could just simply be corrupted. Or even worse, you yourself could be corrupted and become nothing more than yet another slave of the light. And you'd have no idea that it happened. Hell, you'd have a smile on your face about servitude. The silence after I finished speaking was deafening for Ella. I was sure, though, she didn't sit there in thought for long as she was quick to state, you can fight. With a smirk I said, I can. But, why would I fight for you? I am here to kill the god, Desis. I care not for any corruption they would be leaving behind. Ella wasted no time in asking, what do you want for your services in preventing the light corruption from spreading? I smiled widely as I answered, you're a smart girl, Ella. You know what I want. The ball rippled once before she stated, Bargast. Flashing her a toothy smile I said, got it in one. Give me access to the throne of heroes so I can take my lover away from it and this multiverse. Do this, and I'll remove any light corruption I come across, either by purge or by sword, as it were. Ella was silent for a few moments before asking, just Bargast? To which I flashed an innocent smile and answered, yes, Bargast is the only heroic spirit I want to take with me. The ball of green light shifted several times in odd directions before Ella said, the contract as follows, the anomaly, you, is permitted to take Bargast's true soul from the throne of heroes in return for the service of purging the light's corruption in its entirety, acceptable, with a hidden sneer I thought, gotcha, I smiled widely as I said, deal, the ball suddenly exploded in intensity and the output of its light to the point I was forced to close my eyes. When I slowly opened them and blinked away the pain of the sudden flashbang I was quick to notice I was finally actually awake. I couldn't help the slightly sloppy smile that appeared on my face when I noticed I was playing the little spoon to Bargast. Her strong arms were holding me tightly around my waist, as if she was afraid I would suddenly leave her, while her thick, Muscular leg was also over mine holding me down in her embrace. All the while my head was being squished between her mighty, national treasure worthy breasts. I sighed in pulis as I relished the whole situation and thought, while this may be heretical, this feels just as good as cuddling with Tierwin. Speaking of Tierwin, I am sure she will love you, my Bargast. As I snuggled deeper into Bargast's embrace, which caused her to tighten her hold on me. I thanked my foresight in cleaning up the bed and our bodies from our activities last night. Sadly, it wasn't long before Bargast woke up with a yawn. I felt her body tense up for a second as her grip on me tightened, before she quickly relaxed as she noticed I was still there. With a chuckle I said, do not worry, my Bargast. I am not going anywhere. In fact, I have a surprise for you. 83. Chapter 72 School doesn't have to be boring you know Tilda. As I shuffled myself around so I could look into her eyes, she blinked a few times before asking, MMM, surprise? With a widening grin I nod and say, yes, I made a deal. 
I put in a bit more effort into the job I am here to do, and I get to take you away from the throne of heroes, from this universe. Bargist blinked slowly a few times as my words sunk in, before her eyes shot wide open as she exclaimed, What? Shuffling myself up a bit more so we were face to face gave her a light kiss on the lips and then said, I don't know where we will end up as a couple my bargast, but I do know that the duration of this pitiable little war is not long enough to find out, so, I will take you away from all of this, if you want that is, her eyes briefly lit up in joy before they dimmed suddenly as she said, I do, I really do, but I am in the service of my king, I just smirked at her and said, then I will challenge your king for the right to have your hand, her beautiful eyes widened as she quietly asked, you do that, for me, go so far even though you are not sure about us. With a soft smile and warm eyes I gently kissed her on her wondrous lips for several long seconds before pulling back and saying, easily, I may not know where we will end up, my bargast, but I am more than willing to put in every effort to see we reach the destination. She smiled and pulled me closer to her body in a tight hug as she whispered, my king will not let go easily, she will make you work for it. With a cocky smile and a voice filled with utter confidence I exclaimed, You're worth every drop of blood that she will shed Tilda. She gently chuckled and snuggled into me as we just enjoyed each other's presence. Sadly, our relaxation was all too soon interrupted by Rin as she yelled from downstairs, Caster, stop, potentially literally, fucking around and let's go. I got school with a heavy sigh. I smirked and went for a deep and sensational kiss for several seconds, with a playful smile I whispered, something to remember me by Tilda, I trust you're going to head back to your summoner, snapping out of the daze she was in, Bargist quickly nodded her head and said, yes, when do you want to meet up again, I reached down and gave her plentiful as a playful grip, causing her to startle a little, before I said, whenever you desire, my bargast, here, with a snap of my fingers a small purple, polished to a tea pebble appeared and fell between her joyful mountains, with a smirk I say, Obstilda, she rolled her eyes as we separated, and while she was busy fishing the new object out of her exceptional cleavage, I got off the bed and willed my dress to appear, turning around just as she finally got it out, she looked at it with a curious eye before asking, this is? With a smile I said, pass some of your mana through it, nodding her head. She did as I asked and the pebble glowed purple red for a few seconds before a multi-tailed fox appeared on the surface in red. Tilting her head cutely to the right with a raised eyebrow she asked an unvoiced question. With a soft chuckle I answered, with this, all you need to do is hold it and think of my name. It will function as an object that will let you communicate with me while also letting me lock onto your location so I can teleport to you should you want me to, or if you're in some kind of danger you cannot handle for some reason. Looking down at the little thing, she gently gave it a few swipes with her thumb before she looked back up at me and smiled. Getting off the bed, she quickly scooped me up in her strong arms and gave me quite the chaste kiss, softly moaning into her mouth. As I wrapped my hands around her neck, she lifted me up a bit more. We only stopped because of another yell from Rin, much to my displeasure. Resting her forehead on mine, she softly whispered, Thank you, Artoria. We better go before your summoner bursts a heart vein with how strong she is yelling. Barking a small laugh I nod my head as I reluctantly let go of her. She stole another quick kiss before turning immaterial and dashing away. She wasn't fast enough for me not to catch the cute blush however, which simply caused me to smile. With a sigh of a maiden missing their partner they are clearly falling for. I snapped my fingers and teleported next to Rin. She was in her classic school clothes and was about to shout again when I quickly spoke up. No need. I am here Rin. With a sudden yelp and a swear, she turned to me with a rather mean glare. I could only smirk as I asked. What's got you so riled up? Her glare somehow managed to intensify, and with a voice laced with greatly suppressed frustration she said, like you don't know, you clearly did not silence anything. I heard everything. My smile widened and said, oh, did I forget about that? Well, sorry for the free ear gas and Tilda, 
She started to blush furiously and started to stutter. I, I didn't know. A-R-G-H. I didn't enjoy those cries of pleasure at all. Not at all. She then huffed and stormed out the front door. Only for her blush to deepen and her pace quicken as I started to laugh out loud. As she turned the corner she yelled back at me. Hurry up. Damn it. Lock the door as well. With a chuckle and a wave of my hand the door closed and locked itself and I then teleported next Rin and fell in line with her quick pace. With another snigger I asked, Poor Rin, how old are you, and still a virgin? Might want to kill it affliction, otherwise you might get sacrificed to summon something dark and horrible one day. She simply shot me another deadly glare, and then huffed while looking away and then proceeded to ignore me. With a mental chuckle, I decided to lay off the teasing for now, and simply enjoyed the walk to her school. It wasn't long before I fell into thought. I wonder how that array is going? I should start to see some changes come the afternoon I think. I am looking forward to it. It wasn't too terribly long of a walk before we made it to the school and I could immediately tell the difference in the atmosphere. If one were to say that it seemed a bit darker and that tensions were slowly rising between everyone inside it would not be an accurate statement. With a tiny smile. I followed Rin as she entered the array completely unaware of its existence and went about her business. Sometime later, and I was already starting to get a bit giddy in anticipation. It's nearly lunchtime for the students, and there have already been a few altercations between a few students and their teachers. The latest one had a boy removed from class as he got so fed up with the teacher's slow way of talking. He chucked a stapler at him. The best part however was how everyone else reacted. They laughed. Even Rin let out a small chuckle. No one said a peep about the incident. And after the kid was removed from class the teacher went back to business as usual. That was an hour ago, and I couldn't help my smile as I shifted my gaze over the entire class as they all broke for lunch. There were some small changes, physically now, that I was seeing. I was absolutely jubilant to notice that even Rin was finally starting to show signs. Rin and I were making our way to the school roof so she could eat in peace when suddenly an angry yell was heard behind us. Watch where you are fucking going you damned wig. What the fuck is wrong with you? As we both turned around, we shared an exasperated sigh when he saw an angry student walking away from one shy Rimiya who was currently rubbing the back of his neck while sitting on the floor and apologizing, after he gave the student another apology and a bow which said student missed because he was 100% ignoring him. He turned towards us and jogged up to us with a worried frown on his face. Or rather, to Rin as I was currently under a disillusionment charm. His frown deepened as he looked over in before asking with a voice of concern, Tataka, are you okay? I know I am a total noob to this magic stuff compared to you, so I ran to find you as soon as I could. What exactly is going on? Rin tilted her head and with a raised eyebrow asked. What do you mean, Emilia? With that silly frown still on his face he clarified. I mean with the school. Everyone is getting more and more aggressive. And you? Are you okay? You look rather pale. Are you sick? Reversing the side her head was tilted she said. No, I didn't notice anything at all out of the ordinary. And I feel fine? Looking down at her hands and flexing them for a few seconds she looked back up and said, and I know I don't exactly get a lot of sun, but I don't think I am any more pale than I normally am. Shiru shook his head several times and then said, no no, you are most definitely, very much paler than you have ever been, Tataka. She glanced my way subtly, causing me to shrug my shoulders and wave a finger around my ear while crossing my eyes. To her credit, she hid her sudden sneaker exceedingly well, returning her attention back to the boy she said. No, I think you are very much mistaken, Emilia. Now, if you'll excuse me, I am famished, and I would like to eat. She quickly held up her hand and added, in peace. With a reluctant nod and a frown, Shiru said, okay. Well, I still think something is very wrong with the school. Meet me after it ends to check. With a siren said, fine. He smiled and with a nod of his head he said, great. Thanks Tosika. I'll ask Saba to come along as well. Maybe she can help explain what's going on. Speaking of, where is Caster? With a shrug Rin answered, oh, she's around. 
Now, if you'll excuse me. She then stopped paying any amount of attention to the boy entirely and started to make her way up to the roof access. Meanwhile, I was staring into his soul, and watching as Avalon was actively fighting off any and all forms of corruption. As I watched it obliterate the corruption long before it even entered him I thought, I didn't think Avalon was capable of repelling my corruption for this long. The only thing I know of that can, to some degree, is the light, but that feels nothing like it. Just feels exceedingly pure. My eyes narrowed in thought as my gaze lingered on Shiru as he turned a corner and made his way somewhere. Eventually though, I just shrugged and thought, it might be that this Avalon is actually different because it belongs to a Liliartoria, thoughts for later. But for now, it seems like a little snake has decided to make a move on my summoner. Turning around and taking a step, I was suddenly in front of Ring holding a dagger connected to a chain between my fingers. As I felt the chain tighten, and the attacker trying to get their dagger back, I casually glanced back at Rin and could only smirk. She was not perturbed even in the slightest. She just continued to enjoy her meal with no small amount of grace that I found highly amusing. Turning my attention back to the hostile servant I scoffed and flicked away the dagger. Crossing my arms under my breasts I gave the lacklustre assassin a sneer and said, attacking a lady as she enjoyed the weather in solitude? How very uncouth of you, unclean one. You, or your master, have made a rather unwise decision. With a snap of my fingers, several lances of darkness materialized and hovered above my head. With a cruel smile I said, Come, let us see if you can receive better than you can give. 77. Chapter 73. A resolve fortified and a path chosen. Next, raising my chin slightly, I shot off my shadow spears one by one. Each one released a small crack as it broke the sound barrier upon their release. I was not expecting any of the spells to hit, truth be told, as this was Ryder after all. While Medusa died quite often in the timelines, it didn't mean she was a weak servant by any stretch of the imagination. No, one could say it was merely her fate that she was always killed off fairly easily. And since fate had no bearings on any of my actions, Ryder was able to display her agility freely, almost dancing around my shadow spears with the utmost ease. I made a small note that she made sure to never actually physically touch the spears in any way. With an inner smirk I thought, clever girl, but let's see just how many spears you can dodge. With a devious and ever so slightly sadistic smile forming on my face, I snapped my fingers again. As Ryder finished dodging the last spear by practically vaulting over it like some sort of sport event her face twisted with a frown as she noticed the vast increase in the number of shadow spears, giving her a mock slow clap and flashing my pearly whites at her I said, as expected of you, Medusa. Noticing her stiffening ever so slightly at me directly naming her I gave her a dismissive wave and continued, please. Any mage worth their salt would sense the magic pooling behind your mask around your eyes. Add that to how many servants have special eyes and actively seal their eyes? Well, it doesn't take a genius. With a slightly frustrated frown she asked, and who are you? I just gave her a smirk as I answered, now, isn't that the question of the hour Tilda? If you're still alive in the next few minutes I might just answer you. With a thought hundreds of shadow spears shot off all trained on Ryder. To her credit, she didn't panic in the slightest and simply went back to her dance. My perception increased as one of the spears came exceedingly close to tearing off her head. Time seemed to slow to a crawl as I watched the shadow spear rip through the fabric of her mask and reveal her frowning face. Time slowly returned back to normal as I relaxed my perception as Ryder continued to dodge to the best of her impressive abilities. As fast and dexterous as she was, she wasn't perfect and the number of shadow spears being sent at her was slowly overwhelming her. It wasn't long before a shadow spear was on a direct course towards her heart. I knew she wasn't going to be able to dodge this one in time. Ryder knew she wasn't able to dodge this one in time as well if the resignation on her face was any indication. However, mere moments before the spear was going to run her through, a soft voice spoke out. Wait. All of my spears instantly froze right where they were, 
which left Ryder standing in an awkward position with a spear hovering mere centimeters from her heart. She made no effort to move however as she understood that having a spear so close like this meant I had her dead to rights. I dismissed all the spears but the one over her heart as I looked back at Rin. She was just finishing packing up her little bento container when she called out it seemed. Finally finishing her little chore, she stood up and joined me at my side as she asked, Ryder, why would my sister attack me? Ryder shook her head and then answered, she did not. I am on loan to one Shinjimut. It was he who ordered this foolish attack, returning my attention to Ryder. I gave Rin a quick side glance to see her disgusted sneer at the mention of Shinji and she voiced as much, that pathetic weasel and waste of space, is he so pathetic that he wants to kill any girl that refuses his, frankly, disgusting advances, Ryder simply shrugged her shoulders as much as her awkward position would allow as she said, I do not try to understand the mind of my masters, even temporary ones, with a frown, Rin turned towards me and simply said, Caster, with a smirk I snapped my fingers, causing several shadow chains to erupt out of Ryder's own shadow and bring her low, now in a kneeling position with chains all over her body forcing her to lean slightly back along with pulling her arms behind her, she sighed and said, you never took me seriously for even a moment, did you? Creating a simple fan and hiding all but my eyes I let out a soft chuckle before I replied, not even for a single breath, dismissing my fan with a wave of my hand followed by another snap of my fingers, Shinji was suddenly standing before us facing Ryder. With clear confusion in his voice he asked, Ryder, what happened? What? Before he could finish his question however, he was interrupted by Rin's cold voice, Shinji Mut, you pathetic boy, you have one chance to explain why you have my sister's servant under your command, and why you sent her after me, as Shinji jumped a little at the sudden voice. He quickly spun around and the moment he saw Rin his face twisted into an ugly sneer, as the two of them started to bicker back and forth, I took a peek at everyone's souls to check the progression of the corruption that was still being dispersed around the school, starting with Ryder, I wasn't the least bit surprised she was able to resist a great deal of the array I had set up, it wasn't particularly strong by any means after all, and servants were naturally rather resistant entities, her being was still nearly 100% pure of any corruption, but if she were to stay in the array for an exceedingly long time I suspected that it would eventually change. Glancing at Shinji I wasn't all too surprised to see his soul nearly pitch black. He was garbage so seeing that he was nearing the completion of the corruption was par for the course really, though this corruption wasn't the normal kind I usually spread, this was simply making the worse of him more prevalent and widespread. He had precious little morals to flip in the first place after all, so it was more like this was simply driving him to a dark madness. Looking at Rin however almost caused a smile to spread widely on my face. Her once neutral, if a little bright, soul was now much darker. Her corruption was of my classic type. I was converting her to a more agreeable alignment per the norm. I was making sure she was still very much Rin. However it wouldn't be a miss to simply call her Dark Rin eventually, from the array and my own mana corrupting her, I estimated she would be fully converted by the time school was out if nothing exceptional happened. I also had to hold back a snicker as it seemed that conversing with Shinji was also quickly spreading the darkness in her. With a suppressed amused expression I thought, well, he is nearly literal trash, so I am not surprised if I'm being honest. <laughs> Now there is a thought, maybe I should wipe out that family line. While I was mulling over the pros and cons of purging that particular bloodline I suddenly felt a massive surge of darkness through the constant link my sisters and I share. Before I could even start to question what was happening I heard mother's voice in my head. Don't worry, my dear daughter Tilda. Little dear Wynn has already taken action. Be proud. She acted so fast, she really does love her new family so very much Tilda. I couldn't help the soft smile that appeared on my lips as I answered, that's good, Tierwin having more than just me is a little painful, but I won't let jealousy prevent her from experiencing any happiness she can, least of all happiness from having a family that loves her as much as I do, 
Somehow knowing that mother nodded her head, I put my trust in my other sisters and turned my attention back to the two children in front of me. Their conversation was getting rather heated, or rather Shinji was. Rin still had a calm and collected look about her. Even if her face was slightly twisted because of the disgusted feelings she had towards Shinji, while on the other hand Shinji was nearly red in the face with rage and his shouting had also started to produce a disgusting amount of saliva, it wasn't long before he turned to Ryder and shouted, Ryder, stop fucking around and kill these bitches already. I could only raise an eyebrow in mild amusement at this fool's total failure to read a situation. Even Rin, and Ryder to a much lesser extent, had a look of near flabbergasted exasperation on her face. Shenji just released a frustrated Kyle level screech and stomped his way over to the bound servant. As he reached for one of the shadow chains binding her he yelled, Damn it, you useless fucking servant. I said stop. However, his loud screeching was interrupted the moment he grasped a chain with both of his hands and tried to pull. Or rather his screeching was converted into screams of pain as his hands had dissolved up to his forearms. He quickly fell on his back screaming in pain while holding up the stumps he now had for arms to his face. As his hysterical and frankly hilarious screams continued Rin gave me a side glance, to which I simply smirked and shrugged. Ryder simply blinked blankly at the situation, taking the whole thing in a calm stride. This sack of shit wasn't her true master anyway, so I didn't expect her to be too heartbroken about it. Rin looked back down at the wailing man baby and with cold, dismissive eyes she said, Caster, turning my attention to her and humming a bit to let her know I was paying attention she continued, what would you say if I wanted to? help my sister and destroy a bloodline. I chuckled darkly and answered, I'd say you're the master in this situation and can do as you please. I turned my gaze back to Shinji as I continued, I won't even make you use a command seal, and will freely help you Tilda. As Rin nodded her head and adopted a look of concentration as she devised her next step I thought, and this will most likely finish the corruption of your soul, my master and things will only get that much more interesting with the dark Rin leading the charge Tilda. Rin suddenly raised her head and started looking towards the door that led back into the school as she asked, Why is no one coming to investigate his screaming? With an amused huff I answered, Contrary to what you might think, I am very much capable of creating a barrier that will prevent sound from traveling Tilda. Rin tossed me a small glare while the tiniest of blushes appeared on her face for a few moments. She let out an exasperated sigh as she turned her attention back to Shinji as she asked, Can you? Again she let out a long and drawn out sigh. She shook her head and then looked up at me with eyes filled with determination and purpose. Fuck it. My father is no longer the head of this family. I am. She then turned to Shinji and said, Shinji Mut, for your revolting attitude and attempt on my life I, Rin Tataka, head of the Tataka household formally declare a blood feud. I am also taking back my sister from your disgusting family. She then looked back at me and said, Caster, break him. A cruel smile was instantly on my face as I said, with pleasure. I walked over to the sad sack of shit that was still, understandably honestly, wailing about the loss of his hands and gave him a light kick to the ribs. As he painfully cradled his chest with the wind knocked out of him I said, Try not to break within the first few seconds, but knowing you, I fully expect you to defecate yourself within five, Crucio. And just like that, he instantly filled his lungs with new air and began to scream with unholy abandon. I was, much to my amusement and displeasure, correct about how long he'd last. It was only three seconds later that he literally shat and pissed himself. Amidst his screaming rider, with her voice full of apprehension and weariness, asked, What? Are you doing to him, exactly? I've never seen nor heard of a spell like that. I simply hummed for a second or so before answering, The Cruciator's Curse. A dark type of magic with the sole intention of bringing astronomical levels of pain to its victims. It not only strikes every single nerve in the body, lighting them up like a Christmas tree, but it also targets the soul loosely. By now, 
The boy you knew is long gone. The only thing left will be a gibbering mess of madness or a catatonic body. With a wave of my hand I dismiss the spell, and true to my word all that was left was the broken husk of the boy once known as Shinji Mut. His eyes stared at nothing with a soulless look about them, and he was no longer screaming or making any movements at all. Truly, broken. Rin walked over and looked down at the boy as if he was garbage on the side of the road. No less than that. And honestly, he truly was when he was alive and kicking. She nodded her head and turned her attention to the still-bound servant and said, Rider, you will return to my sister and you will protect her. I noticed no command seals on that thing, so return, return and protect your true master, cast her and I will be along shortly to wipe out that family. With a snap of my fingers the chains faded away into black smoke and Ryder was gone. Rin turned to me and said, let's go. This is something I should have done ages ago, and it's high time I stopped ignoring the signs. 4. End of Block 3